as of others. Compliance with existing safety equipment and training requirements is spotty, and guidance documents such as BIC's Tradeway Safety Manual lack the force of law. The current commercial waste system fails to provide much needed transparency and fairness to customers. More than half of contracts are simple oral agreements, and many payments are made in person and in cash. Compliance with BIC's rate cap relies on self-reporting by carters and customers, resulting in efforts by some to evade these requirements. City regulations require all businesses to recycle and certain establishments to separate organics. But our commercial recycling diversion rate of less than 30 percent lags behind our peers. Businesses that comply with the law and separate recyclable materials lack assurances from carters that these materials are actually collected separately and recycled. City inspectors regularly witness trucks dump mixed refuse and recyclables at transfer stations, and carters and businesses regularly deflect blame on each other for failed recycling practices. The current system discourages carters and customers from making investments to help move toward a zero waste future. In studying the industry and hearing from stakeholders and advocates all over the city, we consistently heard that the system is broken and that the city can and should do more to fix it. After over two years of public engagement and internal analysis, we are presented with evidence of a commercial waste collection industry that is unsafe, unfair, and unsustainable. I'll now describe the extensive public outreach and stakeholder engagement process that we undertook to develop the city's plan to address the problems in this industry. In the course of developing our plan, DSNY held more than 150 meetings with more than 200 stakeholders, including council members, commercial businesses from all five boroughs and all 20 proposed zones, labor unions, advocates, carters, elected officials, and many others. These meetings took a variety of formats, including one-on-one -on -one interviews, small group conversations, field interviews, focus groups, and an advisory board of 40 diverse stakeholders convening quarterly. In November 2018, the city released its comprehensive implementation plan. Since then, we have been conducting a detailed environmental review of the proposed plan. As part of this process, the department released a ge draft generic environmental impact statement studying the potential environmental impacts of the plan. We received public comments and held three public meetings. The department continues to conduct a vigorous and varied public outreach process to strengthen its plan for implementation of commercial waste zones in New York City. The concept behind commercial waste zones is simple. Instead of up to 50 carters, carters operating in a single neighborhood on a nightly basis, there will just be a few. These companies will be selected through a competitive solicitation process that will identify the carters that can provide excellent service with the highest standards at low prices for each area. The resulting contracts will include standards for pricing, customer service, safety, environmental health, and requirements to promote the city's zero waste and sustainability goals. With fewer trucks on the streets and shorter routes, zone collection will also mean improved traffic and air quality and less unsafe driving behavior and worker fatigue. Okay, on the next slide uh, shows a typical route today. To fill up one truck, it goes through four boroughs in New Jersey. Under the proposed plan, the same number of customers would be serviced within the boundaries of the zone, making it much shorter. I mean, that, the before picture, I think, tells it all. Uh, next one. As indicated in the next slide, citywide, our proposed system will dramatically reduce truck traffic associated with this industry by 50 percent, eliminating more than 18 million miles of truck traffic from New York City streets every year while maintaining high quality and low cost service to New York City businesses. It will be safer, fairer, and more sustainable than the system that operates today. 18, 18 million miles. 18 million vehicle miles less uh, travel. And do, do you mind going back to the previous slide? I just wanted to make sure that people saw what 
what some folks would consider an efficient route on the left before um, is the case that they were making before we got the study. And now that we have the data and the information, to be able to see it side by side really makes a big impact. So I'm glad that you put this slide together and it was one of the things you presented is it just shows, I wanna be clear, that's my community, that's community board one, where we handle 40% of the city's trash. And look at the difference that our own system could do. So I appreciate yes. that slide. Yes, and it, I mean, it shows a truck going through four boroughs and New Jersey to collect one, one route. I just don't see the case that could possibly be made. Thank you. Our plan divides the city into 20 geographic zones, as, as indicated in the slide that's up now, with between three and five carters through, uh, that would be selected through a competitive procurement process to operate within each zone. Most zones would have three carters, but a few denser, more concentrated districts, such as Midtown Manhattan, could have up to five carters under our plan. The competitive procurement will ensure that the selected carters would be those able to provide a competitive price while also meeting and exceeding standards for service, safety, infrastructure investment, and efficiency, while demonstrating a strong commitment to our zero waste goals. Commercial waste zones will apply only to the collection of commercial refuse, recyclables, and source separated organic waste. It will exclude specialized or intermittent waste streams, such as construction and demolition debris, medical waste, and other types of waste that will continue to be collected and managed under existing city and state regulations. Carters that win zone contracts will be obligated to meet certain contractual requirements aligned with the city's program goals and objectives. This approach will standardize the contracting process for customers by requiring, by requiring written service agreements between carters and customers uh, requiring transparent monthly bills and by making the pricing structure more transparent. Under the city's plan, each carter will be able to compete for as few as one or as many as 20 zones, but no carter will be able to win contracts for more than 15. Selected carters will be awarded 10-year contracts with city options for two five-year extensions. The department will select carters based on a request for proposals which will outline minimum qualifications and scoring criteria. The selection process will be fair, rigorous, and unbiased, designed to select the carters that put forth their best overall proposal. While detailed pricing and service agreements will be negotiated between individual businesses and carters, DSNY will negotiate rate caps for each carter through the contract award process. Under our plan, carters will be required to comply with with all existing laws and regulations. In addition to the contract requirements, DSNY will have mechanisms to ensure compliance with these laws and regulations if carters fail to comply. DSNY and VIC will work as partners in both the implementation of commercial waste zones and in regulating the awardees and designated carters under such a system. Awardees must have a BIC license in good standing and BIC will continue to conduct background investigations on all carters to ensure that they possess the requisite good character, honesty, and integrity. DSNY and VIC will have co-enforcement authority to issue administrative violations for commingling recyclables, unauthorized collection in a zone, interference with the commercial waste zone program, and in any other rules that the city promulgates in the future. In addition to creating an efficient, rational system to collect commercial waste, our plan for commercial waste zones also sets out to achieve a number of related program goals. As previously mentioned, the documented safety issues associated with the private hauling industry demand action. New York City's residents expect and deserve safe streets. Commercial waste zones will support the city's ongoing work to eliminate deaths and serious injuries on New York City streets under Vision Zero. During the solicitation process, carters will be evaluated in part based on health and safety plans submitted as well as their safety record in previous years. Promoting the public safety within the commercial waste industry begins with worker safety. Our plan requires that Carters provide safety and training programs to build a culture of safety within the commercial waste industry and ensure that workers know how to perform their jobs safely. Specifically, Carters will be required to provide a minimum of 40 hours of worker safety, safety training to all drivers and helpers that collect waste on city streets. But we all know that training alone is not enough. 
the choices that companies make regarding how long their drivers are expected to work and under what conditions have a real-world impact. With fewer trucks on the streets and shorter routes, zone collection service will reduce incentives for unsafe working conditions, such as placing drivers on 14-hour shifts on long, circuitous routes just to fill up a truck. This will reduce the risks of unsafe driving behavior and worker fatigue and lead to a healthier, safer city. The Department will also receive and take appropriate action in response to all whistleblower complaints, including anonymous complaints. We will establish a displaced employee list and require that every carter utilize city programs that promote hiring from local communities. New York City has set an ambitious goal of sending zero waste to landfills. While we have primarily focused on the role that city residents play in this effort, businesses, businesses have an equally important role in helping to achieve this goal. Under this plan, all carters that provide service within commercial waste zones will be required to provide recycling collection to the businesses they serve and organics collection to businesses that request it and they must do so at a discount when compared to refuse collection services. As part of the solicitation process, carters will submit zero waste plans and identify innovative practices to support waste reduction, reuse, and recycling. Carters will also be required to provide third-party waste audits to customers at no charge to help them identify opportunities to save money and reduce waste. New York City is a leader in fighting climate change and reducing harmful air pollution that affects the health of its residents and the environment. One NYC, the city's blueprint for building a strong and fair city, calls for substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Establishing commercial waste zones is an important step toward this goal. Our analysis shows that annual vehicle miles traveled associated with commercial waste collection would be decreased by 50 percent, even after accounting for new truck routes to collect some additional recycling and organics that would be diverted. This reduction in traffic would lead to commensurate reductions of emissions of all kinds, including greenhouse gases, particulate matter, and other air pollutants. Reducing truck traffic associated with commercial waste collection will also lead to co-benefits in other areas. Fewer trucks means less nighttime noise, less roadway wear and tear, and improve quality of life in neighborhoods across New York City. Businesses in New York City demand and deserve consistent, responsive, and dependable service. Commercial waste zones will provide low, fair, transparent pricing for large and small businesses, while strengthening minimum standards for customer service. Carters will be required to provide written service agreements to all of their customers outlining rates and any fees so businesses that only pay for the waste they produce. Our plan also preserves competition and customer choice by allowing businesses to select, to select from up to three to five qualified carters in each zone. The city will outline baseline customer service standards in the RFP that will be included in all contracts between carters and the customers. Minimum requirements will include an itemized monthly billing statement, customized, customer service hotline, and a website. Additionally, carters will submit customer service plans in their proposals to detail how they will implement customer service support, performance metrics, communication tools, and other community benefits. This approach also provides an exciting opportunity for the city to prioritize investments in waste management inf infrastructure on two fronts, resilient, sustainable, and equitable infrastructure and safe, reliable fleets. Through the competitive solicitation process, the city will require carters to submit a waste management plan for all waste and recyclables collected from customers. This plan will outline the transfer, processing, and final disposal locations for all materials collected. The city will evaluate these waste management plans based on the principles of sustainability, reliability, and equity. Safe modern fleets are key to creating a robust and sustainable commercial waste collection system, and carters will be required to maintain a fleet that is safe and capable of performing all applicable collection services for their customers. Proposers that seek to invest in infrastructure and technologies that promote program goals, including clean vehicles, safety, technology, and sustainable waste management facilities will receive favorable consideration during the selection process. I will now turn to the bill under consideration today, 
Intro 1574 largely reflects the plan for commercial waste zones that I just described. We are generally supportive of this legislation and are eager to work with the Council to enact a local law that will establish a safe and efficient waste collection system that improves the quality of life for all New Yorkers, that works for the city's local businesses, and that supports the city's short and long-term goals for a cleaner, safer, and more sustainable city. However, the administration has concerns about one important difference between the introduced bill and the plan I described. Intro 1574, as introduced, limits the department to selecting just one carter per zone. Having just one carter in each zone, rather than three to five carters, would achieve only marginal environmental improvement, with a truck travel reduction about eight percentage points higher than the non-exclusive plan, but would lead to far greater disruption to an industry vital to the health and safety of our city and its customers. Only a few large carters operating today have the resources and capital to viably compete to be the sole service provider for any such zone. In an exclusive system, nearly all small and medium-sized carters would automatically be wiped out. In the four years that we have taken to study this industry and develop our plan, we spoke to scores of customers and business groups. The message from these groups is clear. Choice matters. Customers demand high quality and responsive service, and they want to be able to fire their carter if the service does not meet their needs. An exclusive zone model would create a monopoly within each zone, eliminating businesses' leverage and creating a lopsided power dynamic between carter and customer. In this monopolistic system, carters would have no incentive to offer less than the maximum price, and without pressure from regulated competition, service quality would suffer. The city's plan preserves the element of choice, albeit in a more organized fashion than exists today. Some businesses would prefer we keep the current system, despite its very real costs and externalities, such as air and noise pollution from excess truck traffic. But as I hope you will hear from many of them today, the city's plan reflects years of engagement, of listening and reflection, and it seeks to achieve a balance between serving the needs of customers and achieving the other program goals that I have described. Lastly, creating an exclusive zone system puts a far greater burden on the city and the department to regulate individual service agreements and resolve disputes. While our non-exclusive approach allows customers to fire their carter if the service is not up to par, in an exclusive system, the city would be forced to mediate each and every claim. And if a carter failed to provide adequate service to customers in a zone or pulls out of a zone altogether, the department would step in to provide service until a replacement could be procured. In a non-exclusive system, the city would more freely impose contractual remedies on bad actors, including potentially termination for cause, knowing that other qualified carters could quickly step in to provide the service afterward. The department knows very well the challenges that come with removing thousands of tons of waste from our streets every day. New York City's businesses, small and large, must have high quality, dependable waste collection services at a predictable cost. The adoption of commercial waste zones represents the most significant reform of New York City's commercial waste industry since the creation of the Trade Waste Commission in the 1990s, and it is a transformative step forward that will improve health and safety in our communities and for workers in the industry. The department looks forward to working with the council to build a successful commercial waste zones policy through continued stakeholder participation and public input. We are committed to designing a system that simultaneously improves quality of life for New Yorkers and meets the needs of both the business community and the waste collection industry. I want to thank the sponsors of this legislation and the other bills under consideration today for their ongoing partnership in these efforts. Moreover, I want to thank the activists, organizers, and other stakeholders, many of whom are here today, for their important work over the last several years to help shape the plan for commercial waste zones and for helping to craft this historic piece of legislation. I will now turn over the microphone to Commissioner Janelle to address the remaining bills, after which we will be happy to answer your questions. Good morning, Chair Reynoso and the other members of the City Council's Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management and other members of the Council. My name is Noah Janelle and I am the Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Business Integrity Commission. With me at the table today is Executive Agency Council Emily Anderson 
and my colleagues from the New York City Department of Sanitation. Thank you for inviting us to testify at today's hearing regarding seven bills relating to New York City's trade waste industry. This is an important time for BIC and for the city as a whole. BIC's mission is growing. Today, the focus in the trade waste industry cannot be solely on organized crime and corruption. That must always be an essential part of our mission, but we must also seek to protect the people who live in, work in, and visit New York City in other ways, particularly as they travel through our streets. Intro number 1573 will help us do that. My testimony today will focus on the BIC specific bills at issue at this hearing, and then I will briefly discuss intro number 1574 relating to commercial waste zones. The Business Integrity Commission was created by local law in 1996 under the name the Trade Waste Commission. Its mission was and still is to free the trade waste hauling industry from the grip of organized crime and other types of corruption. Trade waste, for those unfamiliar with the term, is essentially commercial garbage or waste and recyclable materials. It can be the common waste and recyclables that come from stores and restaurants, or it can be construction and demolition debris from construction sites. If you haul it from a location in New York City, you need a license or registration from BIC. BIC also regulates the public wholesale food markets in the city. For the past 23 years, BIC has fought with significant success against organized crime and other criminality in the industries it regulates. That fight is far from over and we remain vigilant. We are also diligently preparing for the January 1st, 2020 deadline set by Local Law 145 of 2013, the Trade, Will Trade Waste Vehicle Emissions Law. We have a hearing pursuant to the Citywide Administrative Procedure Act, or CAPA, scheduled for next month on rules relating to trade waste unions as we prepare to start registering them as required by Local Law 55 of 2019. And among other things, we continue to enforce the rules that prohibit the practice of commingling commercial waste with both recyclables and organics. As you can see, we're a small agency with a great deal of responsibility. As always, we urge the members of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Committee and other members of the City Council, as well as members of the trade waste industry and the public in general, to tell us if you are aware of a company violating our rules and regulations. Historically, safety has not been BIC's mandate or focus. There are many other agencies that have a hand in public safety. Of course, the New York City Police Department is the first agency you think of when you think about protecting people on the streets of New York. The New York City, state, and federal departments of transportation also play major roles in traffic safety. We have been working closely with all of those agencies and many others over the last several years as BIC has taken on a larger role in promoting safety in the trade waste industry. In 2016, BIC joined the Vision Zero Task Force. Through that task force, we have strengthened our relationships with many of our sister agencies as we work together to improve traffic safety in the trade waste industry. As a result of that work, we established BIC's Interagency Collision Review Panel last year. The panel meets quarterly and brings together members of several city agencies, NYPD, DOT, TLC, DCAS, and DSNY, to review fatal crashes in the city that involved a trade waste truck. We want to learn from those crashes and determine whether there is something that can be done to prevent similar crashes in the future. In 2018, we issued our trade waste safety manual and promulgated new rules that require our licensees and registrants to report to BIC on events such as crashes and also required them to increase their insurance coverage. But we were constrained by our limited authority in the administrative code from issuing new safety standards in the industry. Intro number 1573 can help change that. Perhaps most importantly, intro 1573 would give BIC the power and duty to establish and enforce environmental safety and health standards, including traffic safety requirements for trade waste vehicles. BIC will be able to establish new rules in the industry in areas such as driver training and certification, equipment on trucks, and other issues. While we still must be careful of preemption issues when promulgating rules, 
we will now have greater latitude to create new standards in the industry and enforce them. As a corollary to that power, BIC would expressly be empowered to deny, revoke, or suspend a license or registration for failure to comply with any city, state, or federal law, rule, or regulation relating to traffic safety or the collection, removal, transportation, or disposal of trade waste in a safe manner. Collecting and hauling trade waste is an inherently dangerous job. Where there is a company that demonstrates a pattern of behavior that creates a danger to the public, we will now have more tools to help address that problem. But with respect to intro number 1575 regarding additional penalties to be issued to trade waste companies for their driver's violations of the New York vehicle and traffic law, there may be legal concerns that we have to work through as the bill moves forward. Regarding intro number 1611, which relates to DSNY permitted transfer stations, BIC supports increased coordination between BIC and DSNY on transfer stations, which are a critical part of the trade waste industry. BIC will con continue to communicate with DSNY on transfer stations and is also conducting a full review of the ownership of all transfer stations in the city. Where BIC sees an issue, it will recommend action for DSNY to take. With respect to the unions at the transfer stations, BIC has not dealt with those unions and has not gained expertise in this area, and we look forward to working with Council to ensure BIC has the proper tools to regulate this industry. Additionally, the Law Department is reviewing the bill to see if there are any legal concerns. BIC supports the principle in intro number 1082 of requiring GPS in trade waste trucks but would like to work with the Council to find an appropriate scope for the requirement. This bill makes sense in the context of commercial waste zones and DSNY accepting the information and processing it. As currently drafted, intro number 1082 applies to all trade waste vehicles that are registered with BIC. That is approximately 7,500 vehicles and includes not only large packer trucks and dump trucks, but also pickup trucks and other smaller vehicles. It applies to all BIC licensees and registrants, including self-haulers, many of whom are landscapers. The cost to the industry would be significant, and the administrative burden on BIC would be massive. BIC does not have an IT infrastructure capable of accepting and analyzing what would surely be a massive amount of data from those 7,500 trucks. Intro number 1083 would set a specific range for penalties for failure to disclose employees to the commission in license applications. BIC already issues administrative violations for non-disclosure of employees, but intro number 1083 removes BIC's discretion as to what the penalty is. Currently, BIC's response to non-disclosure of information can range from a low-level penalty up to the denial of an application. Where the non-disclosure appears to be inadvertent or the result of a misunderstanding, BIC generally has imposed lesser fines and at times has given a warning. Toward the other end of the spectrum, fines can be steeper, up to $10,000 based on a number of factors, including the licensee's record of compliance with BIC's rules. And where an applicant has intentionally failed to disclose a principal or a key employee, BIC has denied a license or registration application. While BIC recognizes the Council's intent in intro number 1084A, which would require a minimum of three employees per trade waste truck or the maximum number of employees that can physically accompany each vehicle, this bill has a number of issues. As best addressed by DSNY, there are a number of operational issues that this bill raises, such as the fact that some operations, such as driving a roll-off truck, can safely be accomplished with one person. Lastly, I will turn to intro number 1574, which is the commercial waste zone legislation. BIC supports this DSNY-led effort to transform the system in New York City for hauling putrescible commercial waste, in other words, the run-of-the-mill commercial garbage and recyclables that every business generates and must hire a carting company to take away. We stand ready to be a supportive partner in this effort to help ensure the integrity of the companies operating in the new structure and their compliance with all related rules, regulations, and other requirements. 
This package of bills has the power to change the commercial carding industry in New York City for the better. From BIC's perspective, we are looking forward to working together with you, Chair Reynoso, and the rest of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Management Committee, and all of our other partners to make New York City's carding industry safer, cleaner, more efficient, and more transparent. Now I'm glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you for your testimony, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, we were joined by Councilmember Cohen Vallone and are joined currently by Councilmember Aspinall. Um, Vallone and Cohen have gone to another hearing and are coming right back because they have some questions. Uh, but uh, I want to start, can we please put the slide, and I want to stay with the slide, that shows the route that goes through New Jersey? That one. So just leave that there. I think that that's important that we continue to see uh, about the concept of what we're trying to do here is accomplish efficiencies uh, in vehicles miles traveled at a minimum to you know uh, contribute to the safe uh, saving our environment and uh, cutting back uh, and making sure that climate change is something we address in a meaningful way in the city of New York. On top of that, we have other things outside of environmental issues that are worker safety. Um, and uh, recycling rates being increased and so forth that we want to make sure that we can achieve. Uh, but I do want to ask you a couple of questions about the current market. Um, what is the market share like? So you said we have about 90 businesses. Uh, I wanted to know of those 90 businesses, um, the top 20, for example, businesses, or the, tw the 20 carting companies that haul the most trash in the city of New York, what is their market share overall in the city of New York. I want people to, and myself, to be able to grasp the concept of who's doing the work in the city of New York now. Okay. Um, first, I just wanted to thank uh, the council again for having this hearing on this very important legislation. I think it's a tremendous win for all New Yorkers. It will result in less air pollution, less noise pollution, 18 million miles of truck traffic saved, enhanced public safety, and improved employee safety. Uh, to answer your specific question, um, I'm going to defer to Justin Bland, who is the Director of Commercial Waste and who has spent nearly four years working on this plan, uh, so he can better answer that question. Yes, thank you. Um, so to answer your question, uh, there are about 250 companies that are licensed by BIC uh, to handle all types of trade waste, including putrescible waste. Uh, of those 250 that could be doing this activity, there are approximately 90 uh, that regularly collect the type of waste that we're talking about regulating. Um, so of those 90 companies, those range from uh, large international, uh, or one large international company, um, some multi-state operations, uh, down to one and two truck operators. Um, so it's a spread. Um, the largest company has about 15% of the market share. Um, so one company has 15% of the market share right now. That's right. Okay. Um, that's roughly 15,000 customers. There's another couple of companies with over 10,000 customers. Uh, and, and I'd say there's about 10 companies with uh, a few thousand to seven or 8,000. Uh, and there are many, many companies uh, with less than a thousand. So when I talk about market share, sure. can, so, you, can you help me come? There's a lot of numbers you threw out there. It seems like you have a one, every 1,000 companies equals 1% 1 of businesses in the city of New York because you said 15,000 companies. To use round 15%. numbers, yeah, there's 100,000 customers. All right, so, um, help me, so help me out here. So the top 20 companies, to directly answer your question, the top 20 companies handle about 80% of the market share. So, so for the the public hearing here and the folks paying attention. So there seems to already be a consolidation that has happened uh, within the trade waste industry where the top 20 companies of 90, or we can say maybe 20, uh, what is that, 25% of the companies account for 80% of the business um, in the city of New York already. Is that a fair statement to be, to be made? Yeah, it is, it's a consolidated industry. So the 70 companies that do about 20% of the city's trash, so there's a 70 percent and other 70 companies that are left over only do 20 percent of the city's work. Right, and keep in mind that there's other types of waste that that these companies are probably doing as well, like hauling construction debris or right, right. clear out something. Understood. Like that. So, so we have a a, uh, a conversation that's being had and a point that's being made made about choice. 
But it seems like the city of New York has chosen to do work with mostly 20 businesses already, 20 carters, is the choice that it seems that the city of New York has already made. And I'm not talking about you in the city. I guess the businesses of the city of New York have chosen that these 20 companies are going to be the ones that we're mostly going to lean on to do the work that we're asking. 80% of them, yes. 80% of them. So I just want to make sure that when it comes to that conversation, that, that, that's something we talk about because uh, there, there's going to be a group of folks that are going to talk about choice. And it seems like they've already, within themselves, consolidated themselves to about uh, 20 companies that they think are doing, I guess, good work in the city of New York and should continue to get uh, their contracts and be clients of theirs. Um, so what about payment? Uh, do you, did you see in the study and the work that you've done uh, regarding what businesses pay, uh, there are companies that are concerned about their prices going up. Uh, and I think small businesses, mid-sized businesses, and large businesses all have different types of needs. But I think what I saw in the, in the study is that the smaller the business, the, the more they were paying for their trash. Um, is that a fair statement as well? And can you uh, elaborate on the, the findings in the study that speak to uh, <clears throat> how much businesses are paying? Right, so there is a citywide rate cap that the Business Integrity Commission sets. So it's illegal to, go, to charge above that rate cap on a per weight or per volume basis. Um, so okay. just to start, everyone's under the rate cap right. or should be under the rate cap. Um, beyond that, it's largely up to what a customer negotiates. Um, what we have seen today through interviews and through analysis of the data is there's very little logic to who pays what. Um, what we see is the ability to negotiate, the knowledge that you can negotiate, is really what determines your rate. So uh, this does bias uh, larger producers, or biases the system in favor of large producers. So if you have a big uh, portfolio of properties and a lot of waste, and this is a large uh, lucrative contract, uh, you can negotiate a better deal than, say, a corner bodega can. Right. So uh, in our initial study that led us to pursue this system, we found that small customers pay, I believe the number is 38% more than large customers. Okay, so smaller businesses are paying 38% more on average than the larger businesses. Of course, there's an economies of scale that we understand that the more trash you, got, you have, I guess the, the less you pay, but when it comes to tipping, uh, that doesn't change, right? Uh, wherever their the transfer station is, if it's, and I'm making this number up, $20 a ton, you tip it, that's how much you pay. Um, that's not gonna change in the back end, but in the front end, the trash does is valued at different rates. Is that also something? So when the customers are paying for the trash to be picked up, that varies significantly, but when you tip it, is the tipping fee generally the same across the board? A truck is a truck is a truck? Right, so when a, t a truck is paying a transfer station to dump its contents, there's no distinction between this is bodega waste and this is an office building waste. Right. Like you said, trash is trash. Okay. For, um, for charges to customers, um, you know, what we found, th again, through data analysis and through interviews is this is largely a transparency issue. Uh, right. and the knowledge that you can negotiate is not always out there yeah. to smaller businesses. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. This, the business community, I really want to communicate that to, that there is a discrepancy there in how much carters are charging folks. It really has no sense. It's kind of like uh, who knows um, their rights to be able to negotiate and who doesn't and whether they can do that. I want to ask a question of Bic and you guys. Uh, uh, let me know if I'm talking to the right agency here when I ask a question. Um, there was a Sanitation Salvage is a company that went out of business. Um, when they went out of business, uh, I believe that there was a process by which BIC and DSNY allowed for other carters to go about picking up that business. So they were told, look, this is the client list of the work that Sanitation Salvage used to do. You can go ahead and pick that trash up. Um, what was the success rate of the transfer of business between uh, several carters um, and, and sanitation salvage businesses. And I'm saying this, I guess, the question that I'm posing comes from foundationally that I heard from some of these larger companies that they actually couldn't take on the business at the price that sanitation salvage was charging. That sanitation salvage was charging prices that were so low that it, it didn't meet basic operational like uh, minimums for them to be able to make any profit off of it. 
Uh, and, and, the, and that goes to this race to the bottom situation where uh, you're trying to charge the least amount so you can get the most amount of businesses, but in doing so, you can't pay your workers a decent wage, you can't make investments into your, into your facilities, and you definitely can't make investments on your trucks. So I just wanna know if that premise and that thought that I'm moving through has any foundation, I guess. So with sanitation salvage, you're exactly right. Um, what we found in, on the sanitation end, uh, working with BIC, I managed the day-to-day -day, uh, managing of which customers are switched and which uh, DSNY has to provide emergency service for. Um, anecdotally, from customers, other carters uh, across the board, uh, it's like you said, they were charging rates that no one else had in a decade. Uh, these were bottom of the barrel rates and through our investigations and the reason that they were denied we know how they could do that it's they were cheating their workers and they were running them 14 plus hour shifts and paying less than a minimum wage um, so in sanitation salvage that's absolutely true so when a small business who doesn't know the background of this of what's happening with sanitation salvage for example they only know that there's a truck that comes and picks up my garbage and they do it at a very affordable rate. For a business, that's a good thing. They gotta make sure that they cut as many, that they, their bottom line is in a way that they can make some money, they can pay their workers, and they continue to do work in the city of New York. We wanna make sure we support businesses and that they can continue to do this work. But what I, I guess what I want them to see is like pull the curtains back. That what they've done is that they've paid workers $80 to be in the back of a truck a night. Uh, and with hours that we've heard range from 12, 14, and 16 hour days. Um, so the, so uh, workers that are, drivers that are getting paid a low amount, uh, vehicles that are out of date, uh, recycling not being something that is encouraged or something they care about. So just loads of, of, of concerns that we have here in the city of things we want to address. We want to address the environment. We want worker safety. We want to make sure people are paid a, a, a fair wage or at least minimum wage, a legal wage, which also wasn't happening. But they're getting a good deal on their end. And I wanna make sure that we put that in perspective, that there is a cost to you not paying of, uh, a fair wage here in the, in the, in the work that you do in getting your tr uh, trash hauled. It means that workers can die, like Mark Tordialo, who was one of the members that died, that was a, a worker for sanitation salvage who was getting paid $80 a day. That's the type of stuff we're trying to address. Now, I wanna make sure that I, I put that in perspective as well because uh, there are companies that are doing the right thing there are companies that are paying their workers a fair wage. There are companies that are providing safety, that have newer trucks. Those companies are trying to compete with the sanitation salvages of the world that don't care about these workers, that don't care about these trucks. We're not trying to go after these carting companies that are doing the right thing. We want them to continue to do work in the city of New York. They are meeting a standard that we believe is a New York standard. But there are a lot of businesses that are not. And that is the ones, those are the ones that are gonna suffer through this system. There are a lot of conversations about we don't wanna get rid of these carters, they're small businesses. But in this case, I wanna be very clear. If you're killing people, if you're not paying people a fair wage, if your trucks are destroying the environment, destroying, destroying our streets, I don't want you to do business in the city of New York. So I just wanna be clear, that's a statement from me that I wanna make sure is clear. <laughs> um, so I got, I'm gonna ask one more question because I wanna allow for, um, my colleagues will also ask questions, and we've also been joined by Council, Council Member Constantinides and Mark Jonai. Um, so Los Angeles is a very popular uh, uh, comparison city that the folks that don't want this to happen always refer to. Uh, I've done my own research about what's happened in LA, um, and I'm up to date with what's happening in LA. Uh, I believe the systems are different. I believe that the work that LA was doing was almost exclusively an environmental justice um, uh, push, more so than uh, a, 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 business, a business model and transaction push. They, could, they didn't care about the prices at the tail end. They, what they wanted was vehicles, miles, travels reduced, and they wanted to make sure that they were addressing an environmental issue. As a coastal city and a coastal uh, state, I understand why they care deeply about the environment and wanted to do that. But can you give us some contrast um, as to why this, uh, in, in the negative parts, or maybe there are places where they are actually the same in positive parts, but how does this differ to LA in any way? 
Um, so just stepping back before addressing Los Angeles, Los Angeles was not the first city to do this. This is a common policy, and there are many different ways of doing it all across the country. Do you know, can you name a couple of cities that have also done it that are not Los Angeles? So many small towns will have an exclusive contract f or some sort of non-exclusive arrangement for municipal or residential pickup. So you know, a large company will just hold the contract and provide household collections. That's very common in a small town that doesn't have their own municipal workforce. Um, there are many cities, uh, larger cities, and this is mostly on the West Coast, but also um, you know, in the middle and on the East Coast, that uh, have a variety of different systems. So uh, it's a flexible policy that can be tailored to the specific policy needs and just the specific conditions of a city. Um, Los Angeles was an exclusive zone franchise. So they split the city into uh, 11 zones and one hauler uh, got the right to work in each zone. Um, there are other cities with non-exclusive systems uh, where uh, a handful or um, sometimes it's more like a uh, much more regulated permitting system where you're actually in contract with the city. Um, there's examples like San Jose, uh, where the process was use, used largely to build a, uh, an advanced um, disposal network. So it's, it varies. Los Angeles is one. Uh, it's definitely the most notable uh, in the news recently um, as, as we are doing this. But uh, a dif so a difference between their plan and our proposal, uh, the key issue is we are uh, proposing a non-exclusive plan. It's similar to how Los Angeles approached it with uh, incentivizing uh, environmental benefits, efficiency, um, and just protections for safety and workers. Um, ours allows, uh, our plan allows a baseline of three carters and the densest areas going up to five. Uh, and it addresses a lot of what I'm sure we'll hear about Los Angeles, uh, some of which is uh, mostly based on anecdotal evidence. Um, uh, so there was notably uh, a bumpy transition period when Los Angeles rolled out. There were many complaints about uh, missed pickups. Um, that is something we take very seriously and we think a non-exclusive system will directly address that in giving customers the right to say, oh, this carter is not, not doing its job right away. Okay, I have a backup. Um, there were also, and this is much more anecdotal, uh, pricing complaints uh, saying, you know, my bill doubled, my bill tripled. Um, some of that might be that uh, you had a company that wasn't paying its taxes, which I know was the case in Los Angeles, or uh, you had a company that wasn't recycling, which was also the case, and now it has to recycle. Um, but we also think that we can increase the standards and give customers some choice on price as well. So if you get a quote and it's through the roof, uh, you have a backup and companies knowing that they have a backup will incentivize them to offer uh, very competitive rates. So I wanted to have a conversation about the exclusive and non-exclusive. I, I wanna say that this plan is a lot more than this conversation that we're about to have, and I'm glad that we were able to address other issues outside of that in a meaningful way, and I'm looking forward to hearing more testimony. Um, I wanna make a couple of arguments that I've heard uh, on, uh, on our front why exclusive zones makes sense. Um, and I've actually heard this from the carding companies themselves, uh, uh, and how we can actually save money for businesses. So now I wanna look out for the interests of businesses here and see how we can uh, do the most good with the least amount of harm, right? Which is how to achieve these goals of reducing vehicles miles, uh, making sure that workers are getting paid what they're supposed to get paid, and that the, sanita the sanitation salvages of the world don't, don't continue to do work in the city of New York, while also making sure that we um, don't hurt businesses in their in the, the bottom line. Um, a, a carding company told me that if they have a guaranteed amount of businesses, they could present the a lower bid to the Department of Sanitation through an RFP. If they know that they're gonna have 10,000 customers, for example, for 10 years guaranteed, and know exactly how the route is gonna be laid out even before they present you with the RFP, when they present you with the RFP, without having to uh, uh, find businesses that they can have a very efficient route with guaranteed businesses for 10 years and they can present a very, very low bid to the, the city of New York. If you insert several other people into, several other car carding companies into 
the, the bidding process. Um, they can't guarantee those 10,000 businesses. Now they're talking about fighting for those 10,000 businesses between two other carters. And they're saying that they're going to have to project, let's say, 20% of the businesses, that they can get 20% of those businesses. They're going to have to do it at the low end, depending on the comp how the competition works. In doing so, are going to have to present routes that are not as efficient and not, not, not as direct as they would have been if it would have been exclusively a one carter zone, and also um, not being able to guarantee the amount of businesses either. They don't know if they're going to be generating X amount of dollars versus Y amount of dollars because there's no guarantee on the businesses. So on that end, they feel like uh, with the route efficiency, which we save on petrolable, uh, uh, petrolable, I'm sorry, petroleum or gas, they'll save on gas through these efficiencies. They also said that the hours by which their workers would work would be reduced significantly through an, an, a more efficient route. So they're, so they're able to get um, their workers to work fair hours, uh, not less gas, and guaranteed businesses allows them to come with a more competitive price. For businesses, I thought that this would be something that they would be interested in because it helps their bottom line. Um, how would a a non uh, a non exclusive zone um, help achieve those goals at least when it comes to the pricing that we're charging uh, these businesses? Right. So there's a lot there. I can get to every point. Just remind me if uh, if I haven't covered it. So yeah. just for what businesses actually want, we know that. Uh, any zone system, and we've looked at dozens of different models and the process that we went through and evaluating the benefits. Uh, the, the simple act of putting some boundaries around how a, how a route is run. Um, as you can see here, this is the before and after. The after is not the perfect computer generated uh, house to house route. Um, there's some inefficiency there, but you can see it's it's dramatically more efficient. So this is what a non-exclusive route would look like. Any any type of system we have is going to bring huge 50% and greater uh, traffic reductions and associated efficiency benefits with that. With that comes uh, lower operating costs, and this is what our draft environmental impact statement showed. Uh, even with additional program requirements, there will be lower operating costs. So the, uh, this policy change uh, will, not, uh, will not increase the bottom line for carters, and that should not be passed on to customers. The way we ensure that is by making this a very competitive uh, solicitation process, making these zone contracts valuable. Um, your point was that an exclusive system would be more valuable to a carter. Um, I think there's a good point to that, but if you ask businesses what they want and what they think about that, you know, I've engaged hundreds of businesses, probably thousands with our representatives. Not a single one thinks that they will get better price with an exclusive system. Uh, they don't need 90 carters operating on their streets. Most businesses shop when they shop around, it's the three to five range. This replicates basic choice and just having a backup, having even the threat of firing your carter uh, handles most service complaints and it gets you a lower price. So if you ask businesses what would be better for you, and I think you'll hear it today, it's gonna be the non-exclusive system. Um, for carters, yeah, it would be great if carters had guaranteed business, but I think if they have guaranteed business and they don't have the threat of losing customers, then your service can go down. So we want them to have to work. We want them to have to offer uh, competitive prices. They're gonna have to offer competitive prices in their bid and a good service plan in their bid just to get a city contract. And then they're gonna have to compete with the customers. So we want the carters to work to get market share. We think that's a good thing, and that's a good thing for customers. All right, I'm gonna have two more questions and I'm gonna pass it on to my colleagues for questions. Uh, the, the issue I have there in the conversation is once we go through the RFP, uh, do you have a projection if you want to make that statement publicly, of how many carters through a non-exclusive zone system would end up having contracts with the city of New York? And like, what's the number of carting companies that we would be left with? Um, sure. So we, we don't have a number, and I wanna make it clear, we don't think the number of companies is an inherently bad thing. The problems we're addressing is that we have 90 companies and they're all operating on top of each other and they're operating on the same streets. There's a way to organize this and allow smaller companies and a range of companies to survive in this. And that's what our plan sought to achieve. And we think 
uh, it's a fair playing field in our plan that a five truck operator can be very competitive and can have very efficient operations and can actually compete with the uh, multinational firms. Um, if this were an exclusive system, there are five companies that operate today that have the capital and have the customers to be competitive. So those small companies would be, they would not have a chance to compete. We want the best companies to get contracts, not, not just the biggest, it has to be the best. So I wanted to talk about the zones. So right now, you're operating under this understanding that there are 20 zones in the city of New York is what you cut them up to. I want to be clear, and a lot of people and some council members and some businesses uh, make the case that if you have 20 zones uh, and uh, one carter can have 15 of them uh, under an exclusive zone, uh, you know, you can have three carters run the whole city. Um, but the legislation doesn't preclude you from adding more zones. The legislation says at least 20. So I want to start by ha making clear with people that we're not asking for 20 zones necessarily. Uh, we want to, what we want to do is allow for the businesses to have the lowest amount of prices, right, in doing so, but also allow for there to be uh, an increase in the amount of zones that we can have so that one carter can't have, uh, you know, 75% of the businesses, that that would be impossible to do. You can expand off of the 20 zones. Your original study, for example, in Staten Island has three zones. That could easily, that has three carters in one, in one entire zone. Um, that could be made into three zones. Um, in Staten Island of individual carters in each. Um, so just speaking and having the conversation about that the zones are not necessarily set in stone and that we're not saying we want to do this under 20. So we're going to have folks under false premise and of course with misinformation try to stake the claim that three, or four, three to five carters could end up running the entire city. That is not our goal in any way, shape or form. That is not what we're trying to accomplish here. We do know that we can expand the number of zones we have and make them smaller and allow for more carters to do business in the city of New York. So I just want to make sure that we that that's clarified here, that the legislation specifically says 20 is at a minimum, uh, but it doesn't leave, uh, it doesn't cap the amount that we could expand it to, and that we're not looking to make the city of New York a five or even a 10 carter city, that we actually think that there is a lot more carters than that that do good work here. But I do want to say, a reduction in the amount of carters that are doing business in the city of New York is a goal that I have, that I think is important. Because uh, this customer satisfaction that businesses are talking about and service, if you win an RFP, you're one of the top companies in the city of New York. You're not talking about a B-level company. You're talking about A-level companies winning an RFP that's extremely competitive and rigorous. Off the bat, you're getting a good company. So I just want to be, sh and I want to be clear, I trust that those companies that get these contracts at the top are elite companies that understand service and understand making sure that their customers are taken care of. So I want to be clear, the RFP process right off the bat ensures that you're going to get a high quality carter. Poss possibly, if you're within the 20% of the city that's not using one of the top 20 companies, an increase in service and in product and in how people do their work. So I just want to be clear that this idea that you won't get good service, you're already getting one of the top, tw uh, top at least 20 companies in the city of New York doing work in your district or in your zone, which is a vast improvement from this fight of, now can we go to the slide of the, f the, the 25 carters in one block? This one on uh, West 57th Street, 25 carters on one block. I, out of those 25 carters, and I'm gonna throw up a fake number and just make it up, five, let's say five carters are bad carters. Those five businesses are already going to get an improvement right off the bat in an RFP system. So I just wanna say that the RFP itself is supposed to provide good players. So I just wanna just clarify those points. Um, and, and then for, for BIC, uh, the city of New York does business with very, what I call shady companies. Sanitation Salvage did business with the city of New York. Five Star did business with the city of New York. Flag did business with the city of New York. The city of New York has no, seems to have no problem doing business with carding companies that, seem, that have very s negative track records. So my concern actually comes from, are we gonna get rid of the bad guys in this system when BIC itself allows for the city to do work with carding companies that are very suspect? So BIC doesn't directly uh, hire carding companies for the city, BIC vets 
the carding companies, and we were constantly looking at their good character, honesty, and integrity. As you saw two weeks ago, um, we denied the renewal application of Flag and Formica Container, uh, and as of yesterday, they're out of the industry. So um, where we see those issues, we take action. So who evaluates whether a carding company deserves to do business with the city? Because it seems like every time BIC finishes an investigation and finds out that they're bad, DSNY has to scramble to move a contract over to a more reputable, I guess, company. Um, but why is it that the city of New York doesn't have a system in place to track who's good and who's bad and whether or not this RFP system is gonna, would help us through that? That's for DSNY. So it's just, uh, you, you, your evaluation system right now, I guess is what I'm saying, is suspect. What makes me feel comfortable that an RFP system would allow for us to ensure that the flags, the sanitation salvages, and the five stars of the world are not the ones receiving contracts? Yeah, so the commercial waste zone system will solve any problem that exists. Uh, the RFP process will be exhaustive. We will look not just at price, but health and safety plans, uh, the prior work records, employee prior record uh, in safety, dealing with employees, fair wages. Um, it'll be a solid waste management plan. It'll be an exhaustive review, and through this you know, very detailed process, we'll be able to select the best carters to collect waste. And you, can't do, and you can't do that now? Well, we don't, well, yeah, right now the Department of Sanitation doesn't regulate uh, commercial card. Okay, so an RFP system is supposed to be the system that'll allow you to now be able to track who's good and who's Yes, good. and there'll be contractual remedies so that if a carter isn't complying with the contract that it enters into the city, uh, we can take immediate action, including an up to termination. Okay, thank you. And now I'm going to allow for my colleagues to ask questions. I'm going to put three minutes on the clock, uh, and we're going to start with Councilmember Constantinidis, followed by Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chair Reynoso. Um, I have three questions, so I'm going to ask the questions first, and then you can take the time to answer them. Um, number one, uh, how does the commercial waste zone bill help us meet the administration's goal of zero waste by 2030 and our overall goal of reducing emissions 80% by 2050. Uh, second, uh, what role does recycling and composting have to have in lowering greenhouse gas emissions? And three, uh, how will commercial waste zones create jobs and recycling uh, in the city of New York? So starting with emissions, um, the big obvious benefit here is we're reducing truck traffic by 50% or more. So having trucks drive less is 18 million miles taken off the road every year. Uh, there's a 50% uh, reduction in truck traffic and similar reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and uh, particulate matter associated uh, with, um, with truck operations. Uh, in terms of recycling, uh, that is a great benefit of this plan that we have not really spent much time on yet, so um, thank you for asking the question. Um, what, what we are seeking to do is get uh, companies that are committed to furthering our zero waste goals. Uh, we'll do that first in the uh, RFPs for the zones. Every carter is going to have to submit their zero waste plan, and that's a criteria that we'll use to select companies that are willing to make investments and are willing to demonstrate they can handle materials properly. They're actually gonna send their recyclables to the correct place. They're making investments uh, in composting and organics processing, or they're partnering with people that can do that. Um, furthermore, everyone that gets a contract is going to have to offer these services. A lot of why we don't have uh, really robust recycling participation now across the board is companies don't have to offer it. Businesses have to get a carter, they're required to recycle, but it's kind of a loophole that uh, just has blame being passed between the carter and customer. This will say if you are a zoned carter, you have to give the service for everything that that customer is required to do. So you will get a recycling truck. If you are required to separate your organics, you will get an organics truck, uh, and we will incentivize uh, voluntary organics above and beyond minimum requirements. Um, furthermore, we will have those services offered at a discount. So customers will be incentivized in their bills uh, to separate their materials properly uh, and they will have a lower bill because of it. Similar to- Let me quickly just jump sure. in because I'm, I'm, I'm almost out of time here. Okay. So I'm also gonna show, what is our plan on the long-term 
relating to trucks. Uh, what environmental standards are we going to be holding the actual trucks to in the long term that we feel as, we, as new technology moves forward, as we're able to reduce emissions from the trucks themselves, going above and beyond where we've gone now, how are we going to be able to continue to move the industry to a you know, completely you know, emissions-free over time? Uh, that's another area where we can use the RFP process to incentivize commitments above and beyond the minimum requirements. The minimum requirements being Local Law 145, uh, which is coming into place. So at a minimum, to be considered, you have to be in full compliance uh, with that emissions law. But we want above and beyond. So we want commitments for making investments in natural gas or electric trucks. Um, those are the kind of things that we want to see, and you will have a better chance of winning a contract if you can make those commitments. I look forward to working with you to ensure that happens and working with our chair and ensuring you know, I, I'm, I'm a supporter of this bill because of the environmental concerns, because I know it's going to make our streets safer, because we're going to make our workers safer and give them a, a better future. So with that, I, I thank the chair for his indulgence of me going over time. <laughs> thank you, Councilmember Constantinides. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Cornegie and I uh, want to go ahead and Councilmember Joe and I for questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I uh, am the chair of small business, and with that comes a great responsibility to assure that our small businesses continue to operate in an environment which will allow them to survive and thrive. Competition, open markets, is the only way I know to assure increase in quality of service and a decrease in prices for the products and the services that they purchase. My concerns are if we limit zoning to one or three vendors, there is no assurance that we'll have price fixing or go back to the bad old days of Louis walking into your place of establishment with a cigar and giving you an ultimatum. That's the reason BIC was formed, to fight corruption, to fight price fixing, to weed out any illegal or unlawful element in the industry. This will take us back 23 years ago. I want to see the same arguments being made to our independent operators of taxis that say there are too many of you out there, we're going to determine who survives and who doesn't. I want to see these same arguments hold water with a nail salon that says you have too many nail salons in New York City, or food establishments. New Yorkers have enjoyed the freedom and privileges of choice. That's who we are. That's who guarantees our freedom and sets us apart from the rest of the world. The arguments made of environmental concern and impact, explain to me where these operators are coming from. Where are their trucks departing their station? Where is their transfer station where they're going to be dumping their products and going back to service the corridors? The same amount of traffic, because it could be a Queens operator that have a Bronx uh, zone, will have to cross that bridge to get to their customers, to go back to their transfer station, to come back again. So there will be an increase in traffic. And I don't underestimate the, in, the innovation and creativity of our small businesses. Operators know how to cut corners. They're not going to put out a truck to go pick up a single customer miles away. It wouldn't make sense for them. No, would it make sense from an economic of fuel or labor costs or wear and tear on their trucks? If we implement this in its current form with limited options, We've undermined every commercial corridor and operator out there. We've put another burden on them, and this is government again saying, we know what's best for you, while we chisel away at the bottom line of every mom and pop shop out there. Last night at 9.30, I was summoned to Morris Park Avenue by a restaurant owner who just received a $500 increase in the fees that they're paying their carter. That is a 200% increase from what they were paying previously. These hearings are important 
because we get to understand all sides and hopefully that'll help us make a much better decision. So I'm relying on you, Chair, and my colleagues to do right. But if you can answer those questions about what assurance this is going to have on the environment based on limited supply, what assurances are we going to have that prices and services, prices won't go through the roof and the decrease in service, I'd like to hear from all of you. Thank you. Hey, and just so for the clapping, if you do this, visually, we'll all see that you're supportive when you do this, um, and it won't disrupt the hearing. So let's not clap. If you have something that you want, that you appreciate, wave your hands. If you don't appreciate, just don't wave your hands. Thank you. So there were many parts to your, your question and statement there. Uh, to begin with, we did an exhaustive environmental analysis to determine the environmental savings. We got the actual routes from the Carters, and we then modeled what the system would look like under a zone system. We even took into account the exact time that the customers get picked up. So if a customer gets picked up at 11 p.m., we assume the customer would be picked up at the same time. And using this analysis, we found that there would be 50% savings in vehicle miles traveled, 18 million miles total. Can you go to the, can you go to the, the example of what we do now versus what exactly? Thank you, that's important. He also had a question about the environmental impact. Well, that. that's the environmental impact. So right. you t are you saying that a Bronx Carter Operating in the Bronx will have to re be from the borough of the Bronx with a transfer station from the borough of the Bronx? Is that what you're saying? So what we're saying is that any Carter can compete for any zone. Uh, we will look at the transfer station that the, the Carter is tipping at. I mean, you, you had stated that a Bronx transfer, a, a Bronx Carter might tip in the Bronx, but we will give weight if a, to proximity of pickup. So if a Carter is picking up in the Bronx, we would like to see a disposal in the Bronx. If a Carter is picking up in Queens, we'd like to see disposal in Queens. So that, that will be weighted. Uh, so we do not expect at all to have the, and in fact it will eliminate the issue that you, were, you, you just mentioned. And then on pricing, you, you stated that um, some, uh, uh, someone in your district, I assume, uh, got a $500 bill higher this plan will eliminate that possibility. There'll be a maximum price set, and they will be obligated by contract not to charge more than that, and the customer will have the ability to negotiate lower pricing, so you would not be able to all of a sudden increase pricing by $500. That would be prohibited. And here, the Department of Sanitation will be monitoring these contracts. We will have outreach staff. We will, we will require the carters to educate their customers uh, so that they are aware of rights. And I, I, my impression is now that a lot of small business are not aware of their rights and are not able to negotiate with carters. That would change under the zone system. That's not true. I'm a, I'm a small business owner. I negotiated with my carter. I negotiate on price and service. And it sounds to me that government knows best again approach doesn't work here. I'm gonna ask a question on the record and I hope that, Chairman, please, I'm yeah, so sorry. Gonna, and after this, I'm done. The question, but after that, I gotta cut you off. Have you already determined the winners without the RFP going out? Because this all sounds like you've set up an environment to determine who is going to be selected and which companies are going to prevail and which companies are we going to destroy? Absolutely not. The whole point of this is to create a competitive process that furthers goals for the customers that allows competition and price uh, assurances uh, favors low pricing and transparent pricing, but also works for public safety, for worker safety, and for the environment. So we have not determined who the companies are. Uh, one of the driving forces behind our non-exclusive system is that it's fair for the carters that exist today. If you can be the most competitive carter, you're gonna get a contract. If you can offer the best service at the best price uh, with the least environmental footprint, you're gonna get a contract. And Look, thank you. You, you mentioned the, the yeah, Bronx. The, what is I, this, the map of, that we are seeing here? Uh, we know the environmental benefits, and th this is a map of everyone going through Bronx Community District 2, picking up one stop, and how long their routes are going through it. We know this is the case because the Carters gave us this information. They gave us their routes. When we did the first analysis, they said, oh, we gave you the wrong data, so we asked for it again, and it was the exact same thing. We know this is the case. They've reported it time and time again. 
And it's not their fault. It's because there are 90 companies operating on top of each other. To fill a truck, you have to, you have to run all throughout the city. That's, that's the, you're, it's impossible to have efficiencies now, and we're allowing that while still allowing for customer choice and price assurances. So, so I wanted to follow up because a lot of these uh, folks believe that the, the market provides the most efficiencies. And we talked about how the market is the one that's driving like the race to the bottom. But environmental impacts on truck traffic. In this one, it shows uh, through this community board, runs all these trucks run through it, and they're picking up from Westchester and what I think is Sunset Park, the end of Sunset Park or Bay Ridge, and that all these trucks are moving through all these communities and they're all coming out of that one little, uh, what you painted, that you guys call it a bl the black, which is, is probably a black and brown community, I'm pretty sure, but uh, that you have pointed there, all those trucks and all those routes run through that, and that people think this is efficient and that the system works is beyond me. But um, I appreciate uh, your answers to that question. We wanna call on Council Member Cornegie and he's gonna be followed by Council Member Deutsch. Uh, and thank Council you, Chair. Malone is back, um, and he wanted to ask questions, so it's going to be Carnegie, uh, Councilman Malone, and then Councilman Bedoche. So I have more of a statement than a question. As the former chair of the Committee on Small Business, um, I'm acutely aware that um, the council, in its zest and zeal, has begun to shrunk, shrink several industries. I believe that um, the inability to allow business or the market to regulate business is a fundamental overreach in, on, in government's perspective, from my perspective that government is doing. I believe that all of the things that you're mentioning can be attained in, 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 even in terms of decreasing the environmental impact by not, you know, you don't have to shrink the industry in order to do that. There's, there's ways to do this. Um, I have a bill 996 that seeks to do the exact same thing, but, has an, but doesn't shrink the industry, or at least allows businesses to be able to negotiate their contracts, creates a business environment that's conducive to growth and development in business, but still has an environmental, you know, regulates the environmental impact by giving BIC the ability to do its job or what it was formulated to do. I, I don't understand when we look at other places, like California, for example, which actually had to offer an apology based on the escalated amounts uh, of fines and fee of fees that went into, into business. I, I don't understand why we would go down a pathway that's already proven uh, to be counterproductive to business. Well, that's one of the reasons that we um, favor the non-exclusive system. Customers will have choice. Uh, we did an analysis that carding costs um, will be $14 million lower under a zone system. Uh, we, we, you know, this is based on actual data that we received from the carters. We took into account the fact that routes would be much more efficient, and even adding on to the fact that there'll be additional recycling collection, organics collection, they'll have to have a customer service hotline. Uh, the carding cost will still be $14 million less. So we don't have any expectation that pricing will be higher. And by having competition, uh, at least three carters in each zone, we fully expect that pricing will be equally as competitive, competitive as it is now, and you'll get much better service. And if there's a problem, you, be, you can contact the city who can directly address the issue if you're not getting it done with the carter. What, what's the difference between the zone carting plan in California and what your analysis is? Is there a stark difference? With DSNY's plan, yes, the Los Angeles system that you're referring to allows one carter in each zone. Our plan allows three to five carters per zone. Uh, that was largely driven through two years of engagement that we did with the business community, as well as considering impacts to the broader carding community and to the city's management. So there are a lot of different systems. It's not just LA that does uh, policies like this. We looked at what's been done across the board and what are the unique circumstances for New York to develop a New York specific plan. So are you offering a guarantee to businesses that if there is an increase that there'll be subsidies, that there'll be, because I can't imagine that if you go from the ability to negotiate contracts with any carter that you'd like to, to three, to, to one to three, that there wouldn't be an increase. You're gonna set the price ceiling, 
correct? There will be a rate cap, and that will be the maximum rate that a carter offers to charge will be a driving factor in whether or not they get a contract. So they will get points for their commitment for offering the lowest price. Beyond that, they will still have to shop around for market share. So Carter's gonna have to be competing twice on pricing and customer service if they wanna survive. And that will lead to low prices and good customer service. So do, do you not agree that competition is the driver of business and um, uh, consumer, customers benefit from the ability to pit uh, different companies against each other? So our plan acknowledges that and acknowledges that customer choice can lead to good customer service and good pricing. But our plan also acknowledges that the current system with 90 carters operating citywide leads to inefficiencies that hurt the environment, public safety, and make it impossible to operate a carting company efficiently. And I just so what, what, what about workers and shrinking the industry will actually eliminate jobs? And some of those jobs are for second chance workers, people who have ha found an opportunity to after having trying circumstances and challenging circumstances have found good gainful employment in this industry. And you're, if you go from 90 to three, you can't tell me that the industry won't shrink and that jobs will not be dissolved. So I'm, I'm gonna, and after you answer this question, I'm just gonna have to limit your okay. questioning, council member. So thank you for that question. Um, Sanitation studied the socioeconomic impacts of a commercial waste zone plan on the industry, and one of the things we looked at was the impact on jobs. Um, and the numbers that we found actually look quite good. Um, the vast majority of workers will still have jobs, and there will be minimal job losses. Um, additionally, because of investments in recycling and what we anticipate to be increased recycling um, and diversion rates, uh, we project additional job growth um, at recycling facilities in the city. That said, this is an issue that the administration takes very seriously, and sanitation will be proactive in addressing um, the situation of workers who find themselves potentially in this position. We will maintain, we will actively maintain a displaced workers list that allows workers to connect with jobs in the industry. Um, we will also put obligations on carters um, to take action in this in this area, uh, we anticipate riders in the agreements with the carters that selected that get selected um, to utilize programs um, to promote like local hiring, such as Hire NYC. Uh, I just want to thank the, the chair for indulging me. If there's a second round, I have more questions. Yeah, thank and I, I, I did want to just make a point um, that <clears throat> government has gotten involved in the business environment um, in the past. They did it when Wall Street got out of hand. It added an eight-hour workday. It added a minimum wage. Is places where government thought it should involve itself when it thought that businesses were acting egregiously. Um, and that's what I think we're intending to do here. While I agree that a, a market that is open is something that we want to promote when it's working. In this case, you know, we don't want any, no, any more vigils for the Mark Tur Diallos of the world. And like, that's what we're trying to reform here. And I just want to make sure that I note that. Uh, Councilmember Chaim Deutsch. And there will be a second round, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Vallone and then Councilmember Deutsch. Councilmember Vallone. Thank you, Chair. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot of questions from the council members, and you see there. Is your mic uh, on, Councilmember It's on. It's All right, on. sorry. Uh, after our fireworks event last night and having a good time, we're, we're trying to get through today. The concerns have not gone away. The benefits are clear. We're trying to do environmental, we're trying to minimize impact to communities. Mine, which is always forgotten in this conversation, which gets my district very upset with waste transfer stations and continuous commercial truck traffic through residential neighborhoods is a pillage on any neighborhood, not just the ones that we tend to focus on. So minimizing that impact to the communities is a positive in the conversation Upgrading the industry is a positive in the conversation. Safety standards across the board is a positive. Newer trucks and better environmental footprints, always a positive. The other side gets lost against the positive, which is the hardworking local companies that have been doing this, whether they're family owned or generational owned, um, the businesses themselves, I have a very diverse district from Korean, Chinese, Italian, Greek, you name it, 
they're there, the language barriers, if they're going to be dependent on negotiating a contract with one to three carters without language interpretation, translation, and your exact testimony was you're expecting carters to explain that to them, that's not going to happen. I want to hear how, what was the determination of what small businesses are being charged now versus what you feel will be charged after this? So we looked at operating costs to the industry as a whole rather than predicting how the bidding process and then customer negotiation within the zone would happen. We can't predict that, but we know that operating costs to the industry will decrease. So there's no reason that this plan will make Carter's charge more to, to make their bottom well, line. You just and said two things. One, you can't determine the first part of it. And two, because the operating costs are going to go down, that there should be savings. That's not any guarantees for, the, for the, those who are making the contracts of there's no way to determine, one, and two, because there's going to be savings, you think they're going to be passed on to the businesses. I, so I, the, way, the, the way that we encourage it to be passed on is we, use, we make these uh, RFPs and these zones very competitive. Uh, we have pricing, low pricing, as the highest criteria in scoring. So if you want a contract, you have to offer a low maximum price. That is a contractual guarantee that you will not charge a single customer, even the most difficult customer in a zone from a Carter's perspective, beyond this rate. Beyond that, and, if they, and once if they you want make market that, share. Once you make that determination of what that contract's going to be, how can we determine from what their current contract is today versus what that new contract's going to be, the difference in that gap? Is there a limitation as to what that will be? Not the cap on the max, but if I'm paying $100 today and under the new system I'm going to pay $250 tomorrow, and that's okay because it's under the cap, you're going to wipe out small business. I, I, I don't have the conversation of small business do not have an overhead to pay another dollar, period. They don't. So as we've discussed earlier in this testimony, uh, small businesses often pay a higher rate than larger businesses. They're the ones that don't have the transparency. Um, our program, beyond having uh, competitive pricing in the bidding and having shopping around uh, to get market share, um, DSNY is committed to broad outreach in encouraging uh, during the transition, customers to shop around, get a competitive price, and we're going to have yeah, harder. Chair, on that last note, but you're, you're encouraging to shop around when we're limiting their choices from one to three. So there's, there are still numerous concerns. You can be frustrated all you want. We're more frustrated. You're talking about impacting the entire city and communities like mine that are, are, are just pillaged with trucks coming through it, and it's the number one call on the quality of life impact and I don't hear how that's going to be solved, and I also don't hear how my small business is going to be protected, and how we're going to bring those companies that want to achieve this now, that are set by a standard that is done well by the middle and the larger companies that want to make that new change to get to the RFP on what we're going to do to help those, not the ones that Vic has got concerns with, we agree, we need to make those changes, but the ones that are going to try to get to the next level to meet these RFP requirements, what we're going to do to get them there, bring them to the safety standards, bring them to a new job workforce place that's safe, that can follow the leaders of some of the, the groups that are already here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I'm sorry, just I wanted to clarify. I wanted to, uh, you're saying, so can we get back to the one where all the 25 carters on six blocks and, and can map? Because we respond to his last. Yeah, because Council of Valone's district is also one of those districts that are. So are impacted by truck traffic, and can you explain how that that reduction? I think is that what you're asking? Like, how how are we guaranteeing that reduction? And Councilor Valone, this is a five different snapshots of maps of the amount of carters that run through six blocks in one district. I think it's less like eight blocks in another, and it just shows the amount of carter the trucks that go through those, the uh, not the trucks, the carting companies that go through those. Areas. This so we, is we have 11 unique. customers on 24th Street in Brooklyn have nine different carters. So, so, Mr. Chair, we have a unique situation in College Point. So, where you have the waste transfer stations and the loading zones. So, you have the traffic coming through there to make their drop offs. 
and we're still determining whether the new routes are now going to increase the capacity at those waste transfer stations or how those routes are going to be determined. So we're still concerned about so that. So I, I want to make it clear that yeah. a hallmark of our plan is truck traffic reduction, and this is citywide. Every neighborhood in every borough of the city will see a reduction in truck traffic. This is not one neighborhood benefiting at the expense of the other. Your neighborhood, your district will see a reduction in truck traffic. But he, I think what he's talking about is he has waste transfer stations. So and what, what, in our EIS, what? we looked at three cases studies. One of those case studies was College Point, and it had the transfer station in there. It sees a reduction in truck traffic. And can you give that to Councilmember Vallone, that information, per after the hearing? Yeah, not, not offhand, but yes, I can follow up with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Hein Deutsch? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Our EIS uh, showed that the vehicle miles traveled reduction in College Point would actually be 60 percent, so it's slightly higher than the city average. And also, you, you, I just wanted to emphasize the safety. You, you, you mentioned safety, and that's something that we take very seriously. That's one of the main goals of this bill. We know there are unsafe practices now. Uh, this bill would help ensure the safety of the drivers and the public. There would be 18 million miles saved, so you're going to have fewer crashes. Uh, we will be able to enforce, through contractual remedies, uh, labor issues or uh, wage issues, and so. Uh, but we, we can ra but we can raise the safety standards without creating zones. So, I mean, they're two different things. We can always raise the standards of any industry, but we don't need to change. Well, well to but do that. here we're going to have a direct contract with the carters, so we'll be able to manage that very directly uh, and better able to assess that. We, we also, you. you know, during our very extensive public outreach program, um, heard directly from workers and their representatives who came to our hearings. Um, and our events to speak up um, and shed some light on what's going on now currently in the industry. Um, and what we learned, um, if you go back to one of the, the atypical route, um, what that means from a worker standpoint is a worker might be expected to, to um, be on a route that traverses 100 miles through multiple boroughs on a 14-hour shift. Um, what we heard um, in our public engagement process and what we, what we learned from studying the industry is that companies are cutting corners at the expense of workers. Um, and so by making the system more efficient and having shorter, more efficient routes, uh, that, that, And that's how I started my test. That's without question. I, I, we didn't, no one's questioning that that needs to be better and no stand, immediate, we're all on board with that. No one's questioning any of that. It's, and, it's the other side of that impact that the chair is trying to flush out and we're trying to get the, the safety standards and the proper future of the condition of the trucks, the workers' rights, getting companies to follow the lead of proper organizations and companies that have been doing it already to give that a footprint, are all laudable, and then we thank the chair for having that conversation to get that done, finally. It's the other part of the conversation that you're hearing the council members of the impact on the small businesses, the neighborhoods, f free market, and government's place in all of that is still what we question. And then, so, because we're going to move on to Council Member Deutsch, I just want to say um, this is the first time I've heard that there should be, that they, this could, we should actually be saving money. The Carter should be saving money through this process. So this is the first time I'm hearing that. I've never made a commitment to council members or to anyone in the public in stating that this would save money. Um, I actually, um, actually think there's a price to pay for the environment, and I'm okay with that. Uh, we have did that with a buildings bill where we just said 25% of the worst actors in the city of New York are going to get uh, fined if they don't bring their buildings um, to a smaller carbon footprint. So I understand the value in making sure that we take care of our environment. But you're saying that the operating costs should decrease. And I wanted to ask very intently, um, would you accept an RFP that doesn't speak to, the, to, to your understanding about those reductions? that you wholeheartedly believe and have data and information that says your operating costs should decrease, why would you come in with an RFP that is more expensive than the work that's currently being done? Can we, can we speak to that? Yes, well, under the RFP process, pricing will be the largest factor that's considered in determining which contractor, which carters get the zone. So if a carter comes in with an extremely high price, uh, there, it is highly, highly unlikely that that carter would be selected to uh, perform work in any specific zone. Uh, there are other factors involved, but we understand pricing is critical. Uh, that's why we did the socioeconomic analysis to, to evaluate 
uh, what the overall carding cost would be after the zone program is included, and we are very uh, understanding that small businesses don't want to see huge increases in prices, even if the program is safer and it's better for everybody in New York City. Uh, mm -hmm. So pricing will be the largest factor that is considered. And but this uh, is but this is big for me because I'm the one pushing this, and I care about this intently to pitch this to other council members. Operating costs by the carters should decrease. That's correct, and that's in the, the, the draft environmental impact statement. So the environmental impact statement says that operating costs should decrease. That's Can correct. I safely then make a statement and say that because of that operating costs decreasing, that prices should, for the most part, stay the same or decrease? Think, yeah, I think I'll give you time to, to, to answer that because that, be that would be something that the businesses here would really appreciate. So doing the RFP process right, that's what we should get to. There are going to be some instances where you have carters cutting corners currently, and we talked about sanitation salvage and what we saw from their pricing. If you have a low bill and it's because carters aren't doing any recycling or because they're not paying their workers properly, we can't guarantee that your bills won't go up. So if you're not a good actor now and that's how you can offer low pricing, the customers might have uh, increased price, but you know that happened when Sanitation Salvage had their uh, license denied. Uh, I'm hearing that might be happening with Flag currently. So it's that's why we can't guarantee it. But if we do everything properly with the RFP process, there's no reason prices should go up across the board. We are holding them to competitive prices, and they should be able to be at current prices or lower. All right. So this is important, especially for. Uh, Councilmember Corney and Councilmember Jonah, Jonah, who really deeply are concerned about the businesses, increasing cost of businesses, that you're saying outside of the sanitation salvages of the world, who did everything possible, like cut every corner, paying $80 for 14 hours of work for their helpers, uh, had the oldest trucks, were not even paying uh, minimum wage to a lot of these folks, uh, issues with uh, safety and across the board. Those guys were charging the least amount because they, did, they cut every corner that was ima imaginable. We don't want those people doing business in the city, but if operating costs for carters across the board should be reduced, you're not expecting uh, a significant increase or an increase at all um, on average across the board in the city of New York. That would, that would be, that's one of the, the strongest talking points that exists in the city council right now is we want to limit the cost of businesses. And what you're saying, for the first time I'm hearing, even though it's been in the report, is that there is a reduction in operating costs for carters. Okay, so I just wanted to make that statement. That's, thank you very much for that. Just another, another, another bullet in the belt, I guess, is what you want to call it for when I have to advocate for this. Uh, Councilmember Heimdeutsch. Yeah, thank you, Sorry Chair. Sorry for making a reference uh, using guns. I shouldn't have done that, so I apologize. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to mention that I am an extremely strong supporter of sanitation and uh, the work that the men and women of the sanitation department do. But I have uh, many concerns uh, with this bill, and I can I not possibly get it into three minutes. Um, I did speak to the chair, and I, I met yesterday with one of my uh, business improvement districts in my district, and I surely hope that we're going to have a lot more conversations about this before this bill goes into effect, because otherwise you're going to hear members speak out about this. Um, now, how confident are you that if this bill should pass, that this plan would work? So I, I want to make a distinction between our plan and this bill. Um, they're not the exact same thing, but talk, we're just going to talk about our plan. We are confident that our plan will work. This has been four years of planning. It has been years of stakeholder engagement hundreds of meetings with hundreds of stakeholders, including opponents, supporters, people we're doing, people that think we're doing too much, people that think we're not doing enough, customers of all types, property owners, down to small businesses and business improvement districts. So we have heard those concerns and we've created a plan that will get all of the benefits we want to see to the public while working for carters and working for customers. Okay, you did mention that uh, there's going to be job loss um, and um, so what are your plan in regards, in regards to job loss, and what is your plan 
in response to small business owners, uh, not only employees, but those small business owners that worked very hard or had a business for the last 20, 30, 40, or 50 years, and you may put them out of business. So on, on the last point, we have created a plan that does not bias the selection process for small local companies. If you are a good small local company, in our plan you have uh, just as much chance uh, of getting a zone if you put a competitive bid forward than a multinational company. Um, so this is a fair playing field for local industry. You have to, you have to commit to high standards, that's what we want. So if you have 800 carding, uh, private carding companies now, and let's say many of them, if let's say you get more than half that commit to high standards and go with the bids, uh, and they put in their competitor price and everything looks okay, are they guaranteed to get one of those zones? So we will be releasing the RFP, and that will state publicly and for everyone that wants to uh, submit a proposal, this is how we're gonna score um, this is the process to determine who is best fit. So whoever's not, whoever's, so wh whoever reaches that standard, it's who is best standards fit. standards and committing to good service and good pricing. That's who will win the zone. So if you have 400 of those private uh, carding companies that just, meet just those standards. Quick correction, it's, it's 90 companies that exist now. Okay, so if you, ha if you have the majority of that that meet those standards, um, I'm sorry, I said 800. Uh, I thought it was 80. Uh, if you have a majority of those companies that meet that standard, is it possible that some of those companies will not um, get that RFP? Yeah, the, any company that submits a proposal that's not as good as the top three to five won't be winning a contract for that zone. That does not necessarily mean they're out of business. This is regulating one part of the waste industry. Um, there are many other streams like construction and demolition, uh, other types of hauling that companies today doing the type of collections that we're regulating currently also have business doing those operations. That won't change. Um, we have uh, allowances for subcontracting when it works for our program goals. So if you're a subcontractor to pick up recycling and you're meeting the high standards of the prime contract holder, um, that's okay. And that is an opportunity. So we've designed this plan uh, to give many opportunities to all companies that can meet our high standards. Now would this so be- So I'm gonna ask for Council Member Deutsch to ask one more question and that we, he gets to answer that. Then Council Member Jonah is gonna ask one more question and you answer that. We have 13 panels. 13 right. panels, and we're supposed to finish by one o'clock. That is Not that happening. is as hard as doing a 1,000 person, uh, 1,000 company route. It's impossible. So, so we're gonna we're gonna ask the council members to wrap up, and then we're gonna move through two minute testimonies um, and allow everyone to speak. Your input and your statements are more important than the back and forth. So we're gonna allow you to speak and keep it moving. All right. So, uh, council member Deutsch, your last question, followed by council member Jonai. So um, if, uh, if, you, if you should, if sanitation should implement uh, their plan, how would you implement it throughout the city, the five boroughs? Uh, so after a law passed enabling us to do this plan, we would put out an RFP for all 20 zones. So you do all 20 zones, which would cover the entire city? That's right. When, uh, when you implement- Thank you, Council Member Deutsch. Oh, I'm so I sorry, Council Member Deutsch. I, I asked one question. I asked you to do one question. Yeah, I we understand have, that. We have, yeah, limited we have limited time, and we're trying to give everybody a lot yeah, of- I just, I just, Let me just finish my I'm thought with this. One more question. I'm gonna ask Jonai to go, and then you're gonna have this second round, and you ask one more question. So Council Member Jonai first, then I'm gonna come back to you to ask one more question. But we really have to limit the time so that allow for everyone in this room to speak. So Council Member Jonai. Thank you, Chair. I just want to reiterate the arguments that are made on the reduction of operating costs. And let's apply that to, let's say, the pharmaceutical business, where we have Walgreens, CVS, and Dwayne Reed that control the, f the majority of the pharmacies in this city. Our prices of medication still continue to go up, and they control the market share. So although their operating costs have gone down, prices have still gone up. But I want to get to the real issues here. If we truly want to address the environmental impact, we want to talk about worker safety, we want to talk about proper employee compensation, efficiency, servicing, and pricing to the small businesses, recycling compliance, and the best fit scenario, why don't we get rid of the commercial carding industry 
all together. And let's give it to the Department of Sanitation. There'll be no additional charges on our small businesses. And according to the standard, we won't have an issue. But there'll be no appetite for that because nobody wants that. Right? Councilman Jordan, can you which ask I'm making, I got my ask minute, question. right? No, no, which I makes, ask a minute. I said one which, question. Which leads me to my, my point. This has all been set up to determine who is going to be the carding industries that are going to service New York City. Because if there was a true appetite, we would be coming up with more creative ways to address all of those issues. But that is not the issue. That is the, the fog that we've created in making sure that we get rid of commercial carding companies that have been operating for generations and years. And what government is going to put their finger on a scale to determine who is going to prevail and survive and let everyone else fall by the wayside. That's the real issue, and I'm glad I said it on record. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Jornai. Please remember the, the waves. Council Member, so now we've been joined by two Council Members. Um, we're supposed to finish in an hour, and we have 13 panels. I'm going to keep saying that to, to encourage council members to cut it short. But we have council member uh, Deutsch, followed by council member Powers. Are you going to ask questions, council member Powers? And, and, all right, so, and council member Cohen. So I'm Deutsch, gonna, I'm going to get to my last question, question for now. Um, so if, if you're going to go with the RFP for the entire 20 zones, um, how would you determine if, it's, if, it become, if it turns out to be a disaster? how would you go back? Like when you, um, when sanitation came out with the organics collection, it was a pilot program that started off in a smaller scale and to see how it works and then you uh, expanded it uh, throughout the city. So how would you, how would We're you gonna put it? the RFP for all 20 zones out at the same time, but that will lead to um, the industry bidding on all the zones at the same time, but the actual rollout will be uh, phased in over uh, at least two years, um, starting with smaller pockets of the city to make sure we do this slowly and thoughtfully and carefully um, so there are not effects to the customers. Do you have, do you have the plan of the rollout? Uh, no, uh, apart from what I've said, it's going to be tiered. Um, it's not all going to be at once, and we're not going to rush it, um, but we do not have a detailed plan yet. But uh, the when, do the RFP when do you expect to get the detailed plan? So when we release the RFP at uh, the beginning of 2020, we should have um, a basic rollout plan as so well. So in other words, you're going to wait for the RFP to be put out in order to, right. then you're going Council to Council Deutsch, I really appreciate it, but you've asked uh, questions. When I said one, you've asked three. I get a lot of courtesy. Thank you very much. I want to allow for Council Member uh, Powers to go, followed by Council Member Cohen, followed by Council Member Brad Lander, for all these council members, we've been here for two hours and the, the agencies are still speaking. We have 13 panels that I'm supposed to complete in an hour. Just saying, would appreciate brevity. Thank you, council member Powers. Well, how can I follow that? I, um, uh, I'll just forego my questions. I just, I'm here just because I want to reiterate my support. I am ground zero, I believe, for, I have Midtown Manhattan and I am the place where I think when you talk about examples of how many private corridors are on any single block at any single time. You're normally talking about districts like mine, which have a tremendous amount of commercial activity. I actually do think we can do this right, where the small businesses that are impacted and the restaurants and the other small businesses in my district will be, will obviously have concerns around it. I think we can take this bill today and make it so that the small businesses can live and survive and, and be able to um, uh, uh, live under this regime. And it would just clear up so many more issues. So I just wanted to reiterate my I support, but I'll forego asking you guys questions out of respect for the time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Cohen. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just, I am sympathetic to the idea of the zones. Uh, one thing I guess, uh, you know, some people who have been uh, or more concerned have spoke to me about is, uh, one of the reasons I'm sympathetic is the, your testimony, Commissioner, that you predict that there will be a 50% reduction in the amount of traffic miles that these trucks I'd like to be certain of that. I wonder if at some point you could either make available the data, show us the models that, that, that produce that result so that we have confidence that, 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 that we're going to get the benefit of, uh, of this legislation. 
Absolutely, we'd plan. be happy to share the backup data uh, from our draft environmental impact statement to show you how we arrived at the 50% savings of vehicle miles traveled. It's in the DEIS, but we can even give you additional data. We're happy to meet with you if you'd like to. I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, that's 18 million mile reduction. Okay, that's uh, Council Member Lander. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of your bill, and I really want to thank you for the leadership that you have provided. It's great to be here with so many advocates who have been pushing hard for a better system. Uh, I want to thank the administration for the good study that you've done here to help us move forward on this critical issue. And I guess my question gets to, in your report, you know, you identified a lot of challenges. So I support moving to zones, and obviously the VMT reductions are enormous. You also identified um, something that we've stood with, you know, on the challenges for workers and their safety, the challenges for pedestrians and their safety, some of that, certainly pedestrian safety, addressed by less trucks driving around. But on issues of workers' uh, working conditions, quality of life, wages, and on issues of uh, broad sustainability and waste reductions, you also identify a lot of challenges in the commercial waste system and needs to get better. And I'd like to understand, you know, your theory of how this will do it. I mean, obviously, a concern about leaving competition even within zones is that the incentives of trying to go get the best possible price mean you cut corners on wages, mean you cut corners on safety, mean you cut corners on recycling and sustainability. And so um, part of how we're thinking about how to move forward here is how we elevate standards so they're good jobs, they're safe jobs, and we get as much recycling, waste reduction, um, and improvements in sustainability as possible. Um, and to me, that's the piece of it that we really have to figure out together in the, in the coming days. And I would just like to understand better how you think your proposal does that. Thank you for that question. I'm gonna speak to the worker safety and um, worker protection component, and then I'm gonna defer to um, Director Bland to talk about the sustainability portion, um, but if I left anything out, please let me know. Um, so again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. We are thrilled to, to voice the administration's support um, for this bill. Um, there's been a lot of work done by the people in this room, and today is a, a big day. Um, we are also thankful for the opportunity to talk about how we think this bill will, will benefit workers in some very concrete ways. We talked about um, the uh, reduction in unsafe driving and worker fatigue associated with shorter routes. I'm not going to um, speak more about that unless you have follow-up questions. That. From the standpoint of, of worker safety, um, what we learned in our public outreach efforts is that com some companies are not providing basic safety training to their workers. This, pu this puts the public um, at risk and it puts workers at risk. Um, and we believe that um, intro 1574 will address that. There will be a requirement that all carters provide worker safety training to their workers, including 40 hours of worker safety training to uh, workers who are on the road, such as drivers and helpers. Um, and we're, we're, th we're thrilled that that provision of the bill that we're discussing today includes a requirement that carters have a language access plan to make sure that that training is being provided in, in the language spoken by their workers so that it's, it's meaningful and accessible. Um, beyond that, you talked about um, wage theft and, and um, compliance with, with uh, worker protections and labor and employment laws, and I know the chair has already spoken to this issue. Um, this is something that the administration takes very seriously, um, and we believe that this plan will address that issue at multiple points in the process. So um, one of the benefits of an RFP process is that we're building on top of the licensing scheme that already exists where we can take a closer look at the companies that will be doing business and um, evaluate them based on their record. Um, as we learned from Sanitation Salvage, the choices a company makes and a company's record matters. And so we will be looking at the, the um, company's history of compliance with all applicable laws, including uh, wage and hour laws, minimum wage laws, et cetera. But we're gonna go further than that. Um, we're also gonna require a health and safety plan, which will become part of the binding agreements that the, cities, that the city enters into with the Carters and will be enforceable. Um, additionally, we think that um, 
it is essential that the carters that are selected be able to provide the service safely and efficiently, but also in a way that is legal. And so um, we're going to be asking for a staffing plan that will demonstrate that um, this service can be provided without cutting corners with workers, without violating applicable laws such as um, minimum wage laws and wage and hour laws, and we take that very seriously. And then finally, in terms of um, ongoing compliance, the agreements that the city enters into with the carters will have provisions requiring them to continue to comply with all applicable laws, and we will have contractual remedies to make sure that that happens. So that's all great. I guess I would like you to address the pay question as well. You know, this council just looked in the budget at this issue of pay parity across a lot of different categories, like should teachers in the classroom in our public schools be paid so much more than teachers in the classrooms in CBOs? And I guess I'd just like you to address that here. Obviously, we pay our public sanitation workers a really good living wage because it is a hard, dangerous, backbreaking job. And right now, we're paying our private sanitation workers so much less than that. Like, it makes the pay parity that we just addressed in the uh, daycare sector, I don't want to say look modest because that was bad too, but I mean, is that an issue? Like that's an issue that's on our minds as we're trying to figure out this bill. Um, and I'm not, you know, I think as we move forward here and I'll close out and then turn it back to the chair, we have to find a way to address that and, and we really want to work with you guys to do it. And that'll be the, and as a matter of equity, that'll be the last question that Council Member Lander would ask as we move forward. I'm turning to off the next my panel. microphone. Thank okay. you. So go ahead, ask, uh, answer that question and we'll move on from there. So on the issue of pay equity, um, we look forward to working with you um, to look at what we can do um, as the City of New York um, to address the issue and happy to follow up with you further, Council Member. I don't know if you want um, Director Blunt to talk about the sustainability uh, questions you asked or if we should move on. No, no, you could answer that. So in short, we're using all the tools we have to further our zero waste goals as well. So we want a robust zero waste plan in the RFP. All the proposals uh, will have a zero waste plan saying how you can process all these materials properly and go above and beyond to make additional commitments. That will get you a higher score when we're determining who gets contracts in which zone. Uh, beyond that, uh, there will be uh, in our contracts with the carters, they will have to offer all recycling services that customers currently have to do, and they will have to offer it at a discount. So customers will have transparent billing that incentivizes them to do the right thing. Thank, thank you for that, and I also want to uh, acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Chin. I uh, want to say we've been doing this for two hours, so anyone that just arrived, uh, and we want to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity to speak, and I'm trying to limit that, just let the record know that I was cutting off the pro and the anti folks. So it's, uh, it's been fair. And now we're gonna go through panels, through pro uh, and against, uh, or for and against. So thank you so much for your time. Um, please make yourselves available to any and all council members that want to meet with you hereafter. Um, and I'll be keeping track of any requests that are being made of me for you to meet with them so that we can make sure that they're as informed as possible. Thank you again for your statement. And, uh, uh, Council Member Chin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, uh, Council Member Chin, can you please do the best you can to be as limited Yes, as I just want to ask about rat mitigation. Okay. That if you doing this zone thing, have you considered uh, how to deal with the rats? You know, like garbage on the sidewalk. Are you mandating that they put out in containers? Uh, so that's my question. Uh, right now, the statute doesn't specifically address that. We are happy to discuss that with you. I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, if, if waste can be put in cans or in containers, that's the best way to deter rats. So uh, we are happy to consider that as we move forward with this bill. Thank you. And we'll look, and you, we'll look into that too. We're trying to do that on the public slide, by the way, uh, Council Member Chin, to move garbage to corners instead of allowing for people to put it right in front of their homes. And that'll be another fight for another day. Uh, but again, thank you so much for your testimony and appreciate your time. And now we're gonna call our first panel. And I'm just gonna put this out there. If you heard something that was stated by someone previously, you don't need to make the point again. That's the first thing. The second thing is all your testimony will be submitted, if you have it in writing, is submitted on the record. So if you feel you don't need to repeat or read your testimony word for word, take out the points 
that you think are most important and that you want to make. In some cases, reiterating points does make sense, so go ahead. But please, let's be as efficient as possible. Don't say the same thing three times. This is going to be, I want it to be meaningful, and I want to make sure that there's points that we didn't hit get hit. So the next panel is going to be Kevin Drew, Mary Cleaver, Sean Campbell, Rolando Guzman, and Ayad. I'll give by, I'm going to try this. I'll go Biali. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you, man. I'm so sorry. It's, we're gonna, they're going to kick us out for the broker's hearing. Thank you, and we're gonna go from right to left, and we're gonna put two minutes on the clock. And I, I wanna say, that's a generous two minutes. Remember, make a point um, and be as uh, concise as possible. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Ayad El Gabiela Yel, and I'm the Director of Advocacy at the Yemeni American Merchants Association, a grassroots nonprofit organization that was birthed from the hugely successful bodega strike in New York City and opposing the Muslim ban of uh, the Trump administration. Um, I'm here testifying on behalf of our 5,000 uh, small bodegas in uh, partnership with Align New York and other uh, allies for private hauling reform and in support of the zone system. Yemeni American uh, bodegas account uh, for thousand, uh, four thousands of small businesses throughout New York City. These bodegas support their, li their livelihood and current, uh, and current garbage hauling system has resulted in steep decrease in revenues for their uh, businesses. Our community has worked very hard to raise, uh, to raise the, themselves uh, to a comfortable standard of living, uh, living by following the law when it comes to the uh, proper disposal of their garbage and recycling, but it seems that the system has not been working in, the, in their favor. Our merchants are uh, constantly hit by their uh, by sanitation tickets left and right without education uh, educational uh, and proper resource it is um, it's as if they are uh, forced into a uh, position and are penalized when doing their best to follow the law without any re uh, repercussion uh, to the uh, to the parties hired um, to help them it's hard enough uh, owning a small business uh, in New York City today uh, with many of the competitions as stated before, um, and reforms like this make it easier and is needed. Uh, and we hope to work with you guys and all of you and our allies here to make it um, you know, better and uh, reform this uh, you know, if possible. Thank you for your testimony, and we really appreciate the work you do. You guys have really set the standard for uh, social justice advocacy by, by merchants and by business owners, so I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for your testimony. Councilmember Reno, so I'm testifying on behalf of Sean Campbell, the president of Teamsters Local 813. The Teamsters are the largest sanitation union in New York City, representing public and private sector sanitation workers. At institutions and companies, large and small, our members work on garbage trucks and transfer stations and in recycling facilities. I grew up in Red Hook, in NYCHA. A job in the private carding industry took me from the projects to owning my own home and sending my kids to college. But that was another era. Today, at many carding companies, a young person would be lucky to get paid minimum wage with almost no benefits. Forget about a pension. That is why we need the exclusive commercial waste zoning legislation proposed by Council Member Reynoso. 
We need one carter per zone because that is the only way to clean up this industry. With exclusive zones, there will be a stable customer base. Responsible employers will have predictable revenue and can invest in these jobs. They can commit to fair wages, good benefits, and safety programs. They can commit to all of those things without another carter who treats its workers like trash, offering to charge a dollar less per ton. I understand that big business likes the way things are now. The developers and their lobbyists have been fighting this bill from day one. The lobbyists for the other big corporations have been fighting this bill as well. These companies weren't complaining when the workers who picked up the trash were going home with broken arms, lacerations, or worse. None of them were standing with us after 21-year-old African immigrant was killed on the job, and it was covered up. But when these workers are just about to get their rights, the big corporations are all of a sudden concerned. They like the current system where workers get scraps, small businesses pay way more, and the corporations get the benefits. They want non-exclusive zones so that the bad carters can slip through the cracks and stay in the industry. I hope our council members will stand with these workers, the communities, the big businesses, and the environmentalists to pass this bill. Thank you. And um, as an aside, my name is Bernadette Kelly. I'm an international representative for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. I am the daughter of a sanitation worker who was a shop steward at Teamsters Local 831 of the Uniform Sanitation Men. And I can say that zoning works because my family thrived under zoning. He was a Department of Sanitation man, and I'm his daughter. Thank you. Thank you. It's now good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary Cleaver, and 38 years ago, I founded and have been running ever since Cleaver Co., a food business here in New York City, focused on serving high-quality food sourced largely from regional farms practicing regenerative agriculture. At Cleaver Co., we care deeply about where our food comes from and also about where it goes. I strongly support Councilmember Reynoso's bill to establish a commercial waste zone system in New York City for many reasons, but largely because it will help mitigate global warming, the greatest challenge upon us. The commercial waste zones bill would make our commercial waste system more energy and emissions efficient, as well as far safer for workers and for neighborhoods. In addition to making our streets safer and our air cleaner, this is an enormous opportunity to make our city's entire business sector more environmentally focused by expanding waste reduction services of recycling, composting, and food rescue to every customer. By selecting one private sanitation provider per district, we can hold that company accountable to high environmental and customer service standards. Businesses will no longer need to search for a company that will compost organics. Currently, composting services are limited and difficult to obtain, especially for small and independent businesses like Cleaverco. At all the commercial locations my business is operated in, I've had to research a waste provider willing to accept food waste for composting, I've had to negotiate over prices, and I've had to push to try to ensure that the price for compost isn't higher than the price for sending waste to a landfill. Business owners shouldn't have to make an extraordinary effort to obtain sensible, sustainable waste services. Affordable compost and recycling services should be available to every and all New York City businesses that need them, and pricing and service should be transparent and trustworthy. Intro 574 would do just this. The bill requires selected waste haulers to provide organics and recycling service to every customer who wants them and gives haulers strong incentives to improve the facilities and trucks needed to scale up and make these services affordable. With more composting of organics, we can turn food waste into topsoil to grow food rather than sending it to the landfill to emit methane and increase global warming. On behalf of thousands of entrepreneurs and business owners across our city who care deeply about our environmental footprint, our impact on climate change, and our shared future, I urge the City Council to follow other cities like San Francisco, Seattle, and Los Angeles, pass Thank this you. bill, and effect positive change. In Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Councilors. My name is Kevin Drew. I'm with the City of San Francisco. I'm the Residential uh, Zero Waste Senior Coordinator. I've been in that position for 18 years. Uh, and a prior to that, I was running uh, recycling programs in the City of San Francisco for about 12 years, so I have over 30 years' experience. Uh, San Francisco has used a, an exclusive uh, collection system to reach an over 80% uh, reutilization of the materials in our, that come into our city. Uh, 
This creates a local circular economy that continues to improve efficiency uh, more and better, creates more and better jobs, and can reinvigorate the environment by putting those materials back into the, into the natural systems. Uh, we have a deep, a deep understanding of the complexities uh, and the controversy that accompany exclusive arrangement. Uh, we are ready and willing to share our experience and lessons learned uh, with uh, the city of San, with, excuse me, with the city of New York. Uh, and we can are. I, I'm sorry. One second. Can I get a pause on the clock on this one? So this is a, uh, an example of way zoning in San Francisco, and there's been a lot of conversations about someone, another city and that has done it. So I want to give you the time sure. to be able to really speak to your experience because I think that, it, it, that um, even though all testimonies are significant, this is one perspective that we really haven't heard yet. So please uh, continue. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, I want to say that what, as I just mentioned, we are uh, ready to help in any way that we can, both here today and, 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 and after this meeting. I'm happy to talk with other uh, uh, counselors and with city staff. Uh, as well, I'll be around tomorrow, and we're obviously available by electronically in whatever way necessary to address specific questions. Some of the questions that the counselors had earlier today are ones that I would talk about. Uh, for instance, the uh, the question uh, came up around uh, comparison, the rate comparison. Our rates are comparable comparable with other Bay Area cities. Uh, and as well, in terms of working with small businesses, we spend a lot of time working with the small business community. I understand that you've done that kind of work, but that work is never uh, unnecessary or you can't do too much of it. Uh, maintaining the service level is key and maintaining the rates is key. We are, I am a member of our rate review committee in, in San Francisco. We are overseeing the exclusive franchise arrangement very carefully. Uh, we have excellent customer service uh, that is Recology is the service provider in our case. Uh, one of my particular jobs is to uh, see that any complaints that come up are addressed by Recology or by the city in terms of maintaining the rates or maintaining the services uh, that are agreed upon in the, uh, the, uh, our agreement, our, our service agreement. So I wanted to assure folks that there is a way to address the concerns, whether it's customer service, uh, competitive prices, uh, maintenance of the system. Like one key thing is that there is a cost to putting a good system into place. Uh, it, it, is, it is not inexpensive, but it does not have to break the bank. And as I see the amount of savings that you're uh, calculating, Reinvesting that into the system to create a good infrastructure uh, and a good a, a, a competitive system, but also a system that's overseen by uh, by Department of Sanitation and the BIC. Uh, that is, I think, that's very doable, and we were happy to show you how we do it in San Francisco, uh, and or to come here and help work with you to make that transition. I think, um, yeah, just summarizing. Uh, uh, the opportunity for New York City to lead the way in terms of creating a commercial system that really gets at its uh, recovery of the resources that are available in this city is just gigantic in terms of a global leadership, in terms of uh, what we have to do on the planet to, to solve the problem of, cli of uh, climate crisis. We, are, we have invented some things in San Francisco or discovered some things in San Francisco that I think are very replicable in other cities. And we, are, we really uh, trust on other cities' abilities to take that leap and go to the same place we're going and make that happen. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Rolando? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rolando Guzman, and I'm here uh, testifying on behalf of uh, Outrage, Organizations United for Trash Reduction and Garbage Equity. We are an environmental justice organization in North Brooklyn, and I just uh, want to summarize. Uh, I think we all know that North Brooklyn, along with South Bronx and sections of Queens, we have to deal with uh, pretty much all New York City garbage. We have, to, we have the concentration of waste transfer stations and also garages for discarding companies. Uh, we have the highest, one of the highest rates of asthma in the entire city, and uh, we believe that that is environmental racism. Uh, these are communities of low-income communities of color. Uh, we think that the city is doing steps in the right direction. We are happy that the um, waste equity bill passed last year. Uh, and we believe this is another step in the right direction. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, we think that the uh, commercial waste zoning is uh, a great tool that is going to bring equity as well. 
One thing, though, that we are concerned, and I think um, uh, we hope that it's going to be addressed in this legislation, is about the air quality. Uh, we have a lot of those trucks uh, parked in our community, and they are going to be, even though that they're not gonna pick up garbage within North Brooklyn, they're going to be coming and going from our community. So one thing that we want to stress is the need that this new fleet of commercial waste trucks, they have to be close as possible to zero emissions. Uh, they have the technology, there's a technology available, and uh, it's an, invest uh, an investment that these companies should be doing because we need air quality, especially in North Brooklyn. I thank you so much, uh, Council Member Reynoso, for your leadership on this issue. Thank you, I appreciate it. I know that um, even though there's been a significant reduction in the amount of uh, pollution that like, for example, the white DSNY trucks do, we've fallen short in the commercial vehicle side, and we actually think DSNY could do more. So we're, we're conscious of that. I know it's not in the plan right now, but we'll definitely be paying attention to that. I want to thank this entire panel for uh, your testimony, um, and we will be reaching out to each and every one of you if we need more assistance. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, our next panel, uh, Steve Changaris from uh, NWRA, uh, Zach Steinberg from the Rebney, um, Kendall Christensen from uh, NYRWM, uh, Adam Mitchell from Mr. T. Carding, and the New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management on NYWARM, Isaac Jordan. And, and I know folks expected to be gone by one o'clock and they have other engagements and other uh, commitments, but unfortunately it's been, it's gonna be very difficult for us to accommodate, you know, requests to, to testify early. Um, we are down to 11 panels, I guess is what I'm saying. So thank you. Um, I wanna start from, well, we let Kendall go first. Kendall, you wanna start on your side, on the right side? Thank you, Mr. Christians. Uh, give me a second to pull out my chest. Then let's start from the other side then. Let's start from uh, left to right, so go ahead. Hello, my name is Adam Mitchell. I took a vacation today, today to come and share my views on your legislative proposal. I split the last 30 years between New York City and Boston uh, in both ownership roles and employee uh, in the commercial waste industry. Uh, formerly a member of the Queen Saw Waste Advisory Board, consultant to DSNY in the 90s. I was even a, a lecturer at NYU on waste and recycling and a member of Mayor Dinkins' Blue Ribbon Committee on Market Development. Today I manage a sales team of eight people at Mr. T. Carding, a 70-year-old independent locally owned company based in Brooklyn and Queens. Why does this proposal to create exclusive monopoly zones concern me? Three different ways. First, the customer's perspective. There's nothing more frustrating for a business owner than not being able to choose their vendors. And locking in one vendor to five vendors for 10, 15 years will produce immense outcry from your constituents in the business community. Number two, waste reduction goals. There have been mandatory recycling regulations on the books here in New York City for years, since the 90s. But they're so lightly enforced by DSNY, it's as if they don't exist. For the underinformed. The propaganda espoused by folks like Justin Woods from New York Lawyers for Public Interest would make it seem that it's the commercial waste industry's fault that more recycling isn't happening in New York City, and that's a blatant lie. At my company last year, we recycled and composted 36% of the material that our customers set out for recycling. And we want to do more, but we need a willing enforcement partner. And without adequate funding for DSNY, the City Council and the mayor's office is just gonna kick enforcement can down the road. Number three, economic perspective. The root of this proposal amazes me. It it's, amazes me that it's being promoted in a progressive city like ours. If you vote for this proposal or the hybrid proposal we'll see shortly, you'll expedite the expropriation of capital by government without compensation. To quote Elizabeth Warren, there is way too much consolidation now in giant industries in this country. It hurts workers, it hurts independent locally owned businesses, it hurts our economy overall, and it helps constrict real innovation and growth in this economy. I think your proposal is a wolf in sheep's clothing. 
It's a giveaway that's greater than the Amazon deal that many of you re rejected. Please, I urge you to vote no on this proposal. Thank you for your assessment. I'm, I'm going to call Elizabeth Warren and see where she stands on this issue. <laughs> and see, see whose side she'll be on. Uh, but thank you. Uh, thank smart. you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Steve Changaris. I'm with the National Waste and Recycling Association. I submitted some copies of the testimony, mostly on the bills that no one's discussed about today that's on your agenda. I just want to real quickly say that if, if those bills were passed or worked on, we, we, don't, we, we endorse some of the concepts, we like some of the bills, but a lot of the work that if you did on those bills and improve them, you would drive um, the, the, the trade waste practices in the city tremendously close to where you want to be. But uh, because everyone's on uh, the, the 1574 bill today uh, at, with the with the waste zones. Uh, I just want to remind the committee that um, the uh, chapter's formal position on the on the creation of the new commercial zo uh, zones has already been made known. We would prefer the city to focus on improving the current trade waste collection system instead of creating a completely new governmentally governmentally mandated uh, zone collection system. Um, but that said, uh, and notwithstanding if all the other measures were put into place, if, you do, if, the, if the choice of the city and in the, in the intergovernmental process is to continue to go down the path of the, the zone collection system, um, the, the idea is uh, we don't believe that, um, you know, we, we, the one uh, hauler per zone is the preferred view for this time. Uh, the, 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 we don't believe third-party audits will be necessary. Um, if they are required, it will create a whole new unnecessary cottage industry and uh, related expenses uh, that will be paid by the city businesses who are our customers. Um, and also, um, if an, ex an exclusive zone system is adopted, there will be no need for the traditional rate cap controls in place today. Um, th that's going to be the case since, the, as it's been said before, the new trade waste rates and the services mandated are, uh, to the city businesses will be based on the material volume charges created through the private sector zone competition process and will be accepted only after full city review uh, of the, uh, an, ex an exclusive zone contract award procedures establishing that they are most appropriate rates to be charged under the new system. We look forward to continue to working with you and you know, uh, we're going to stay involved uh, through the end of this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, do you want to? We're going to go back to the left side, so you can, you can test. Hi, my name is Isaac Jordan. I am New Yorkers responsible for waste management. I'm going to make mine very short and to the point. It's basically just uh, standing for the ba basic New Yorker workers who are the owners of uh, uh, carding companies that are generations of uh, companies that have been here in New York that are small business owners and these small business owners are going to be swallowed up and they are going to be not able to employ um, workers. Workers are going to lose jobs. Jobs will be lost if there are only two uh, companies controlling the um, waste management in the city. And it would be just like Wall Street uh, losing jobs that will leave and never come back. We will not see these jobs come back uh, for those people that lose their jobs, <clears throat> especially in uh, minority neighborhoods, which are, will be affected and impacted uh, by this decision. So um, New York is about the small businesses and this will be affected by those businesses that are owned and have made New York what it is today. New York is about the business owners that have been here for generations and for two companies to just run uh, the waste management in New York would create chaos for the businesses that have been here for generations and employ people that are in those neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I want to speak from the perspective of the large commercial properties who make up uh, Rebney's membership. Um, receiving the highest quality waste removal services is of paramount importance to large commercial property owners. 
In these large buildings, effectively managing trash and recycling requires hard work and careful coordination from the time a cleaning staff starts working at 6 p.m. to the time that a truck arrives in the loading dock to remove the waste, which is often between 2 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Successfully completing this operation is essential so that tenants conduct their daily commerce in a pleasant environment, companies can meet their environmental stewardship and waste diversion goals, and communities can remain desirable places to live, work, and visit. This is why we are uh, deeply concerned about the impact of intro 1574. Under this proposal, if an authorized carding company were to fall short of its responsibilities, New York City businesses would have no ability to change companies in order to have their garbage and recycling collected in a timely, reliable manner. Competition in this mean does not just mean through an RFP process, but it means the ability of a business to terminate a contract and choose a different vendor with whom to work. Without the flexibility to change carters, owners would have limited ability to receive customized service to meet their unique needs. Indeed, it would take only one missed pickup or a slight erosion in service for a building to smell, trash to spill on the street, and quality of life to erode. Large commercial offices are very different than, small, than the small businesses who put trash out each night on the street and have it picked up in, by, by a, a truck. For particularly large commercial properties that utilize compactors and other containers to manage their waste, these trucks who service these buildings go from the building to the transfer station with no intervening stops. Any regulatory system imposed upon these owners offers no environmental benefits in the form of reduction of vehicle miles traveled. There, all it does is risk constraining the ability of those businesses to obtain high quality service. And these are the businesses who produce the most waste in the city. On this basis, we hope that you will uh, see that any reform proposal will preserve the ability of these properties to obtain services from as many qualified companies as possible. Thank you. And just, uh, just for a heads up, the concern that you have related to the one truck coming in, one truck coming out, um, if a net neutral environmentally is something that we're looking into with the Department of Sanitation, so I just want you to know it's something that we are paying attention to um, in relation to, to your concern. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilman, uh, so, uh, Councilman, I'm going to let uh, Christensen speak, and then you can speak to the entire panel. So, uh, Kendall, you make your testimony, and then Councilman Rodeuch for questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did submit uh, testimony, hopefully you have it. Um, any resemblance to monopoly cards is intentional. Um, so um, I'm not gonna summarize it uh, by any stretch. I thought it would make it easier for you to sort of flip through and see that uh, there's a section about uh, understanding the commercial waste system as it currently exists. There's five pages on understanding what's happened in LA, including the recent increase in illegal dumping in downtown LA that's attributed to Recycle LA. Uh, there's a page on the DSNY near monopoly plan, uh, high risk, low reward. Uh, there's a page, Mr. Chairman, on what happens when you use a stick to regulate um, and how you can get it wrong and uh, cause a lot of damage. And then there's a page on uh, intro 990, uh, 996 uh, being a better choice to sooner, better, cheaper achieve the, uh, the various goals that have been uh, discussed today. But what I want to begin uh, with an anecdote that's on page two. Uh, I happened, uh, because of term limits, none of you were here, but I happened to be in the back of the chamber in 1996 when the Trade Waste Act was adopted. And I had been working for a local company that had been acquired by one of the large national companies and met their uh, lobbyist uh, in the back, uh, in that hallway. And I posed the question, uh, what's their projection for the industry then, five years from that point? And his answer uh, verbatim was, quote, three companies left standing and prices through the roof, unquote. Uh, that didn't happen. The local industry uh, rallied to the uh, changes in the, uh, the law and the, uh, how the industry was uh, structured and uh, met the requirements of creating a uh, competitive uh, industry with a fair choice for customers and the like. Four national companies have tried to operate in New York and have given up uh, because the local companies do it better and that's who I'm uh, here to represent uh, today on behalf of the New Yorkers for Responsible Waste Management, which is a consortium of about 25 locally owned and operated waste and recycling service companies, uh, most of them with multi-generational service to the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kendall. Council Member Deutsch for questions. Thank you. Uh, I just have a, it's a yes and no, or no answer. Did, uh, what conversations did any of you have uh, prior to to today in regards to intro 5070, 1574 with your concerns uh, with this committee uh, or with sanitation department or any other New York City entity? 
Uh, I'll respond to that, Jen. Yeah, okay. um, so uh, uh, I, be, I participated in the DSNY advisory board. Uh, I would say that uh, there was never any vote taken at that advisory board, about 35 people, to either endorse the DSNY plan or the uh, 1574 that's before uh, the committee today. Uh, the one zone plan was never really uh, the one. The monopoly zone plan was never really discussed in that advisory board process. Uh, I have met with some of you individually as members, uh, but we've not really had a full sit down uh, with the chairman or staff and would welcome the opportunity to do that. Thank you. And I just want to get an answer from everyone. Reach. I'm very similar to Kendall. Kendall, we participated in, in the zone advisory board meetings. We've been before Chairman Reynoso. We've been active with the BIC, and th this issue has always been in the ether and every place we go because this is again i made a, a general comment to my members in preparing testimony there and i mentioned it earlier the bills on the agenda are the ascent essence to make this industry better in this state in this city uh, as opposed to the zone collection the elements of those bills on your agenda today are going to be the elements in the rfps the dsny put out so, and it gets back to what, what, what other uh, councilmen have said, those elements of those bills in the current model, you can drive the, uh, uh, this ball way down the course. Well, I would second that. In fact, much of 1574 is good stuff. It's all best practices. It's all the direction that the industry would prefer to go rather than fighting over the politics of zones. Um, and so there's much in that that was discussed in the advisory board process, much of which is industry best practice already and is uh, worth discussing as to find alternate ways to achieve it, uh, and particularly through the framework of 996 that preserves the open market system but uh, creates a framework for how to move forward on those issues. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything to add? Uh, we even enjoyed the opportunity to visit with you and uh, you know other council members, the chairman, his staff, uh, the administration, and appreciate the open door and the ability to communicate. President of the organization and Mr. T. Carding is a member of the advisory board. Uh, I've had uh, informal conversations with Asher Freeman about the bill. I uh, have met with two city councilors to talk about that as well as other environmental issues. Anything to add? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. The next uh, group is uh, Plinio Cruz Alvarez. Clive Austin. Clive Austin. Dan Gabby. Adam Cope and Brendan, Brendan Sexton. I just want to say, when you fill out these cards, I'm supposed to read them. Uh, and, you know, I went to Catholic school, so the nuns would have been very upset with the, the handwriting of some of these. All right, uh, you want to start? Yeah, can you hit the, can you click the, the mic to make sure that we can hear you? All right, great. My name is Daniel Gabay. I was born in New York and I've resided in Manhattan for most of my adult life. I've watched sanitation vehicles go through red lights, speed down our streets, hug curbs near pedestrians, and I've often seen them go the wrong way on one-way streets. I've always heard stories of people being killed and severely injured by these trucks, but never thought it would be me, especially considering how careful I always was with everything. On November, on November 8th, 2015, that changed. I biked home from work, hugging the right side of the street, as I always did, when a waste vehicle was speeding down Houston Street. He had so much room, and for a split second, we were parallel, but then he started to hug the curb, and the back two wheels of his vehicle sucked my body in. Then his 20,000 pound vehicle pulverized my body against the pavement, dragging me for 20 feet before he finally stopped. It was the most blood I had ever seen in my life and it was coming out of me. My femoral artery was severed and the doctor said I had lost over 70% of my blood before I arrived at the hospital. 
After my first surgery, my family asked if I would live, and the doctor said, although he has somehow survived up until this point, it is unlikely his heart will be able to take the trauma that has occurred to his body, so it is still likely he will die. My body was mutilated, and what followed was 150 days of uncontrollable screaming because of my extreme pain. I've suffered in ways that most people could never comprehend and in ways much more graphic than I choose to describe here. I've lost many things that I will never get back, and the person who did this to me is walking around more free than I may ever be. I was in pain when I wrote this, and almost every day of my life in the past three and a half years has included excruciating physical pain. However, my battle with my pain and the emotional things that come along with it belong to me. I'm not here for me. I'm only here because I know I have to do whatever is in my power to make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else. My pain will continue, but the conditions which led to my crash and others' injuries and deaths must change. Private sanitation trucks are obviously not well regulated. The driver who did this was likely under the influence, but was somehow able to avoid testing. The company the driver employed, the, the company the driver was employed by had prior crashes, but somehow had no issues being insured and literally nothing stopping them from being on the road. The company who owned the vehicle and employed the driver didn't have to pay anything. They didn't have to stop their business and were able to continue with no issues even after admitting fault. The ripple effect of the, that these crashes have on friends, families, and sometimes even whole communities is irreversible. The pain in the eyes of my parents and the hundred or so people who visited me in the hospital was so terrible that it still haunts me. The fact that all these things mentioned above could occur in a place as civilized as New York City is almost unbelievable. It seems there is almost nothing to protect the flesh of human beings against the reckless driving and dangerous design of these multi-ton trucks. I'm almost done, by the way. <laughs> This is why legislation is needed. In other cities like LA, Seattle, and San Francisco, where there are exclusive waste zone systems, the top companies have just one third of the crashes per driver compared to what we have in NYC. Although my survival may be unique, this situation unfortunately isn't. When something so terrible keeps consistently happening over and over by the drivers of these trucks, it's a no-brainer that we must stop it. Please don't let people die and suffer in vain for what could easily be avoided. Families for Safe Streets strongly supports Intro 1574 and hope the City Council passes it as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Uh, and all that Family for Safe Streets does. And it's, it's unfortunate to even say that you're actually one of the lucky ones, right? Um, it's, it's a sad thing, but I appreciate your advocacy and you being here and giving us your testimony about uh, your unfortunate incident. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having us here today. My name is Blythe Austin. I am a crash survivor and work with crash survivors and the families of crash victims who did not survive. As you know, large trucks are involved in a disproportionate number of traffic deaths in our city. The sheer size of these trucks mean that the trucks operate like tanks rolling through our communities. You just heard Dan's story. You've also heard about the death three days ago of Robin Heitman who was hit from behind by a tractor trailer with such force that they flew several feet through the air before being crushed under the wheels of the truck. Their bicycle and their corpse were left in mangled pieces across 6th Avenue. Or the death of Arilla Lawrence last February. Arilla's entire body was crushed under the wheels of an oil truck from the bottom of her feet to the top of her head. Garbage trucks crushing people is tragically common. Families for Safe Streets has two members who each had a leg amputated after it was crushed under the wheels of a garbage truck. Jed McGriffin was walking across 6th Avenue in the crosswalk with the right-of-way when he was hit by a garbage truck driver and lost his entire left leg up to his hip bone. His injuries required 20 surgeries. He spent six weeks in a medically induced coma and eight weeks in the ICU. Lauren Pine was also crossing the street in the crosswalk with the right-of-way when a garbage truck driver hit her and then dragged her down the street until bystanders got the driver to stop. Like Jed, Lauren lost her entire left leg. In addition, her pelvis was shattered, her bladder ripped, and she had large burn-like wounds down the entirety of her remaining leg. She spent two months in the hospital. What happened to Jed and Lauren and Dan could happen to any of us. Large trucks are a menace on our streets. Since 2010, 26 people have been killed by private garbage trucks alone. There are too many garbage trucks on our streets and they are killing people. As part of your job to keep New Yorkers safe, you must take steps to minimize the prevalence of these vehicles. Intro 1574 will do just that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. 
We appreciate you again, the organization. Thank you so much for everything you're doing when it comes to advocacy related to transportation issues. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm uh, proud to share heritage with uh, you, Chair Antonio Reynoso. Many years ago, I came as an undocumented alien to the United States, to this great nation. Uh, eventually, I became a citizen. I attended City College. Uh, I went back to the Dominican Republic to work there for seven years. When I came back, uh, the job offers were not that attractive, so I became a garbage man. Because going through college, most kids wanted to be either policemen, firemen, or garbage men. Not because it is an easy job, it is a tough, dangerous job. However, they will, get, they will get good pay and good benefits when they are properly represented. Unfortunately, our industry, the private sanitation industry, is, is in a race to the bottom. We have those companies that appear to be good companies like Mr. T. Cutting. I heard the man uh, testify before. I used to work for Mr. T. For, for Mr. T. Cutting, so I know who Mr. T. Cutting is. Uh, I have an example of a brother that worked for them for like about 10 years. He contracted cancer working for them, and they even denied their unemployment. And since they don't have a good union anymore, where they have a fake union like many we have here in New York, he had to come to the Teamsters, and we fought for him, and he got his unemployment. That's Mr. T. Cutting. I got fired because I was the face of the real union there, and my last two weeks of pay I never got and they have all kinds of excuses. That's the kind of companies that we have running New York uh, private sanitation. So we need this bill. We have to change the way this uh, industry is run. We care about the environment, and, and it gets to me the fact that most people that are against this bill don't think about the human beings. The human resource, the most important thing, environment, safety, and the people who do the job. We should be caring about that. That's the most important thing, in my opinion. So please, we need this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I, my note said good morning, but that's incorrect. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I'm Brendan Sexton. I'm a member of and former chair of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. And uh, I do want to uh, obey your instruction not to repeat what's already been said by many. We are very, the Solid Waste Advisory Board is very supportive of 1574. We've been in favor of zones and franchise-like systems for as long as I've been involved in it. It's over a decade now. We do support this bill with some adjustments, and I'll try to be very brief. One is on the question of multiple or single co uh, contractors per zone, we, the board, frankly, has advocates of both positions, but uh, we have come down in favor of allowing uh, businesses to choose more than, from more than one offering. And so we support the commissioner's proposal, which was for three to five quarters per zone. Uh, I, I must say, as a former uh, executive of the Department of Sanitation, the notion that if I had a, a zone and a problem with the quarter in that zone, and I had someone else who was already serving other customers in that zone that I could switch to, I would appreciate that greatly as a management tool. The sal salvage, san sanitation salvage example is a good one. Companies go bankrupt or are wrong. To have someone to switch to is important. Second, I would like to see greater emphasis to recycling and wa zero waste uh, in the requirements. Uh, the truth is most people don't want to think about this, but that almost certainly means composting. That's the one proportion of our waste which is poorly recycled now, and without some legislative impetus, uh, it will never be uh, recycled greatly, I don't think. Uh, finally, an issue no one has mentioned, micro haulers. We deal a lot at the Solid Waste Advisory Board because we're a citizen group. We deal with citizen recyclers, community gardens, and others. And the bill now has a very restrictive requ uh, requirement on what qualifies you for uh, legally being a micro hauler. It says you have to do fewer than 60 tons per year, which is really much too small. We would probably suggest micro haulers could go, go up to 10,000 tons a year before requiring a, a permit as a commercial carter. 
and I'm being crowded out. But at any rate, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and we are generally very supportive of the bill. We do uh, not think the monopolistic approach is the preferable one. We do think that the RFP uh, process will allow for high quality service, especially recycling and organics, and we uh, appreciate the chance to work with you further on it. Thank you. So, and just uh, if you can, the, can the Manhattan Swab send us uh, their, their concerns uh, in writing, unless we already have them? Uh, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, Brendan Sexton is the former commissioner to the Department of Sanitation. I want to thank you for taking the time. You're also you. the, the person with the sloppy handwriting that I was talking about, Brendan. I almost, <laughs> I almost couldn't read that it was you. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but thank you for your testimony, and thank please, you. if you could get that information to me, it would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have um, uh, Adam Cope, um, who's actually from, yeah, from, from Oakland, uh, who's also going to be able to speak to us. Uh, so please. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm out here from Oakland. I represent a nonprofit conservation corps, Civic Corps Schools. Um, we have two separate social enterprises. One is land management contracts, which I... I directly oversee, but we also have a recycling social enterprise. In 2014, we were written into the franchise agreement with waste management through the city of Oakland, and that allowed us to be one of the smaller players as far as commercial recycling and organics. Without that franchise agreement and being written into it and having that support, we would never be able to have right now, which is one of our most successful social enterprises, the recycling program. Um, it's a, a free apprenticeship program that allows us to work directly with, with the Teamsters Union. And we are able to essentially have a training program that guides our young folks as they're going through our program directly into family sustaining jobs with the Teamsters Union. And eventually, they walk into full-time jobs with waste management. Um, there was a lot of opposition at first to, to this, a lot of trepidation with waste management, with the union. Um, however, we're providing union members. We're also providing a valuable service to the city of Oakland with streamlined recycling services that we're extremely capable of doing and extremely resp um, responsive. So I think it's a model that could be replicated and works well. I think that it also proves that you can work with larger agencies and, and break pieces off and work with unions and nonprofits together symbiotically and it's, it's proven and I hope it's replicable here too. So thank you for your testimony. So it, it seems like LA is the only city that's doing uh, zoning when it comes to the arguments that people make on whether it's successful or not. But we've already heard from uh, San Francisco and now Oakland about the successes that they've had. And you're very rarely brought up in, in the conversations that we have. But um, I, I do appreciate uh, your testimony and your experience. Um, it tends to be when we do meaningful things here in the city council that um, a lot of folks believe the sky is falling um, and they present uh, doomsday scenarios. Uh, and that happens almost every single time. Again, I think a meaningful piece of legislation happens. And this city, New York City, is a perfect example of one where the sky is very rarely have ever fallen. The sky's not falling. Uh, it, it doesn't. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't believe that that's the case. I don't think there's a doomsday scenario here. I feel like we're very resilient. Um, as New Yorkers, we figure it out always. And uh, the Department of Sanitation is actually in this city. The Department of Sanitation is very, wants to be as flexible as possible, and it's taking its time to present this in three to four years to make sure that the rollout is as successful as possible. There's no rush, and we want to get this right. So I, I do appreciate your testimony. And we are falling. We do need to have conversations here about the work of recycling for organics and smaller, like what we call micro haulers here um, that we've kind of left out. So we are having discussions with the Department of Sanitation to allow for not necessarily non-for-profits, but in some cases they are, but just these smaller haulers um, that are doing good work. And then that whole apprenticeship conversation, um, if we do this work, uh, there's an assumption being made that many of the larger companies uh, that are doing the right thing and are probably grade high here um, have high standards for workers. Um, that tend to have Teamsters uh, or unions in them, real unions in them, and we're hoping that that could lead to more high-quality work for the workers. Yeah, lead to more high-quality jobs. Too. Yes, exactly. So thank you again for your testimony. We appreciate it. To this panel, thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir.
This is gonna be the last panel that we have in this room. After this, we have to move to a smaller room because there's gonna, there's 400 people waiting outside for the next hearing. Um, so we're gonna have this, this group and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about nine panels left. Uh, so we're gonna go with uh, Ron Bergamini from Action, Anthony Carmona from, a the, from Waste Connections, uh, Dr. Tok Oyewole from the Environmental Justice Alliance, yes. Uh, Eric McClure from Streets Pack, and Chio Valerio Gonzalez uh, from Align. So we're gonna start from on down, yes. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Anthony Carmona. I've been working uh, in the sanitation industry for five years. Uh, I started my first two years working in Viking Sanitation. Um, they're uh, a family-owned company. I wasn't given any, uh, when I first started, I was just told hop on the back of the truck and uh, do the job. I wasn't given no safety gear, safety equipment. Um, I wasn't given any training of how to properly hold on to the back of the truck. I wasn't given anything to anything that I needed to do to do my job. I wasn't given. Um, a couple months passed, almost, almost a year, and uh, a couple of the guys, this, um, well, not a couple, everybody in the company decided to go union, and um, we decided to go with 813 Seamsters. So uh, when the boss found out that we was trying to unionize, he started pulling each of us to the side, offering us money and, and false promises that he was gonna give us so we don't go union on him. Oh, what happened? It worked, we didn't go union. What happened? He decided to cut my days because he found out I was one of the main union supporters. So I was given less pay, less days of work, and uh, you know, that messes, that messes with somebody, you know? used to work in a certain amount, used to getting paid a certain amount. You know, you want that every week constantly, but no. So what happens now? Um, I'm part of 813 now. They fought for me to get, my, to get me into Waste Connections. I work for Waste Connections. I've been working at Waste Connections for three years. I get paid by the hour for every hour I work. I got full benefits, pension, everything. You name it, I got it. I even got a uniform. I even got a locker. They give me boots, gloves, every day. Anything I need to use to work, they give it to me. It's provided to me. That's the, that's the difference between a non-union company and a union company. So if I'm, if I'm getting paid $24 an hour, why shouldn't everybody else that does the same job I do get paid the same, right? Don't you agree? That's, that's all I have to say. Got nothing else to say. Thank you for your testimony. And I think your testimony is core to what we're trying to accomplish, right? That there's obviously, um, and in your case, the waste connections of the world that are taking care of their workers and are doing good work. And we want them to be able to thrive in the city of New York. And then we have companies that, Viking in this case, that you had a completely different experience. And I think we're doing a better job as time has gone on at being able to distinguish between those that are doing the right thing and those that are not. And I appreciate your testimony and your statement. And I'm glad you found another job and that uh, the Teamsters were able to help you um, and Waste Connections was there. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much um, to Councilmember Reynoso and to um, all the advocates who um, uh, have spoken today for this bill. I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, and my name is Dr. Tok Oyewole. Um, founded in 1991, we're a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their fight for environmental justice. For, you know, for the sake of time, um, I just want to um, say we're really honored to have taken part of this uh, fight for race, waste reform, and this is a, a 
really overdue overhaul of the system, and we think that all of the benefits people have said today and have been in the city's um, draft environmental impact statement, including vehicle miles traveled, um, and the resultant um, benefits to um, greenhouse gas mitigation, air pollution mitigation, um, and the uh, benefits for equity and um, um, environmental justice community are, are really timely and prescient. Um, we think a few key changes to the bill can still improve its efficacy from climate and environmental justice perspectives, including adherence with environmental plans. Currently within the bill, carters must comply with the terms of some plans they submit in the RFP process, including waste reduction plan, health and safety plan, and customer service plan. However, they're not required to comply with waste management, greenhouse gas reduction, or air pollution reduction plans. Uh, the bill as drafted doesn't uh, currently mandate that carting companies submit plans to reduce particulate or greenhouse gas emissions, but legislates submission of these plans as more of an option, um, you know, if they have the plans. Um, we request that these are required criteria with which carting companies must comply, appropriately addressing the urgency and gravity of our climate crisis and environmental safety. Uh, prioritization of facility oversight. So the same level of oversight for carters must apply to facilities handling waste within this bill, including at the very least their adherence with local, state, and federal laws. Um, poor facility operations uh, are a large part of uh, the burden environmental justice communities face on top of the disproportionate amount of waste that's routed to them, and so we can't leave regulating this aspect of the waste system for later because it has already been too long. Um, increased waste diversion from landfill. Uh, we're pleased the bill requires carter submission of waste reduction plans and to strengthen this, we think it's imperative for the bill to advance very rigorous waste reduction targets in line with one NYC goals of zero waste by 2030. I wanna uplift, um, uh, th this would provide further benefits for overburdened New York communities and downstream stream EJ communities. In, each, in New York, New Jersey, and other states receiving waste from our transfer stations, we can't continue to safeguard inefficient business practices at the expense of areas of the planet that have effectively been deemed disposable. In this vein, this bill has the opportunity to uplift businesses that are innovatively tackling our egregious waste generation and the climate crisis by prioritizing waste reduction and reuse. These Businesses include the zero or low emission organic waste micro haulers who provide employment to young people, people, people of color, and women. They must be allowed to scale up sustainable practices such as composting by increasing infrastructure dedicated to their work and including higher tonnage allowances in the bill. Um, regulation of subcontracting uh, as well as increased public reporting so that uh, meaningful regular public involvement can be uh, part of, uh, of Dr. this can process. You, can you just uh, wrap it up and we'll, we'll definitely have your testimony and you are part of the coalition, so we're more than happy to keep hearing your concerns. Yes, yeah. Um, thank you so much. That that was. Uh, those are the last points, and um, you, you have my testimony. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And I just want to, uh, for news, if you haven't heard, the Supreme Court just struck down the citizenship question. Uh, uh, they're going to send it back to the lower court, so they won't add the citizenship question to the uh, census, which is a big deal for our community. So. So for New York, it's going to be big. So, sorry, that's a, just wanted to drop that in. Uh, go Chair ahead, Reynoso, right. Council Members Chin and Deutsch, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Eric McClure. I'm the Executive Director of Streets PAC. We're a political action committee that advocates for safe streets policies. And as such, we support the passage of Intro 1574. An exclusive waste zone program will lead to the largest possible reduction in vehicle miles traveled by commercial waste haulers, reducing overall VMT by approximately 60% versus the current non-zone system. As the Department of Sanitation stated earlier today, that would be a reduction of some 18 million miles traveled annually. This is critically important from the standpoint of safety since drivers of commercial waste vehicles have killed more than two dozen people on New York City streets over just the past five years. The current system in which different carting companies drive routes that can crisscross the entire city leads to some of the most reckless driving behaviors one can imagine. Blatant running of red lights, wrong way operation, backing up through intersections, and hazardous speeding. Anyone who's walked a street late at night in New York City has witnessed this firsthand. But private sanitation drivers don't set out to be a menace. That type of driving behavior is fed by the current dysfunctional system in which overworked crews zigzag across the city in a nightly race to complete their haphazard, disjointed routes, frequently working 12 or 14 hour shifts. An exclusive zone system will greatly rationalize this current dangerous mess. 
Moreover, the reduction in VMT will be even more pronounced in the densest parts of the city. An exclusive zone plan will reduce VMT in Midtown Manhattan by more than half versus a non-exclusive multi-hauler arrangement. There are a number of other reasons to support this legislation, uh, air quality, greenhouse gases, um, noise, but um, we're here today to support the bill because of what it will mean for the safety of New York citizens and preserving life and limb. Thanks very much. Thank you for your testimony, Eric. Ron, are you on the right panel? I don't know, <laughs> but uh, here I am. Go ahead. So. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Better, better be on a panel, right? Yes, our panel is good enough. So thanks, and I will try not to repeat as you asked uh, earlier. My name is Ron Bergamini. I'm the CEO of Action Environmental Group, the parent company of Action Carding. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to be here and, and other members. You heard it mentioned earlier that this is arguably, I think it is, the most substantial change in solid waste laws really in the history of New York. And I realize today is a bit of a hectic day. I'd, I'd urge maybe another hearing or two to tackle some of these things. This is a very difficult business. And the men and women who work, and they're mostly men at night, picking up the truck, it's a, it picking, driving the trucks and picking up this trash, that's very stressful. And we have been advocating improving standards for a long time. We're not completely convinced that the only way to do that is through zoning. However, if we're going to go that option, we believe that the single hauler uh, player is the better option. I've heard some talk about low cost. Well, is the goal simply low cost or is it policy and improving things like the environment and worker conditions and standards? If it's, no one wants to get on the airplane that the, the parts are purchased by the lowest cost, right? We can open up fresh skills if we want to really bring the rates down. It, it has to be more than that. And when you think about the, the single player, the things you could do, it's a one call system from street fairs, parades. My favorite fun one is no garbage trucks in the midtown on Wednesdays for matinee day. You could do that if you have the whole zone. Now, for those who bring up a good point about service, particularly some of the larger players, what I would urge the council or DSNY to do in the RFP, understand what those are. What are the specific concerns you have? And anyone who's going to bid has to be able to show that they can address those concerns. The last thing would be pricing. Uh, uh, and there's a handful of things, but pricing in particular, I think it needs to be more like a San Francisco or a Seattle with a pricing menu as opposed to just one price. That will have it, that, that will be the most transparent system and we will have to periodically review this. I understand people want to have lower prices for recycling, but right now the recycling market is in a state of chaotic upside downness. I don't know what you want to call it. It might not happen frequently, but it does happen. So we're proud to be part of these discussions. We want to continue to be part of them. And let's not forget the, and many of them are here, the very hardworking people in this industry. They deserve all of our thanks. And thank you. Thank you, Ron. I just wanted two, two things for you. Um, yep. the, I, I hear the, when the recycling rates change and it makes it harder for folks to, to, to sell their product um, right. or export it, I understand that there might have to be some conversations not to lock you into a place where it's just you can't make it happen. Um, I think there's certain ways to do that. Um, in there are. Cases, we don't necessarily need to put the burden on the business for that, but we, we should, that's something we're going to talk about. I want right. to ask you a question that Councilmember Valone asked before when you weren't, you might have been here, but here. he's not here, is language access. He says that a lot of the businesses, especially in and around his community, are extremely diverse, and they have relationships with carters that they would, they've been able to speak the language with them. In your case as a, as a carter, um, how do you navigate uh, you know, somebody that is in a Chinese-speaking community or somebody is in a Spanish-speaking community. How is it that you navigate and ensure that you're able to inform people the right way about what you're providing? Right. Uh, f first, the notion that New Yorkers don't know how to negotiate is just crazy. They all do, mm -hmm. I assure you. We have, in our case, we have several people who speak Spanish, and then we have uh, two women in particular. They speak Chinese to deal with those um, customers because there's a big enough um, population. We don't have people that speak Greek, uh, frankly. Uh, I haven't heard of that being a big issue, but we, we're certainly sensitive to, the, to some of the languages, and I think that's something that can be overcome. 
Yeah, I feel like if you want the business, you'll find somebody that can right. speak the language. And, and just one final point on the recycling that you mentioned. This is all, all expenses go up for businesses. That's, that's common, right? 2%, 3%. The recycling isn't a matter of the prices changing by a few percents. The market's disappeared. So that's a far more fundamental change, and, and people need to be aware of that. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, oh. You move to the middle. Sorry. Okay. Single. Okay. Um, thank you so much for uh, for having us here. I want to thank Council Member Antonio. Uh, I believe that this country we're kind of in a period where the the, ta the tide is coming, right? And we have to make a choice. We have to stand on the right side of history. And I want to make. I want to bring it back to basics because I think that this legislation at its core is trying to address racial, economic, um, and climate and environmental injustices that communities of color have suffered for far too long. This isn't just about reforming an industry and figuring out which routes. This is not all the technical stuff we can figure out. This is about workers like Mokhtar Diallo who died. This is about workers from Sanitation Salvage who are getting paid, who were getting paid $3.81 per hour. That is outrageous. None of us can survive on $15 an hour. So when we talk about the minimum wage, we really need to be talking about an actual living wage here in New York City. I want to talk about the, this is an immigrant justice issue, and not just because it's mostly Latino, it's mostly black immigrants working in this industry. I want to talk about I want to talk about Valeria, and I want to talk about Oscar, and I want to talk about the crisis that we're facing and that we have to do everything in our hands and in our power to stop this climate crisis. People are crossing the border because we have a climate crisis in our hands. This is an issue. This is a way for us to start addressing these issues. And I wonder, when my kids grow up, are they going to ask me, did you do everything possible to mitigate this crisis, because the chances are that most of the owners of the carters uh, that are here, you know, they're kind of on their way out. And we're not, they're not going to be the worst of, they're not going to see the worst of the climate change crisis. Our kids are. And so when the difference is between 50% mile reduction and 65 or 70 mile reduction, I want us to go to 70 because we're worth it, because we need to fight for our kids. We need to fight for our future. We have so much wrongs to right, and this legislation is one of the many pieces that we can start doing here in New York City. We have to stand on the right side of history, and that's not easy. It's not easy to tell small businesses, you may have to pay a little bit more, but guess what? In 40 years, we won't be here. Thank you all so much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you to the panel, I really appreciate it. And um, we always said it, it, saving our environment has a price and it's a price we have to pay. Um, and it's something that I've always uh, fought for, so I really appreciate your testimony. Um, so now uh, the Sergeant at Arms are gonna ask us to move over to the next room uh, so that we can transition oh, and allow for- Excuse me, for can I just say one more thing? Excuse me, council member, Who's, oh, can I'm I just sorry. say one thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys talk about safety and uh, you know efficiency. Uh, my company, Waste Connections, just went the month of May without a, without a single incident. If that's not safety, I don't know what is. And we're doing it again this month. So, yeah, yeah I want safety. That's how you do with it. With the right companies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Can we get uh, Kathleen Riley? Is Kathleen Riley here? To take this. Reginald Bowman? Reginald Bowman? Okay. Reginald Bowman? Mark Diacus? Mark, so, thank you. Uh, Anna Champini, or Champagny, thank you. And Steve Leone. 
Okay. Sorry about that. What is all? Okay, thank you for being here. I guess we'll start from right to left. So Nelson, you wanna go ahead and start? Uh, so we're just, uh, I just want to say, we're resuming the meeting, uh, the Solid Waste and Sanitation Committee. Uh, Nelson. Thank you. Uh, it was good morning, but good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the Chairman Reynoso and the rest of the committee members for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Nelson Eusebio. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the National Supermarket Association. NSA is a trade association that represents the interests of independent supermarket owners in New York. I'm here today to testify in regards to introduction 1574, which establishes commercial waste zones and requires the Department of Sanitation to enter into an exclusive agreement with private caterers to operate in each zone. The bill as written will have a tremendous impact on small business, such as supermarkets that only that rely on commercial caterers to remove our garbage. Many of our members have had long standing relationships with these carters, and by establishing waste zones with one exclusive vendor, the bill is extremely uh, create, is creating a monopoly in which of the waste zone, our members have enjoyed the benefits of long term working relationship with their caters through this continued rules, flexible payment schedules, and reliable uh, consistent service. We are concerned that exclusive one vendor system will lead to a, a decrease in service and increase in cost. By removing the free market aspect of business, the bill will force small businesses into a system where they have no bargaining power for way zone system to work in New York City. There has to be more than one vendor in each zone. While we do not support any zone system, if we had to exist in such an order to protect the business, we will propose a system where there are at least five vendors in each system so that small businesses have the ability to choose between different providers. We also believe that the business have the ability to, uh, to have the ability to terminate an agreement at will. Forcing a business to remain in agreement with a commercial caterer who may not meet their, their needs or requirements will add additional costs and, and result in price increase. We would also like to see the bill amendment to include a provision which requires DSNY to replace a vendor if one commercial carter is in a zone is uh, inadequate for another company or goes out of business. It is imperative that there is a continuous opportunity for small business to choose between caters in the city should be committed to keeping the number of vendors to five in each zone. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Anna Champany, and I'm the Director of City Studies at the Citizens Budget Commission. Uh, CBC is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank that promotes constructive change in the finances and services of New York City and state governments. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. CBC strongly supports the establishment of commercial waste zones in New York City. Um, CBC's, 20, uh, CBC's 2014 report documented the inefficiency of the current system and recommended a non-exclusive zone model. Establishing commercial waste zones can increase efficiency in collection, achieve substantial ve vehicle mile traveled reduction, and reduce the negative <coughs> externalities imposed by long duplicative routes by having fewer carters serve more customers within contiguous routes, uh, zones. I'm sorry. In addition, shifting to a system in which the city contracts with commercial carters allows the city to implement standards for vehicle emissions, safety and training, labor standards, recycling, and other policy objectives through contract requirements. CBC um, ex supports non-exclusive zones with uh, three to five carters for the following four reasons. Uh, first of all, zones provide, it's the, the shift to zoning that provides the substantial VMT reductions. Going from the current system to a zone model uh, would produce a 50% reduction in vehicle miles traveled. The exclusive zone model provides only a limited benefit over the non-exclusive zone in terms of vehicle mile traveled, um, as we've heard, an eight percentage point increase. Uh, however, non-exclusive um, oh, uh, non zones retain customer uh, choice and performance incentives. 
While a system of exclusive zones would involve multiple carters competing for the city's contract, it would end a customer's opportunity to negotiate with and select a waste carter. Once a carter has been exclusively awarded a zone, there is limited additional incentive for them to reduce costs or improve service. As the only service provider in a zone, an exclusive carter would set pricing in accordance with its contract bid. And there would be uh, no reason for the carter to charge less. In a non-exclusive zone model, carters compete not only to be awarded the contract, but also with other carters in the zone for customers. This maintains incentives to keep costs down and deliver high quality services that are available in competitive markets. Um, and lastly, exclusive zones present a risk to a fiscal risk to the city if a carter fails to deliver. Um, if a contracted carter fails to perform collection services as required or falls short of customer expectations, uh, customers cannot shift to businesses to another carter in an exclusive zone. While DSNY will have oversight responsibility and enforcement capability, DSNY is unlikely to exercise the most severe enforcement tool contract for termination because that would require the Department of Sanitation to procure a new contractor rapidly and to serve as the interim carter. Having DSNY be the default provider in an exclusive zone model is potentially costly for the city. Collection by DSNY would cost more than collection by private carters, um, as DSNY collection costs on average are twice that of the private sector, and additional commercial collection by DSNY would likely be done on overtime further increasing the cost. The carting fees paid by businesses would be insufficient to cover the city's cost, and the city would need to seek reimbursement either from the carter or more likely the taxpayers would be picking up the cost. Um, the implementation, um, another, sort of another point that we'd like to make is that implementation provides an opportunity for the city and the industry to keep track of efficiency gains, environmental benefits, and customer service. Uh, the potential variation in the number of carters per zone provides a further opportunity to refine the model in the future. The city's request for proposal should include detailed performance metrics to be tracked and made publicly available so that there can be a robust evaluation of the commercial waste zone program that informs DSNY <coughs> oversight and modifications to the program in future bidding. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Rob Arnoso and members of the Sanitation Committee. My name is Mark Dykus. I'm the Executive Director of the Soho Broadway Initiative. We're the not-for-profit that manages the Neighborhood Improvement District, also known as a Business Improvement District in Soho. Um, we represent a mixed-use community, residents, businesses, commercial property owners um, along Broadway from Houston to Canal. Um, I think this is the non-exclusive zone panel. Um, I'm not going to repeat the arguments um, that have been made by uh, the previous um, testimony. We, we think the non-exclusive uh, approach that DSNY is um, proposing is, should be the proposal that we, we are urging um, city the council to move forward with. Um, the initiative is joining a coalition of 10 other business improvement districts in Manhattan and urging council to do that. We think competition um, does, a, does, does a lot of good things in this uh, area while also um, meeting the uh, zero waste goals of the city. Competition provides flexibility, customer choice, um, which keeps prices down. Um, it helps keep accountability within the system and also helps keep, which will help keep neighborhoods cleaner. Um, in Soho, um, we have commercial buildings right next to residential buildings. Um, so reducing the number of trucks coming in overnight would be a huge reduction. I think, um, you know, we've heard, you know, upwards of 50% reduction through the DSNY proposal. Um, and we think those are all, all really good things. Um, additionally, you know, we, we ask uh, that, the count, that the proposed legisl legislation includes flexibility to allow bids, business improvement districts to explore further commercial waste management innovations that support, support the city's zero waste goals while also addressing some of the local challenges um, that communities face. That's what bids are formed to do. These innovations might include ways to further consolidate waste for more efficient collection, introduce new technologies to further reduce emissions or other changes that might increase the diversion of recyclable 
and compostable material uh, from our landfills. I can give you an example of a program that we started that diverted over a ton of um, household food scraps uh, just over one year with a small reused newspaper box. Um, that's something that we did and we're gonna expand that program and I think that's a, an area where bids can be helpful in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hello. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynosa and council members. My name is Exana Reyes and I'm here on behalf of Lisa Soren, president of the Bronx Chamber of Commerce and its members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today regarding this bill, 1574, and the harm it may bring to the business, specifically the small businesses of our borough. This bill, which would pick just one company to provide service in each of 20 zones, has a possibility of creating more harm to the local economy than it does benefit. By creating monopolized zones with minimum opportunity for businesses to select what is in their best interest. As someone who has worked with small businesses and Bronx businesses, I fear that reestablishing monopoly zoned garbage collection will push price higher and take away choice. I fear that this bill has a potential to put small multi-generational businesses and their hundreds of workers out of service. In 1996, the Trade Waste Act championed by Mayor Giuliani was adopted in response to a 114 count indictment of waste industry leaders, many with ties to organized crime. A new agency was created to oversee the private carding industry, establish toughest standards and evict the remaining rem remnants of mob companies. Um, yeah. No, I'm sorry, influence. After this, there was a new era of competition among mostly local companies that manage waste from more than 100,000 businesses is now, 100,000, I'm sorry, businesses is now fewer than 50 with 20 capable well-run companies providing 85% of the service, customized <coughs> to meet the needs of the city's vast array of customers under the watchful eye of the Business Integrity Commission. This bill would upset this progress by severely reducing the number of companies picked to serve the city. The bill will establish waste collection in limited zones, each of which with just one hauler picked to service it, with 10-year contracts that could easily turn into 50. Can we honestly say that the fewer than 50 remaining companies can fair, fairly compete with the big companies for these zones? They can't. The city should maintain the current open market system with its benefits and do the hard work of updating old regulations and collaborations with industry and business stakeholders to reflect the city's new goals. Intro 996 proposed by Council Member Robert Carnegie is a constructive alternative that is endorsed by the business community and the waste services industry. It tackles the city's new goal by improving the existing open MAR system. Overall, Intro, intro 996 offers a framework to bring together various stakeholders in the city to shape ideas that improve efficiency and environmental outcomes with the risk of industry, destruction, and customer chaos of the proposal we are discussing here today. Council members, we at the Bronx Chamber of Commerce respectfully request you look over at what you are proposing and realize that you're going back to the good old days is not a solution. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Stephen Leone. I'm president of Industrial Carding. I'm here today representing the 25 employees, most of whom are people of color and second chance workers of a 90 year old third generation business. My business integrity commission license number is 22, which is of no great significance, other than the fact that it may be the lowest number currently in operation. Daily, my business operates in a dynamic environment in which fluctuations in the price of a barrel of oil, foreign exchange rates, and international trade policy directly impact customer service and pricing. I routinely compete with and succeed against competitors that are 5, 10, 20, and 50 times my size. Intro 1574 allows for neither of these to occur. It creates a static environment unable to adjust to fluctuating factors and flat out eliminates competition. Business trade groups are fearful of the devastating <coughs> impacts this loss of competition will have on service and pricing, and they're correct. Rather than creating a competitive, in a competitive environment, if enacted, Intro 1574 will create a competition to see which two or three waste companies have the best financial wherewithal to survive the duration of an initial bid term. Thereafter, no competitors will be in place to prevent them from controlling the city in perpetuity. As members of this committee, your fellow council members, members rely upon your your guidance to act prudently. Understanding the impacts to customers' service and pricing and the small business community, 
<clears throat> should be the highest priority before considering a measure with impacts like this. Intro 1574 lacks the necessary documentation and evidence to support its many claims. In closing, I refer to the Business Integrity Commission approved contract for removal of non-hazardous trade waste, which is available on its website. It begins with a bold print uppercase message from the Business Integrity Commission to every customer and contains the following language, quote, the commission suggests that you seek competitive bids from at least four different carding companies before signing a contract like this one, end quote. This seems important. Under intro 1574, it will no longer be possible. I'd just like to add one other thing. Um, you know, the, the, the hearing today is go, has gone on for, uh, for quite a length of time, and uh, when something like that happens, you sit next to all different types of people, and you make uh, new connections and new friends, and I, I sat uh, next to someone who, who testified earlier, the gentleman from San Francisco, and uh, you, you guys were, were speaking with him earlier, as well as the, uh, the gentleman from Oakland. I, I urged the, the council, the committee rather, to really find out from these folks what the costs are uh, in, these in, in these other cities that have franchising. Because I can assure you, there are multiples more than what the small business and large business community of New York City is currently paying. So please, please do that. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to, specifically to your comments, you made mention to the fact that there's no information or data uh, to, to substantiate the piece of legislation that we're hearing today when we actually have significant data and information that the Department of Sanitation went through for two years with an advisory committee and then moving forward with a study specifically to argue that what we're trying to do here makes sense and works, but then you then go on to make a statement asking us to do more research related to what's happening in California um, and claim that the prices have, can double or go up, which I, which I want to be clear is not a study but it, it, nothing else other than an anecdote. So it's like if you're going to come and say that the work that we're doing is not substantiated, um, which I disagree, we have uh, countless information, and if you want it, we can give you all the raw data of what they've received and can give you uh, your own um, book uh, and information regarding waste zoning, but don't, don't claim that we didn't do our research and we didn't do our work. That's, all, that's, that, that's what I want to make sure that we communicate. Well, we could have a a conversation on policy, um, not, but we're not going to have conversation on facts and data, which we do have. The facts are that those documents support the DSNY non-exclusive plan. Right. So, so that's a that's a conversation to have. I, I agree with that. I think where the, the claim, I thought the claim you were making was uh, that the zoning system in general was a concern for you. But if you're making a claim regarding um, uh, multiple zones or exclusive zones, that's a different conversation to yeah, be the, had. The documentation provided by Department of Sanitation supports a plan that is not 1574, that's it. Mm, that's, so two things, that's not true. Uh, DSNY chose the non-exclusive plan as the preferred plan that they would like to play out. But the study did study an exclusive zoning system as well. And it shows that in that study, there's been actually vehicles miles traveled will be reduced even more extensively than the plan that they chose. So I just want to be clear, there is data that supports both points, and you can make either or, but to say that the legislation that we presented is not based on fact, the data is just incorrect. The SNY chose a different path using the information they had than I did, but still, same information, same data. Yeah, I want to be clear, same information. The, the, the study, if you read it, speaks to an exclusive zone as well. And they said, out of the two, between an exclusive and a non-exclusive, they think that non-exclusive is the best way to go. So which data is supporting 1574? The same data that's, that the studies that that show how many zones there should be, how many competitors there should be per zone. Yes, where, that's where, the same. That, the same study, the same exact study, exactly. makes a case for both. For both, and uh, the DSNY chose one, and I chose another. So that's what I'm saying. We've chose two cases that were made with the same data. Okay. Uh, in response to your question uh, regarding the rates in San Francisco and other in other locales. Uh, regarding San Francisco, the gentleman from San Francisco and I had a lively conversation. Uh, we just, I just learned that it cost $68 a cubic yard. I'm sorry. Okay, so, so I guess, I guess what I'm, I guess the point that I'm trying to make here with the information here is that a lot of people are going to throw out information that is very anecdotal and literally back of the paper, back of the napkin conversations. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do that, 
you, you can't question the information of the data that's given to you by the Department of Sanitation is what, is what I'm saying. So what happened, in, what happened in Cali, the guy came in here to specifically talk about how he thought it was a, a successful program. But out of that, you're going to extract the, the one not, piece of, wait, of anecdotal conversation that you had with him on the side about the pricing and where it's at. We're, we're going to do, we've done all the research that, that we've done to substantiate what we're saying. We're not gonna allow for your conversation on the side in a hearing over two minutes with somebody to dictate whether or not the plan makes sense or doesn't. I just, I'm just saying factually for you to come with a, literally something you wrote on a piece of paper to, to so disclaim when I, so when I, what we're when saying. So when I say that, it, that the rates in these other cities are multiples more than the average rate in New York City, right. and then you question me, and then I take I out the question paper me. that- I didn't question I didn't question you. You questioned exactly my you data. And I told you my data is stronger than yours. And another thing is- Disagree then. Sure, it's, that's perfectly fine. I'm cool with you agreeing with disagreeing. That, that I accept. And, uh, but I did want to ask the small businesses, and I know the IBO had something that uh, is supporting the zoning system, but also had, um, I mean, sorry, almost the same thing. I'm sorry, but um, I think yours is also the non-exclusive exclusive zone conversation. But I guess what, part of what we're, and I think this is for, the, the small business conversation is that we're trying to accomplish so, certain goals. Vehicles miles travel, specifically in the Bronx, who has one of the, the, the most environmental justice communities uh, in all of the city. Um, reducing vehicles mile, vehicle miles traveled, um, addressing environmental issues, uh, dealing with climate change in a meaningful way. Workers being able to have, uh, being safe, being able to have, get paid uh, at least the minimum wage. These type of things that we're trying to achieve um, are almost impossible to do without having some way to hold the companies accountable and ensuring that the good companies get the work. So um, what I would say is that yes, uh, I would like to ask businesses, when you go into your contracts, are you asking your carters, hey, how well do you recycle? Are you asking your carters, are your trucks new? I wanna make sure that they're you know, newer than 2007 to ensure that, they, that they're not spewing chemicals on our streets. Are you asking, hey, are your workers getting paid a fair wage? Or are your workers getting paid minimum wage? Do you have off the book workers? Those are not, I believe, those are not generally the conversations a small business is having with a carter. I think the question that the, carter, that the small business is asking the carter is how much? This is how much it is. Thank you very much. Sign the paper and they do the work. What we're trying to say is that we want to insert ourselves to allow to deal, to deal with other social economic and, and issues um, that speak to the type of city we want to be. And in doing so, you're right that um, it, I, I don't disagree that the price is going to go up necessarily, but I guess what I'm saying is that's what we're trying to achieve, and it's a, it's a balance on how we get that done. So I don't want you to think that we're specifically targeting businesses, and that's something that we want to do. Our goal here is to achieve other things while having, again, the most, uh, the most help for these issues that we want to take care of with the least amount of harm to small businesses like <coughs> yours. So I want to, I've never met with you yet. I want to make sure we can do that and we can engage because I want to be able to present something to you so that you can see what our goals are and that they're not anti-business goals. They're anti-bad Carter goals. And that's what we're trying to work towards. So I really appreciate this panel. Um, I heard you loud and clear. And remember, this is, we're, we're not out to get businesses. If we can do this without affecting them uh, price-wise, it's definitely something we're going to do. Thank you for your time and you for your testimony. Andy Moss, Damon Kenyatta, I think it's Buchanan, Justin Wood, Fernando Ortiz, and Eric Goldstein. Eric, we're going to start with you as well, and we're going to move down this way. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'm going to summarize and depart from my written testimony, which I ask be included in the record. As you well know, the current system for commercial waste collection in New York City is completely broken. This is a system that does not need small adjustments. 
It needs instead a complete, carefully top to bottom remake. And that's exactly what your legislation, intro 1574, would do. In my written testimony, I detail the multiple public health benefits that would come from the establishment of an exclusive zone system. First, it'll slash ground level air pollution emissions in every neighborhood in New York City. Official city reports reveal that the circuitous, duplicative, irrational routing of the current system results in as much as 23 million miles a year of diesel truck traffic. 23 million miles. An exclusive waste zone system, as intro 1574 would do, can slash this truck traffic not just by half, but if it's exclusive, it could be even greater reductions, up to 60 or even 70 percent. This means lower discharges of particulates, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, and therefore less incidence of asthma and other lung problems in neighborhoods in all five boroughs. In addition, 1574 will help curb global warming emissions, both by cutting back on as much as 18 million miles a year of diesel truck emissions and by creating an incentive for sustainable disposal of food waste. Food waste is a major contributor to methane emissions from landfills. Landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions in the United States. Although it's been 30 years since the commercial carting industry and businesses in New York City were required to uh, recycle and compost, their performance so far has been anemic and that would change under this program. There has been dust kicked up in uh, the earlier part of the hearing. I'm gonna quickly mention three points. First, on jobs, studies show, the city's own data shows that there's an increase in overall jobs from an exclusive zone system. Uh, and these will be good jobs, jobs with fair wages, payment on the books, worker protections. We want to preserve the memory of Mukhtar Diallo, not the working conditions he was subject to. Second, on public participation, uh, I don't know uh, where Congressman, uh, Council Member Deutsch was on this, but it's been an exhaustive multi-year public process, including almost every industry representative that's testified here today. And finally, in response to the point that industry has evolved already, where is the evidence of that? There's lots of talk. But the accidents and the problems have continued. Look at any of Kira Feldman's reports in ProPublica if you think the problem has already been solved. Finally, and really finally, a word about change. Change is not always easy. Change requires that people make adjustments. Change has to be carefully planned and sensitively implemented. Often, those opposing change are people who are in positions of power and who are benefiting or profiting from the status quo. But in the case of the commercial waste collection system, the status quo is unacceptable. It's unfair to workers, it's dangerous to the public, it's disastrous for our planet. And so change is necessary, and as Sam Cook sang, it's been a long time coming, but a change is gonna come, and 1574 is that change, and we thank you for your leadership. Good afternoon. Well, my name is Damon Buchanan. I'm, my name is Damon Buchanan. I'm a helper at Five Star Carding. I joined the company a year ago because I wanted a job that would support my three kids. I want to have a future in this industry and I'm studying for my CDL so I can be a driver. My company is part of, is take, my, my company is part of taking private carding industry forward. Five Star has invested in new trucks and plans to continue raising standards with waste zones. <clears throat> this bill will allow us to do our jobs more easily and safely. We won't have to drive all over the city to complete our route. One company will be responsible for every block and every zone. We can raise recycling rates, drive slower and pollute less. We will look more like city sanitation than the private carting industry of yesteryear, yesterday. And we, need, and we need it because sanitation is one of the most dangerous jobs there is. We are working in the streets at night with heavy equipment. On top of that, you never know what's in the bag of, of trash. We need to be able to do our job safely and this bill will let us do that. This can be a great job. I love the adventure of working outside and meeting all kind of New Yorkers on my route. It is fulfilling. We are making a positive contribution to the community by keeping our 
neighborhoods clean. Please vote yes on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. You've been working there for a year now? Yes, sir. It's been a good experience? Oh, uh, yes. You feel like you're getting equipment, the training? How, how is your experience being in, in the company? Uh, yeah, for the most part, um, mm -hmm. just to give you some type of con context, like tonight I go to work tonight and I got about 250 stops. So we want to get we want to get that amount of stops done at night before the traffic picks up. So I, uh, I heard y'all uh, mentioning about the zigzagging. So I mean to give it some balance. Sometimes we have to go to the other side of the street just to uh, the mind you the route is long. The streets are empty in the middle of the night, so we can try to uh, finish the the route by the time traffic picks up the rush hour about five o'clock, the majority or overwhelming majority of our work will be done. I see that, and then 250 is a, is a better number than what we've heard in the past about some carting companies, you know, putting a 1,000 businesses in some right. cases, which is, which is serious. Um, and I'm happy to hear a member of Five Star being here. Yes, sir. Um, it's a company that I've had, uh, you know, I would say my conversations with in the past um, that I want to see do better, so to have you here means a lot. So I appreciate you being here and testifying. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a longer testimony, but I'll keep it shorter. My name is Fernando Ortiz, and I represent the Point CDC in the Hunts Point community in the South Bronx. Um, I'm just going to read some quick uh, statistics that I think are important to note. Um, within Hunts Point, over 20,000 trucks pass through our community each day, 45% of which are waste trucks. The air quality that we breathe in the South Bronx is literally different than what most communities in New York City breathe. Our air is filled with not just greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides, and ozone. We also have very large amounts of particulate matter, carcinogens, PCB, and much more. Within the Hunts Point community, we rank among the highest with PM 2.5 contaminants in the country, harmful particles that, as we know, enter our respiratory system and contribute to illnesses such as asthma and lung cancer. Within the South Bronx, the, the national, uh, sorry, the asthma rates in the South Bronx are eight times the national average, with one in four children in the South Bronx suffering from asthma, and 33% of children hospitalizations occurring within the South Bronx. And asthma death rates in the South Bronx are four times higher than the national average. In the South Bronx, studies have found that living in close proximity to nauseous land uses is associated with a 66% chance of being hospitalized with asthma, 30% chance of being low income, and a 14% chance of being a person of color, which in our opinion is 100% unfair. The Point CDC supports the New York City exclusive commercial waste zones bill because of the benefits it, could, it can provide for the South Bronx and other environmental justice communities throughout New York City. The exclusive commercial waste zones will result in significant reductions in air pollution, GHG emissions, and noise by taking thousands of miles of truck traffic off of New York City streets. While the waste equity bill passed last year was instrumental, we, um, we encouraged exclusive waste zone bills, and we believe that the forthcoming legislation can further prioritize environmental justice communities and ensure a reduction in vehicle miles. We encourage mandatory truck count monitoring to ensure that vehicular traffic is actually reduced in communities like ours. We applaud the attention pay paid to the standards of truck and, wa and workers' treatment and attention to the equitable distribution of waste disposal throughout the city. Um, and we strongly believe that, um, um, we strongly encourage this bill to consider the issue of overnight waste storage in communities such, like, such as Hunts Point to address the standards at the facilities that are disproportionately cited in our communities and often fail to adhere to local, state, and federal legislation. And we hope that this bill will seek to increase diversion of waste from landfill and that it aligns closer with 1NYC's zero waste goals. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Moss. From yeah, the I don't think you're on yet. Hi. Get the mic. Yeah, there you go. Right there we go. How's there. that? All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Moss. I'm the Government Affairs Manager for Waste Connections, and I made a lot of cuts to my testimony, so I'll keep, keep it brief. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify on behalf of Waste Connections on intro 1574. Waste Connections wholeheartedly supports the city, this committee, and Chairman Reynoso's efforts to reform the commercial waste and recycling industry. 
If the city is going to choose a franchise model, Waste Connection supports the exclusive zone model. We fear a non-exclusive system would look too much like the present system we have now. For example, a company can possess all the best safety manuals, yet not be safe if it is lacking in the culture and the commitment to act safely. It should be up to the city through a competitive RFP process to choose only the best companies that take safety seriously. There's a reason that where franchising is done throughout the country, it's done in an exclusive zone model, and that's because it works. Um, I'm sorry, cut around here. So let's see. Um, from the hauler's safety perspective, we'd like to see a good cause added for, not, for choosing not to service a customer, specifically a safety exception that excuses non-performance until a particular dangerous situation is cured. Uh, we applaud the city's efforts to require extensive initial and continued training. Our particular concern with this section is that it allows for the flexibility, it needs to allow for the flexibility to accommodate ongoing learning and training that our, our company engages in on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. We don't want to have to establish a rigid program that simply checks the boxes of the legislation without meeting the spirit of the legislation. For us, safety is a culture that permeates our company. We want the ability for the training to be ongoing as opposed to a one-time sit in the classroom, check the box, and you're done situation. Uh, finally, we heard a lot today about concern about cost. Um, there's one particular section in the, in the legislation about third-party waste audits that we believe is unnecessary in a competitive RFP process. Uh, waste audits basically help a customer improve their building's waste handling operations. Waste auditing should be included as a covered service in any issued RFP along with the community outreach function. Otherwise, if waste, offer, waste audits are offered as a free service to be provided by an outside party, literally every customer is going to want one. And there's only one way to recoup that cost. It's going to be millions of dollars that will, that will drive up costs to the, to the customers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Andy, I don't know if you would ever be sitting next to the propagandist, uh, <laughs> Justin Wood. Um, but uh, We've course, had a lot of positive conversations. I, I appreciate that. And I, I do want to say, like, I've been talking about really clearly delineating between the people that do good work and that don't. And you've, uh, you've been consistent in the conversations about a company that's doing it the right way. And you know we don't want the people in the race to the bottom conversation to be to, to make it so that you can't continue to employ people well, have nice trucks, recycle at a high rate, and do all those things that we think are important. So um, I appreciate you being here and testifying in general. I know Ron Bergamini was also here, um, so I do appreciate um, you guys coming in and, and just speaking to what you think would be beneficial. And Justin, for having us. Good afternoon. Uh, Councilmember Reynoso and, and staff, um, and to everyone here. I, I do want to pledge to Adam and Mr. T that I, as soon as I get home, I'm going to see if the Twitter handle uh, Waste Propagandist is available, and I will jump on it if you haven't already. Um, on a serious note, I, I want to say two things. We, we keep hearing uh, two different lines of um, urgency here today. One is that the sky is falling and that this bill is going to make the sky fall. And, and I want to say that the sky is falling uh, and not for the reasons that we're hearing from certain parts of the carting industry that don't want to change themselves and from certain parts of the business community that are afraid of change and we want to reassure them they, they needn't be. The sky is falling in terms of a missed opportunity to address uh, climate change. We have a city of five million or more people in India that's about to run out of water. Uh, if we look at the headlines beyond this bill, we have one of the largest crop failures probably in American history happening right now in the Midwest where there's too much water. We have the ongoing effects of hurricanes in Puerto Rico and here in New York and, and everywhere. Um, so it's falling and we need to do something about it. And this council and our state legislature have shown a willingness to act this year which is uh, one of the few things that gives the, those of us concerned about this crisis hope. And so we, we want you to advance this bill and a strong uh, recycling version of this bill that ensures a just transition for the workers in this industry from a as cheap as possible, dirty, 
uh, inefficient, chaotic waste system to one that's going to create additional jobs in recycling and composting industry, union jobs uh, for our brothers and sisters and the Teamsters and the laborers. And uh, we think this bill is absolutely that pathway. We could save one to two million tons of CO2 emissions a year. We just plugged the current rock bottom composting and recycling numbers into the EPA's methodology. And just quickly on that theme, the sky is also not falling. Uh, as we've heard from Oakland, from San Francisco, we talk constantly to our colleagues in Los Angeles, in Boise, Idaho. There's a strong uh, letter to, to you and the mayor and the speaker from someone in the Midwest who's implemented exclusive zone systems in numerous municipalities and says not a single municipality regrets that decision. Um, the prices uh, can be controlled. They do and can incentivize recycling in all these cities. It is not just a simple soundbite, uh, contrary to what, what folks would have us believe about what a given cost per ton is in San Francisco. We can implement those incentives for businesses and reward those who do the right thing and recycle more here in New York City. We can reward haulers who do the right thing and recycle and compost and reduce waste. And we can do all of that while controlling prices. We have the tools to do this. They're proven in other cities. It's time for us to take it up to scale in New York City. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Justin. Thank you to the panel. I appreciate your time. I really do. Thank you. Uh, we want to bring up Greg Todd, Mark De Concoli Tij, Ortege, Sandy Nurse, Meredith Danbera, Ficarelli, and Venara Thornburn. Uh, that's Vandra. Where is Vandra? I need to take a, a, a one minute recess. This is just one minute and I'll be right back, okay? So we're just gonna take one minute recess.
So we're beginning again. So if everyone can settle in. We're, we're, in, we're in less of a rush now because we moved to this room. You guys want to stay here all day. I have no problem doing that. Um, I just want to make sure that you feel that we're engaged. It's important. Um, but I wanted to move away from the city's testimony and move into hearing from you. Um, and didn't want you to have to sit through three, four hours of listening to the agencies without you being able to speak. That was, that was why we were rushing that portion. But this portion, please feel free to you know, take your full two minutes and engage if need be after. Um, so let's, let's begin. All right, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, Councilmember Reynoso, uh, my name is Greg Todd. I'm here today representing the Extinction Rebellion Movement. I would like to thank the council and the council member Reynoso for the opportunity to testify in the proposed legislation. Yesterday, in the standing room only chamber, this council voted unanimously with one abstention to approve Resolution 864, declaring a climate emergency for New York City. As such, this makes New York City the largest city in the world to pass such a resolution and makes an undeniably strong statement about the city's position on climate change. I think it's important to let that sink in for a moment. What does a climate emergency mean? It means simply that we are now facing the greatest threat that the human race has ever faced. The last time America faced a similar threat was after the attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. I think it's interesting to understand the effect that Pearl Harbor had on the American psyche. Suddenly, rather than grousing about the liberal New Deal policies of FDR, business became significantly a part of the war effort. The economy subsequently went into overdrive with record profits for U.S. corporations, net gains in income for American workers, and a huge growth in GDP. We are now facing a threat far greater than that posed by the Axis powers, literally the end of the human race due to climate change. The Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, in a special report states that to avoid the catastrophic effects of an increase in global temperature greater than 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to decrease net carbon emissions by 45 percent by 2030 and net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So let's engage the private sector the same way Roosevelt did after Pearl Harbor. I propose the following, that the implementation of 1574, once passed, be delayed for 30 days. During that time, the carting industries, in conjunction with sanitation and BIC, form a task force to create binding reductions in CO2 emissions, miles driven, and tons of waste dumped in a landfill. It must institute binding policies, protect the rights of carting employees, including safe working conditions, reasonable hours, job security, health care, and pension plans. In short, all the working conditions enjoyed now by workers at the Department of Sanitation. Failure of individual carters to meet these man mandates must result in fines and penalties. If the industry fails to create this task force, or if the task force fails to agree on a set of binding policies within 30 days, the legislation will go into full effect. I personally think it's only fair the carting industry be given one last chance to reform itself before policies are put into effect that might well end the existence of many of our current carters. I hope you agree with me in this sentiment and can find it in yourselves to support my proposal. Thank you. Thank you. We're just talking, are there other things that we're missing that we should be taking advantage of related to CO2 emissions and the reduction of that impact? Um, that we should have those conversations. It should be an all-encompassing bill and we should pay attention to every detail. So I appreciate uh, your, your testimony. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sandy Nurse, and I am the Executive Director of BK Rot, testifying on behalf of our team and in support of the Commercial Waste Zone Plan and specifically exclusive zones. 
BK Rod is a zero emissions hauling and composting operation in North Brooklyn that trains young people of color ages 17 to 24 in managing and composting commercial and residential organic waste. First and foremost, we are fully in support of private sanitation workers having living wages, having consistent and adequate training, and their right to organize. Um, these workers have the right to operate in an environment uh, without fear of retaliation for not complying with unsafe or hazardous work practices. So we are really encouraged by the CWZ framework that will increase accountability and support for their concerns. Uh, secondly, um, we think the CWZ is a start to the city achieving its stated goals of drastically reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. However, we are calling on Chairman Reynoso and the Department of Sanitation to further foster the important contributions of zero and low emissions organic waste micro haulers by increasing the tonnage cap of exempt material collected from 60 tons annually to 10,000 tons annually. This will enable micro haulers to scale up independently before needing to subcontract with traditional waste haulers and to build out this small business model that creates safe, healthy jobs and higher organic waste diversion rates. Organic waste micro hauling is an emerging approach to addressing the immense challenge of commercial food waste that is both scalable and replicable across the city. DSNY can benefit from our independent growth by collecting metrics and learning how to properly integrate our unique services and methods into their larger citywide plan. Here are some st statistics that support increasing the annual 60 ton cap currently imposed on organic waste micro haulers in intro 57. Number one, we already collect over 60 tons per year using zero or low emissions hauling. At the minimum, we are collecting 72.5 tons, and at the higher end, some of us are collecting 500 tons per year. Number two, with, bikers, with bikes, one worker can collect one to two tons of organic waste per day. So if you have one worker working five days a week, we're already looking at 200 to 500 tons of organic waste per day collected annually. Excuse me, collected annually. For every 15 accounts served, we can replace over 3,000 diesel truck miles with bike miles. And so if the tonnage cap is increased and lifted, we can increase that number tenfold per micro hauling operation that exists today. Uh, number four, we serve an underserved group of very small businesses that are eager to divert organic waste from their waste streams specifically through our types of services. And lastly, we provide education and training to small businesses that ultimately improves their source separation practices and leads to higher and more consistent diversion of organics from the local waste stream. So while we support the CWE and while we fully appreciate the many concerns various stakeholders have for this process, we believe the, cli the climate crisis needs aggressive legislation that prioritizes the collective health of our city over the bottom line of the waste industry. Um, so thank you very much for your leadership and for other organizations and groups that are involved in this effort in making this bill possible. Thank you. And I just, I guess, we would, I've been talking to the staff. Uh, my district handles about 12,000 tons of capacity a day or has the capacity to handle 12,000 a day. For you to ask for 10,000 for a year, I think is, is within reason. And it's definitely something we'll continue to look at um, to make sure that we could support you um, and allow that cap to rise. Um, there might be more, how do I say it, more details that we have to go through as to why that's not the case yet or why we haven't reached that, but we, we're paying attention and micro hauling within the conversation is definitely something we're gonna address. It's not gonna be overlooked. So I appreciate your testimony. Chairman Reynoso and members of the committee, my name is Meredith Danberg Ficarelli and I am the director of Common Ground Compost. We support the commercial waste zoning bill which will establish a zoned commercial waste collection system. Common Ground Compost runs Reclaimed Organics, a bike-powered compost pickup service collecting organics from small food businesses and small to medium-sized offices in Manhattan. Last year, we diverted 73, approximately, tons of organics from landfill through on-site processing at our East Village Community Garden and through a collaboration with a commercial waste hauler who collects from us and hauls to our organics to a commercial compost site. This year, we're on target to double that annual volume, likely diverting more than 130 tons from landfill, but we'll have to check back in December on that. Um, we serve underserved businesses who frequently cannot obtain organic waste recycling services from traditional commercial haulers. Our customers are businesses that generally 
that generate small volumes of organic material that are more appropriately collected and transported in buckets and small bags than in containers and dumpsters which require collection by large diesel trucks. Many commercial haulers are challenged by the low root density of these small volume collections and micro hauling boosts efficiency and expands access for small volume and community based organics diversion. We've been working with the New York City Department of Sanitation for nearly two years as part of a broad stakeholder group representing a number of innovative minority and women owned businesses. And we thank the Department of Sanitation for considering the needs of this emerging market of zero waste and environmentally responsible materials management businesses as they develop their zero waste plan. Our goal as a hybrid zero waste consulting company and micro hauling operation is to provide a constellation of services to all businesses, helping to create solutions across the board that range from infrastructure procurement to training, waste audits, waste station, signage, design, working with commercial waste haulers, and of course, microscale collection. We want to continue to grow partnerships and collaborations with commercial haulers, and we appreciate the commercial waste zone plans incentivization of innovative partnerships in the bidding process. We seek opportunities to expanding our collection collaborations and also hope to partner with building owners and managers to host organic waste pre-processing machines and collection infrastructure, some of which we're already working on. We all need to share the responsibility for managing our waste, not pretend it doesn't exist. While we applaud the commercial waste zone bill and urge council to pass it swiftly, we urge the council to amend the bill, 60 tons, we talk, talked about it already, up to 10,000 tons to allow for continued evolution of this evolving market. The annual tonnage cap remains at its low rate. It'll, you know, it'll, it'll, yeah, restrict the growth of that growing industry. Thank you. Can I, can I just ask a question? So you're doing a, on average, I heard like 72.5 tons a year. Um, why, why the increase from, let's say, 60 all the way to 10,000, like in one big leap? What is there a middle ground there that we should be talking about, or? Is it just to like not have any uncapped, like just allow for the potential to grow as, you know, freely without having to worry about eventually hitting a cap, I guess? A little bit of both, if I'll take this briefly. Um, we submitted a pretty detailed plan um, suggesting a two-tiered system that directly tied uh, essentially the definition of micro hauling to existing Department of Environmental Conservation rules. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. Um, at the state level uh, for processing, 2,500 tons a year is the limit for a registered site to process organics. So that's, you know, and that's essentially, what did we say, one truck worth of material collected five days a week if it's a 10 ton truck, approximately. So I mean, 60 tons is way too low. 10,000 tons is, sure, that's a target for us to hit eventually. I'm not saying any of these organizations will be able to do that within, you know, year one of a new system. Um, anything else to add? And the only other thing, the only other thing to add is we put in our in our uh, memo that we submitted to you, we had a tier one which is zero emissions, and tier two was low as em low emissions. So there are t a couple different ways we process. Some people consolidate, collect, consolidate, and process. Uh, some people process every single thing they collect using low emissions vehicle. So we were trying to create a spectrum that allowed for both zero and low emissions, and low emissions specifically being tied to um, what is collected is fully processed all the way. Can I just interject? Uh, I didn't mention, but I also operate a microcarter, and I would think the platinum standard, and I think the standard that we would go for with a climate emergency, is to process as much material locally, thereby um, uh, eliminating large trucks from uh, completely from uh, processing um, of these materials by processing them locally using anaerobic digesters and composting machines. Um, hauling around um, organics in a large truck that are 70% water to a distant processing facility seems like inherently wasteful and unnecessary in the, the opinion of myself at least. All right, th thank you for that. Just wanna, and I, I guess most of that memo and most of the information, but just, just wanted to see, like I guess a transition period as to how you get there. Um, but the tiered system makes a lot of sense that you do the, the least harm in the environment, if anything good, the more reward you get. Um, I, I, I get that, so we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep having conversations. We're open to discussing it. Oh, I know yeah. you are, I know you are. You're doing, you're doing good. Yes, um, Rondra. So go um, just to, uh, so I'm on the low emissions, but doing the full process. You're on the low emissions or the no emissions? No, low emissions. Okay, Not right. no emissions. However, I do want to just um, uh, 
and underscore the whole issue of exemption. So what we want to in fact create is an exemption uh, to a certain amount. And my concern with the intro uh, 1574, and actually as I understand from the sanitation conversations, is actually that they would like to, to see us uh, have low um, ex uh, numbers for our exemptions so that we then have to fold into being subcontractors to the bigger players. So I, I want to just see if we can't raise the exemption uh, tonnage to as high as possible before we have to be considered that we have to uh, uh, fold into um, to the carding companies. And I, of course, want to uh, uh, see if we can't get a role for um, uh, replicating the type of um, small business, minority uh, owned business, and also a business model that could be um, you know, replicated in, in, on worker-owned co-ops. So part of the, the, the whole micro-hauling uh, uh, cohort was to suggest that all of us have to have um, particular uh, uh, business models that are, quote, green and sustainable. And, um, and I think that that's another issue that I don't see that there's a lot um, a room for growth in the 1574, which is a name to, and then actually supports the whole niche, uh, notion of sustainability, green jobs, and um, the, uh, so that's the other part that I want to uh, underscore. Yeah, and that, that is good. That's a good conversation to have. Like, what is this threshold? Um, because there's also some level of legitimacy that I want the, the industry wants say to make that, sure. Say that, that again, sorry. Some level of legitimacy that the industry wants to be able to maintain and having that threshold be increased to the, the exemption be increased significantly can get to a point where there's a, a large group of, of folks doing this work that are just not recognized. Um, and then when you hit that threshold, uh, the burden of of reporting and work and everything that needs to be done can be significant. So um, let's keep having the conversation. It's one that's being had. The SNY is paying attention. They're behind you. They're <clears throat> you certainly so. thank you for bringing us to the table, having the conversation, and let's not drop it. No and problem. I think Absolutely. the last thing is we've been trying to operate in a space where we can have licenses for a long time, but there was no opportunity for that. So we're excited to be able to step into a space that actually allows us to be licensed and to operate within a system. I agree, and I think that's, it's not the ultimate goal, but that's very important. I think that's one of the foundational things of what we need to get done in this, this legislation. Uh, but again, thank you so much for your testimony. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Taramina, Susan Waltman, Andrew Riggi, Gregory Latirie, Latirie, Heather Ducarme, and Michael Bochi. If there's, is there, if there's anyone else that wishes to testify, um, specifically in opposition, uh, please, that hasn't, you can raise your hand, and last minute we'll be getting inserted into this last panel. In opposition, okay. Going once, going twice. So, they're, they're here, yeah. So please uh, begin when you can, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Make much. Make sure the, the light is red. If it's red, we're good. If it's not, red. all right, good. That's good. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear. I'm Susan Waltman, Executive Vice President for Legal, Regulatory, and Professional Affairs at the Greater New York Hospital Association. We represent all of the hospitals in New York City, public and voluntary, as well as hospitals across the region. Um, we, I'll just provide a summary of my comments and of our written testimony. Um, we obviously, as healthcare representatives, 
are very supportive, share the goals of a commercial waste zone program. Um, we promote um, efforts to, to improve air quality, public health, and of course the safety of workers and the public. Um, we have some concerns with respect to the commercial waste zone program, particularly those with the exclusive zone approach, um, with respect to their impact on the operational and cost um, aspects for hospitals. Given their special attributes, their special waste attributes, waste management practices and procurement, um, very quickly they, thank you, too loud? Oh, no, no, not surprise. loud enough. No, no, no. Get closer. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Um, you know, they, unlike other facilities, they generate almost, I think some of them generate 12 different kinds of waste from the municipal solid waste that's the subject of this program, um, pathological waste, regulated medical waste, a lot of different types of waste that are um, serviced by different vendors, but it's essential that they be coordinated within a facility. Um, so it becomes very important for us to be able to choose a vendor, a carter, that is capable of disposing, collecting, and managing our waste um, in coordination with all these waste zones, these various waste streams. Um, we are also obviously large generators of waste, um, and many of our members are parts of healthcare systems. Um, and in fact, when you look at the Department of Sanitation's, <coughs> excuse me, chart of zones, 80% um, of our hospitals are in, are, are in multiple zones, and we have one that is in nine zones. So it becomes very important to be able to coordinate for, for efficiency and cost purposes, and cost is important to many of our safety net hospitals as well. Um, with, a, with the right kind of carter who has that capability. At the same time, I just will say we, we really don't contribute to the problems that are, I think, trigger the com your, your commercial waste zone program. All of our waste is collected in very large containers that often have compactors. They are picked up at the site and transferred directly to a transfer facility. Um, we don't contribute to the meandering routes and we do not have, we don't contribute to the vehicle miles traveled. We therefore request a framework within any resulting commercial waste zone program that would permit hospitals to choose from a group of vendors that are carters that are pre-approved, have the capacity to service hospitals regardless of the zone, we believe that will facilitate and really mitigate the impact on us and at the same time not undermine the goals of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was going to ask, um, it, currently, do you, you don't use one carter for the entire system, right? Not, or one company for the entire well, system. Well, sometimes a hospital will actually engage one waste management company mm -hmm. that will dispose of some of the waste streams themselves and then subcontract for the municipal solid waste. Um, they might have different we might have a different vendors for that purpose, but yes, they would have the same contractor across the system for the particular waste stream for operational efficiency and cost purposes. Okay, and then across all of the hospitals, um, are is it the same case? Is it a carter coming into the hospital, filling the truck, because either you have a container of some sort and they're taking the entire container, or are there portions of your system where the carter's moving through different hospital, like one truck can move to My several My understanding uh -huh. is that particularly for the systems, they will have a large container at their loading dock that is filled up during the course of a day or days, compacted so that it can hold gently as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And then the carter will come, will take that cart directly to a transfer station. Mm -hmm. It may be that there is some movement among, I'm not aware of that. So we should we should have that conversation because if it, there's a, and I keep saying this, but I, I gotta make sure that it's correct by like through environmentalist standards. If it's like a net neutral, where you're not adding or taking away when it comes to the vehicle's miles traveled because it's a direct route in and out, I wanna make sure DSNY could look into that uh, because I think um, there's some large buildings that Rebney has as well that fill up a, uh, a, a compactor, it gets picked up and it goes straight to where it has to go. We just want to see, we're going to look into that to see if, uh, if it's neutral, carbon neutral, let's say, to or inconsequential to what we're trying to achieve, like you said, and then we, we would definitely consider that. But it's, it's something we've already had a conversation with the hospitals um, that we've, we've taken in and we're looking into for sure. So I just want you to know that.
we've heard you again today and that was something that we're considering for sure. Thank you so very thank much. Thank you, thank you. My name is Gregory Latiri. I'm a native New Yorker and the CEO and co-founder of Recycle Track Systems, which is RTS. I'd like to first thank the Chairman Reynoso and all the members of the committee and community members for advocating on behalf of reform for the commercial waste industry. My career has been mainly technology focused. In 2015, we founded RTS to utilize technology to track trucks, track waste, track recycling, and organic to the appropriate destination facilities. We operate as a licensed broker under the Business Integrity Commission and offer our services by building partnerships with local independent haulers who install our GPS technology in New York City and throughout the country. Today in New York and other cities, we service more than 1,500 premium customers, including some of the largest sports stadiums, hospitals, office buildings, corporations, and municipalities. RTS is a certified B Corporation, which is one of 2,500 companies across the globe that are recognized for working for the betterment of business, society, and social good. Under New York State law, we are also a benefit corporation, which means we're formed for the purpose of creating a material positive impact on society and the environment. At RTS, we continue to deploy capital to further our development to find innovative ways to recycle and donate materials. I understand wholeheartedly and agree with all the intentions behind this bill to create a safer, more transparent, efficient, and more environmentally friendly industry through increased waste diversion and decreased vehicle emissions. The bill, however, currently written, while having excellent intentions, unfortunately will not be successful in creating those goals or achieving those goals. For instance, onboarding a new customer is very complex. It is virtually impossible for one company, regardless of how large, to transition thousands of customers through a 12-month period in a single zone. And I can go into more details about that offline. In addition, potentially adverse, the adverse environmental impact of the plan during this transition really needs to be understood. A massive customer onboarding requires trucks, materials, welders, safety equipment, and a lot of coordination. Financially speaking, the bill under consideration most benefits the two largest haulers in New York City. These haulers, who are likely to be awarded many of the exclusive zones that would be up for bid, have also had multiple instances of recycling violations, as well as their own labor and safety issues. Under the proposed system, they would be quite excited to win exclusive zones, however, I believe not capable of actually handling the task. There are better ways to accomplish the city's safety and environmental goals without eliminating the competitive system that keeps large companies in check and promotes innovation. Frankly speaking, we've built a very successful business competing against those large haulers by offering more transparent and sustainable recycling and waste removal services. If the commercial waste zone bill was passed as written today, it's very likely some of our closest hauling partners, some of them companies that are minority owned, some that are Teamsters Local 813, and Local 108 would be out of business. Finally, I'd like to add something that others have not. The bill would also, in my opinion, have serious adverse effects over the construction industry because of lack of companies and in infrastructure to service the city's ever-growing construction needs. In closing, I'd like to thank everybody, including the advocates and policymakers from whom I've met, and I'd like a chance to continue to further this, these discussions. So just a, a point of clarity, construction and demolition is not a part of... I, I understand that. The, the issue is that you would have, a, 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 in a single zone environment, a lot of the companies that currently exist today, even if we consider those top 20, which is what I would consider, the majority of them may not be operating. So you'd have a lot less capacity for that type of services. Uh, so you're, you're, you're running under the assumption that these businesses wouldn't exist, period, and that if they do other work like... Uh, construction and demolition that they wouldn't be able to provide that because they would be out of you, you would definitely have a lack of a lack of existing trucks to, to do and the, the the San Francisco I, I, I hear the arguments for LA and San Francisco just using San Francisco our experience is there is a tremendous amount of price increase customers that we have in New York compared to look at, uh, San Francisco in particular are paying substantially more all right thank you thank you for your yeah. testimony Good afternoon, Chair Renozo and members of the committee. My name is Heather Ducharme, and I am the Director of Storefront Business Engagement at the Alliance for Downtown New York, the Business Improvement District representing Manhattan south of Chambers Street. 
Lower Manhattan is home to approximately 1,200 retail businesses who rely on private carters to serve their waste disposal needs. Our storefront businesses are facing the same challenges that small businesses all over New York are facing. It is critically important that any change to the private carting system recognize the needs and concerns of small businesses. Advocates have long called for substantial changes to New York, how New York City handles commercial waste. Lower Manhattan's narrow streets and extraordinarily dense environment make adequate waste removal especially challenging. The Alliance has participated in the Department of Sanitation's now four-year-long process to create a new system that would be more efficient and environmentally friendly than the current process while maintaining reasonable prices and good service for small businesses. The department's commercial waste zone plan would generate significant improvements in route efficiency while also preserving competition needed to ensure carters provide high quality, cost effective services to their customers. We are concerned that intro 1574 ignores years of careful analysis and stakeholder engagement. The bill would create a system that severely limits the choices available to businesses. With only one carter allowed to operate per zone, businesses would be subject to monopolies. This could lead to substantial increased costs for struggling entrepreneurs. If the designated carter for the zone does not provide satisfactory service or offers a non-negotiable fee agreement or structure, businesses will have little or no recourse. Instead, they have to go through a burdensome customer service process that will not guarantee a change and could take weeks to resolve. This could result in trash accumulation on our already crowded sidewalks and place a financial hardship that can close a small business's doors for good. As storefront businesses are adapting to changes in the retail market and regulatory reform, it is critical that they are supported and the city does not hinder their ability to succeed. The Downtown Alliance believes that the city should allow businesses to have some choice over who their private carter is so that we maintain high quality service, keep prices low, and meet the commercial dis waste disposal needs of every neighborhood in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you. Um, Melissa Yashan from Nopi, uh, Thomas. DeVito, I guess, a DeVino, Andrea Scarborough, Leslie Velasquez, Del Puente, and John Rojas, and the Teamsters. And if folks are missing, we could we could keep we'll keep adding we'll keep adding. Francisco Rivera, uh, Lisa Bloodgood, Benjamin Miller, that's enough. Melissa, you All right. start? Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for squeezing me in before 3 p.m., the witching hour. My, my name <laughs> yeah, is Melissa Yashan. I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest in the Environmental Justice Program. The EJ program has been focused on trying to bring equity into our city's waste system for more than two decades, and I have worked in this area of waste regulation for over five years. NOPI is a member of the Transform Don't Trash Coalition, and together with our coalition partners, we've spent the better part of the last five years advocating for a systemic overhaul of our private waste system, so we are beyond thrilled to be here today, even if it means spending all day here with you. Um, I would like to thank you, Chair Reynoso, and all the co-sponsors of Intro 1574, as well as the other members of the Sanitation Committee, for the opportunity to discuss and advance a holistic solution to the many problems in our commercial waste system with public safety, workers' rights, and equity at its core. 
This bill could be a step towards much needed and long awaited relief for the communities in our cities that have borne the brunt of garbage for way too long. I would also like to thank Commissioner Garcia, Justin Bland, and DSNY for their efforts to find a way to work together to bring more sustainability and equity into our city's waste processing system. I have fairly detailed testimony, so I'm not gonna get into all of it. I'm gonna spare everyone that. Um, and I'm also going to try to not repeat what many of my coalition partners and our client communities have so eloquently said today about all of the amazing, important um, goals that this piece of legislation in a commercial waste zone system would help to accomplish. I'm going to focus instead um, on what I think could be strengthened in the framework that intro 1574 already does for the most progressive, safest, greenest, and equitable, equitable private sanitation system. Um, we are very happy that intro 1574 already has key provisions to ensure that any company submitting a bid would have to demonstrate improvements in safety and cleaner burning trucks, which will go a long way to improve the quality of life in overburdened communities, but the bill could still do more. In addition, wow. Okay, so I go into detail on what it, how it can do more. We really would like um, facilities standards and compliance to really be shored up in the language of the bill, and I specify how. We also suggest that a part of, as a part of each hauler's proposal, they outline their impact on communities surrounding their garage or truck depot, and if applicable, their transfer facilities if they own them, and any plan to mitigate any negative impacts or invest in or engage with the community in a collaborative and positive manner, and that that be considered as part of, uh, part of the RFP process. I also go through a lot of other specific ways to strengthen the bill with everything from diversion and zero waste to um, job and uh, labor standards, as well as reporting requirements. Um, we believe that the bill should include specific reporting requirements instead of the catch-all language that is in there now, and I enumerate that in my written testimony. And um, in my written testimony, I express general support for the other bills that are on the agenda today, with the exception of two, which we have some concerns about, and we look forward to continuing to collaborate with you, council member, the council, DSNY, and our coalition members to strengthen intro 1574 and these other bills to truly bring transformative progress to our commercial waste system in our city. Great, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Mine's similar, but simpler. <laughs> um, so good afternoon, I'm Lisa Bloodgood and I'm here to speak on behalf of the Newtown Creek Alliance, or NCA. NCA is a community-based organization that works um, to reveal, restore, and revitalize the Newtown Creek. We are unique in New York City because we advocate for environmental remediation, industrial retention, and community health. Uh, where many might see opposing, opposing points of view, we have been able to find common ground, and we appreciate the opportunity to bring this point of view to the discussion today. Uh, although we feel there are improvements to be made, my testimony uh, is in strong support of 1574. I'm going to skip a little bit and just get right into it. Um, 1574 will bring exclusive commercial waste zones to New York City. Uh, having an exclusive system whereby each zone will be serviced by a single carting company will move us away from a Wild West commercial waste system that poisons our air, compromises road safety, exploits workers, takes advantage of, of small businesses, increases uh, maintenance costs for roads and bridges, and contributes to New York City abysmal commercial recycling rate of 21 percent. While we support Intro 1574 because of the tremendous environmental and public health benefits it will confer upon the city as a whole, there is room for improvement. The bill does, not, uh, does nothing to reduce the inequitable concentration of waste transfer stations in Queens and Brooklyn, located just upland from Newtown Creek. The uh, neighborhoods surrounding New Newtown Creek host a disproportionate number of truck-based waste transfer stations relative to the rest of the city, which you are well aware. Collectively, these transfer stations handle almost 40% of the over 12 million tons of waste moving through New York City annually. This is the densest concentration of waste transfer stations in the five boroughs, and this clustering negatively impacts both community health and public infrastructure. Even worse, many of the waste transfer stations in businesses, uh, excuse me, in business near Newtown Creek are poorly operated creating hazards for both workers and the community. At a minimum, these facilities need to be in compliance with the city's zoning codes and OSHA regulations. The current legislation requires neither. So we appreciate that 
an intro 1574 will establish a preference for carters who propose to dispose of waste tr uh, at transfer stations that are geographically proximate to each designated zone, but more needs to be done to ensure the number of carting vehicles traversing our neighborhood streets is reduced, while the implementation of exclusive commercial waste zones will reduce vehicle miles traveled in Midtown by a huge margin. It will reduce truck traffic in our communities only marginally, if at all. Yes, commercial carting vehicles will travel shorter, more efficient routes through Midtown Manhattan, but those truck trips will still begin and end in our community because our community is where the garages and transfer stations are located and where the long haul tractor trailers carrying waste for export begin their journey uh, to out of state landfills. Finally, the bill is also uh, fails to create a mechanism to increase the diversion of waste from landfills, an important goal of one NYC. Uh, this legislation should explicitly advance. So I will just say thank you. And while today's legislation is a step in the right direction, NCI asks that our city leaders take additional steps to reduce the inequitable concentration of waste infrastructure in low income communities and communities of color and ensure that waste transfer stations are in compliance with city zoning, OSHA regulations, and make a serious effort uh, to move towards one NYC goal of zero waste. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ben Miller. I'm a co-founder of the Center for Zero Waste Design. You guys all have my written testimony and proposed uh, amendments, and they're available online at centerforzerowaste.org. Um, I'd just like to mention three of the suggestions that I make in that testimony quickly. First, um, you've mentioned today the importance of of this efficiency in reducing costs, operating costs. You've also mentioned the value to carters in an exclusive zone of a guaranteed supply of material for a guaranteed time at a predictable price. I suggest that you require franchisees to take that financing power to the bank so that we can finally make zero waste happen and possible by developing local processing facilities for energy and material recovery. The second suggestion to solve or address this problem, which is a significant one, is I would require franchisees to use our transfers, our marine transfer stations and other facilities as a requirement of uh, using their zones so that we can you know, close these things down. And thirdly, um, you, I would like to agree with your suggestion that we not think of a, limited, a limit of 20 zones. And that as we define zones, we not use community board boundaries as a simple cookie cutter, but draw them more intelligently so we can do such things as uh, draw zones of different sizes so that different size companies can compete well, so that we never cut local entities such as bids uh, because these things are institutional armatures that could energize uh, these zones and really maximize the advantages. And thirdly, I would suggest that the zones be drawn with geographic and uh, infrastructural and demographic features in mind so we don't tear apart things that could have a direct beneficial effect on waste management in the city. Thank you. Thank you for that as well. Good afternoon. Good morning. Should have been. I'm sorry, guys. So if you don't know me, my name is John Rojas. I used to work for Sanitation Salvage. Sorry, the unfamous but infamous Sanitation Salvage. I'm a newly father. When I started working with them, I was about 22, 23. I'm 25 now. I'm a black man, and I am a minority, all right? Let me just put emphasis on that. I've been with them for two years, but by the time I got laid off, I felt like I had 10 years of experience. Starting this job, I had no prior, I had no prior knowledge of, of the waste industry and the sanitation industry. My first day on the job, that's my cousin right there, we headed downtown to Soho. I'm trying to understand why we're going to Soho when we're located in the Bronx. Didn't make any sense at all. But as I continued working for them, it became regular. We, we came out of our comfort zone, I mean out of our borough zone on the regular. I'm sorry. It became kind of weird because we, we're working, I mean, our base is in the point, Hunts Point, and we're going everywhere else. I'm talking about seeing the whole Bronx every night from South Bronx to City Island to East Chester Road to Gun Hill Road, Fordham, Grand Concourse, even into Harlem. I had no training whatsoever. I got trained on the job, which is completely dangerous. I used to ride the back of the trucks like it was completely fun, not knowing that that was hazardous to my, my, my life. <clears throat> now, 
I got hit by a car. I was literally a block away from my, my house. I could have stopped working and I could have went home. My driver asked me if I was all right, but come to find out I broke, I fractured my elbow and I didn't know I worked a whole 16 hour shift not knowing that. So due to the rigorous boundaries and rigorous rules that the job had, I had no other choice but to stick on the job and do my job because I, I was fearful of being unemployed, right? So he said, keep working, knowing that I got fractured. Due to that situation, right? That's just one prior situation that, that made my, my life and my protection of me going to work in, in threat. This is a whole, a whole nother different situation where I got chased by about 15 different men due to the fact that I got misidentified because of the fact that I was in a zone that we should have never even been in. Now, intro 1574 would completely help that. Any, any, any garbage zone or any, any, um, sorry, any garbage company that we're picking up garbage in a whole different area, you eliminate all factors like that. Miss being identified, having to pick up, having to pick up garbage you don't know, you don't even belong in. You understand? The community is, is, fills it. And then the bigger, it, it trickles down as a chain reaction. But it starts with the community. So I'm gonna keep it short and simple. I almost got bit by a rat. All right, I sacrificed my life, my time, and my undivided attention to my child that I could have given to sanitation salvage. For me to get laid off, and I get a call, I get a call, I get a call from my boss saying, oh, John, you didn't get the memo? We don't have a job. So I'm literally walking back to the train station with my head down, not knowing what I'm gonna tell my baby mother. How am I gonna do it? That's life. That's reality. Not that many of y'all could worry about that, but that's what we go through. So just think about that. Thank you, John. Good evening. My name is Francisco Rivera. I've been in a long time ever from local 813. I work for Royal Waste. I was 16 years ago when I came to this country, I came for a better future. I got into the private car and industry because I was a young father needed for support my family. Working at Royal Ways, a union company, I can make a decent income and give my four kids what they needed. But my family also known the pain of having a father who has to provide at cutting working. I work every week 60 hours, leaving them for many days when everyone else is getting in a gathering, I have to leave so I could go to work. When my kids wake up at night and bad dreams, I'm not there. When I lost my first marriage because working so many hours is stressful. That's why we need this way zone so every worker will have the same rights that I have and every company worker will be able to take care of their families. We want one carter in every zone, so workers won't have to drive all over the city to finish up a goddamn route. Think about the workers who are picking up tons of tons of trash every night. Think about the workers who are hanging off the back on a truck speeding through the streets of New York City. Think about the workers who get injured and don't have the health care all the time off to get better. Think about the workers who don't get paid for all the hours they work. Think about the workers who get treated like garbage. With this bill passed on, when you vote, just think about us and I just a bill. Thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate it. And, um, appreciate your testimony, which is the, the opposite of opposition, is like, you need to do more. Um, so we, we're really thinking about these things, and the SNY is working with us on some of these issues. We're getting, you know, the usual, le legally there's some things we can do, there's some things we can't do, which Melissa obviously disagrees with. 
Um, but we are going to push the SNY to do as much as we possibly can, and we're going to try to push the envelope to make sure we get to a place where we affect the most change in this industry in one shot. So I really appreciate your testimony, and don't think uh, we're not paying attention. It's just we got to fight the SNY to do more. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And to the workers, thank you. So your testimony is the most valuable. Um, people need to know what you guys go through. I actually been to the, did a truck route one time, and it was for like less than an hour, um, but it was an experience. Um, there were some bags I couldn't throw in the back of the truck. Um, I saw the stops happening. I saw other trash that I had to let pass by because another truck was going to go pick it up, not, not the truck I was on. So um, I did that for like an hour. You guys do that every night. So, I am, so it's, 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 it's shocking when you see that. So I wish everyone should go in the back of a truck before this happens and tell me that we don't need change. That, that's what should happen. But uh, I appreciate your testimony. And now we have our last panel, uh, Jessica Yans, Jenny Romer, Anna Batista, Michael Greeley, Alexis Robinson, <laughs> Dylan Oakley, and Renee Hill. All right, this is the last panel, the Mariano Rivera of the night, uh, or the afternoon now. So please, I'm gonna start from this side and go on. Thank you so much um, for being here, and please take your time. Uh, good afternoon. Thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to your committee today. My name is Jessica Yance. I'm a member of Teamsters Local 210, and I work at Sims Metal Management in Brooklyn, where we process all the recycling that uh, DSNY picks up. We need a real investment in recycling from the private carding industry to tackle climate change and create good green jobs. In my five years working at Sims, I've been able to provide for myself and build a life while also supporting the city where I have lived my whole life. I have a union job, I have a saved job. But Sims is the exception, not the rule. At most of the recycling facilities, that private carters run and use, workers are paid low wages, and the work is dangerous, and you guys know people have died. And that's when the companies do recycle. The private carding industry only recycles about 21% of what it collects. That is a big problem. When we don't recycle, our trash goes to landfills and produces greenhouse gases that are driving climate change and wrecking the planet. It doesn't have to be this way. With exclusive zones, private carters will be required to invest in the facilities like Sims and invest in the workers. With exclusive zones, the city will be able to demand high rates of recycling and composting and hold carters to that standard. Instead of the New York City private carting industry being part of the problem, with exclusive zones, they could be part of the solution. This, will, this bill will create good green jobs like the one I have. A couple of months ago, I was able to buy my first home. I never would have considered being able to do that five years ago. Some people might think that the workers who sort New Yorkers trash don't deserve good jobs, but New York will not reach our climate goals without us. Please pass the exclusive zone bill and show that you value us. FYI, without taking care of the environment, there won't be jobs for the generations to come. I've heard it all day generations. The environment must come first, thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and I'm glad you work at Sims. Uh, it's a big fight to get the yes. Teamsters in there. It worked out, and I'm hearing that things are going very well. So, yes, thank uh, you for your support. Yes, and I know that when you said they are the exception, not the rule, we know that. But uh, congratulations again. That you're, you're one of the fortunate ones to have a job at Sims. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? My name is Alexis Robinson. I used to work for Sa um, Sanitation Salvage. I was with them for two years off the books for eighty dollars a night. I was doing like fourteen to fifteen hours an hour every day, and you know it took a year for me. After the two years I was off the books, I ended up being a year later on the books, getting paid fifteen dollars an hour. But you know the work that we was doing was mind crazy. It was all over, and like there was times that I used to get off the route 
and by the time I know it, it's already time to go back to work. And I used to be like, yo, how am I, I going to do this? And I'd just be scratching my head, and, you know, later on, things started happening. We ended up just trying to go through it, and, you know, I just worked the best way I can. And, you know, after they shut down, I was out of work for almost, like, almost a year. And thanks to 813, they got involved, and they, you know, they helped me. And now I started working for um, Action. 813 helped me get that position. I appreciate them. And now I'm just looking forward to do well. I'm looking forward to, you know, get my CDL because I'm only 22. And, you know, I'm just trying to get do bigger things now because now I got a daughter on the way. I mean, I got a daughter now. So I'm just trying to, you know, do big things now. Can you speak to your experience like comparatively uh, of action versus sanitation salvage? Is, well, the, is there a, a difference? That's a good question. That, it is a big difference. You know, I feel like with action, I feel like I'm a part of something. I'm a, with an actual family now. You know, they make sure I'm good. And, you know, the routes is not as crazy like salvage. You know, if you do too many hours, the next day they're making sure you get that day off so you can rest and be prepared for the following day which is the smart thing to do. And Salvage never did that. They used to make you work through it. Well, congratulations to you too. I remember you testifying in the past. I'm happy to hear that you're on a place where you're comfortable and that you're doing some work. So uh, congratulations to you and thank you for your testimony as thank well. Thank you so much. Appreciate Glad it. things are turning around. <laughs> Get that yeah. CDL, all right? Yeah, There's nah, free yeah. classes for CDL licenses. Mm -hmm. No, nah, I know. There's, all right, don't let them charge you for it. All right, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think you're off. I think you're off. Am I on now? There you go. Right. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and staff and everyone who stuck it out today. Uh, my name is Dylan Oakley, and I'm the chair of the Legislative Committee of the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board, also known as the BK Swab. The BK Swab is a volunteer citizens organization with a mission of helping New York City achieve its zero waste goals. Our members are appointed by the Brooklyn Borough President and tasked with advising the Borough President, City Council members, City Administration, New York State legislators, and others on matters related to materials management, and specifically waste prevention, recycling, and other beneficial reuse. The BK Swab respects that transitioning NYC's commercial waste collection sector to a zone franchising system is a complicated issue, politically and otherwise and that it will be hard to overstate the implications and impacts that this plan and how it is implemented will have for a long time to come. While there is no consensus among our members around the franchising approach, let alone the particulars of how the zone maps are to be drawn or how many licensees assigned per zone, we do see this debate and potential subsequent transition period as a chance for the city to reaffirm its commitment to a zero waste future. While we are heartened by the city's efforts in recent years to increase commercial recycling rates, notably by simplifying the commercial recycling rules and expanding organics collection requirements, confusion still abounds in the NYC workplace around recycling. While many companies and organizations have cultivated robust recycling cultures, far too many others simply have no recycling program, while others still make inconsistent efforts with inadequate results. Where many commercial tenants desire to recycle, a lack of understanding all too often exists around the roles and responsibilities of employees, building management and operations staff, and the carters themselves, breeding skepticism around recycling endeavors and further discouraging participation in diversion efforts and ownership of one's position in the life cycle of materials. Intro 1574 makes reference to outreach and education of commercial tenants in several different passages including as an element of a potential franchisee's plan to support reduction, reuse, and recycling among commercial establishments within the zone. Elsewhere in the legislation, outreach and education seems to refer simply to helping customers transition to a zone collection system. We believe this is a significant opportunity to provide true outreach and effective education regarding the value of the city's zero waste goal. Such awareness of the importance of the commercial sector's participation in waste reduction and diversion efforts 
has always been missing and yet is crucial for any hope of progressing toward the city's stated target of ending the export of waste to landfill. We would like to see the goals, methods, and means of the outreach and education referred to in this legislation more clearly stated. Lastly, another tool for waste reduction and diversion referenced more than once in intro 1574 is waste audits. And the bill includes a requirement that the designated carters offer third-party waste audit services to all customers. We would go further and recommend that customers be required to undergo a third-party waste audit at the start of the agreement with the carter and then at regularly occurring intervals as determined by the department, as the department thereafter. Such a requirement would provide actionable visibility into a waste generator's performance and progress in meeting reduction or excuse me, or reduction or diversion goals established by the department. The audit would provide the groundwork for waste generators to evaluate their material flows and devise reduction and diversion strategies, from making informed procurement decisions to employee training, which would of course be incentivized by the pricing structures framed in this bill. Such insight into the changing composition of commercial material outputs would be invaluable for the transport, processing, and disposal or recycling industries, and would provide a considerable boost to the field of zero waste advisement professionals. The city has successfully revolutionized awareness of energy performance in its built environment through required energy benchmarking, compulsory energy audits, and now mandated greenhouse gas emission caps for buildings. Why not do the same for materials waste? Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. BK Swab looks forward to helping New York City become a truly zero waste city. Thank you for your, te your testimony. And let the, book, the Brooklyn Swab know that I said you got to pick a side. All right. All right? <laughs> but thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Chairman Reynoso. My name is Michael Greeley. I'm testing, testifying today on behalf of Manhattan Community Board 5, which represents the Central Business District, district of Manhattan. CB5 supports the stated goals of DSNY, but cannot support any plan that risks reduction in service and implores both the Department of Sanitation and the City Council to please integrate our concerns into any cutting plan that is established. To sum summarize our five main concerns, CB5 requests to see the underlying data for the department's claim that a VMT will drop in Midtown, while it insists service levels will not change. Without the data, it is difficult to us to square the claim with what we see on the ground. Almost every block with a multitude of constantly <clears throat> evolving uh, commercial, commercial businesses that generally have different volumes of several waste streams and require and request different pickup times. Second, we ask for better communication to the public and the industry. This should be done by uh, defining clear by de clearly defining responsibilities between DSNY and BIC, and by creating both effective 311 complaint drop-down options and community advisory boards for each zone. Third, uh, specialized carters will always be needed. We request an effective incentive for subcontracting to both small and minority and women-owned carting businesses. Fourth, we request a zone-by-zone phase-in Try the new plan in several subzones like business improvement districts. Look for unforeseen issues, problems solved, and once standards have been met, roll out the program to other zones. And finally, the Department of Health's uh, Community Air Survey ranks Manhattan CB5 as the highest in the city for fine particulate air pollution, which is largely attributed to diesel fuel exhaust. Connecting this fact with VMT, we ask that any plan would include a requirement for commercial carters and subcontractors to eventually only use electric vehicles. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you to the panel. Uh, and this, this is the last panel. Everyone that's still here, thank you so much. You are the real heroes. You are the true MVPs. Uh, and we're going to adjourn this meeting.